Leadership, Six Studies in World Strategy. Book by Henry Kissinger. Chapter 5 Lee Kuan Yew, The Strategy of Excellence. A. A Visit to Harvard. B. The Giant from Lilliput. C. Imperial Youth. D. Building a State. E. Building a Nation. F. Let History Judge. G. Building an Economy. H. Lee and America. I. Lee and China. J. Between the U.S. and China. K. Lee's Legacy. L. Lee the Person. 5. Lee Kuan Yew, The Strategy of Excellence. A Visit to Harvard. On November 13, 1968, Lee Kuan Yew, the then 45 year old Prime Minister of Singapore, arrived at Harvard University for what he described as a month long sabbatical. Singapore had become independent only three years earlier, but Lee had been its Prime Minister since 1959, when the city gained autonomy in the twilight of British rule. Lee told the Harvard Crimson, the student newspaper, that his aims were to get fresh ideas, to meet stimulating minds, to go back enriched with a fresh burst of enthusiasm for what I do, adding, in a touch of self-effacement, I intend to study all the things I've been doing ad hoc without the proper tutoring the past ten years. He was soon invited to a meeting by the faculty of Harvard's Litauer Center, now the Kennedy School of Government, which comprised professors of government, economics, and development. At the time, Americans knew little about Lee, or the tiny, newly established country he represented. The essence of the faculty's understanding was that our guest led a semi-socialist party and a post-colonial state. As such, when he sat down at the large oval table, he was warmly welcomed as a kindred spirit by my predominantly liberal colleagues assembled for the occasion. Compact and radiating energy, Lee wasted no time on small talk or introductory remarks. Instead, he asked for the faculty's views on the war in Vietnam. My colleagues, voicing passionate opposition to the conflict and to America's part in it, were divided primarily over whether President Lyndon B. Johnson was a war criminal or merely a psychopath. After a number of the professors had spoken, the dean of the Litauer faculty invited Lee to express his views, smiling in a way that clearly anticipated approbation. With his first words, Lee went straight to the point, you make me sick. Then, without making any attempt to ingratiate himself, he proceeded to explain that Singapore, as a small country in a tumultuous part of the world, depended for its survival on an America confident in its mission of providing global security, and powerful enough to counter the communist guerrilla movements that were then seeking, with support from China, to undermine the young nations of Southeast Asia. Neither a supplication for assistance nor an appeal to virtue, Lee's response was instead a dispassionate analysis of the geopolitical realities of his region. He described what he believed was Singapore's national interest, to achieve economic viability and security. He made clear that his country would do what it could in pursuit of both objectives, aware that America would make its own decisions about any assistance for its own reasons. He invited his interlocutors to join him less in a common ideology than in a joint exploration of the necessary. To the astonished Harvard faculty, Lee articulated a worldview free of anti-American animus and post-imperial resentment. He neither blamed the United States for Singapore's challenges nor expected it to solve them. Rather, he sought American goodwill so that Singapore, lacking oil and other natural riches, could grow through the cultivation of what he said was its principal resource, the quality of its people, whose potential could develop only if they were not abandoned to communist insurgency, invasion by neighboring countries or Chinese hegemony. Earlier that year, 
British Prime Minister Harold Wilson had announced the withdrawal of all forces east of Suez, requiring the closure of the massive Royal Navy base that had been a pillar of Singapore's economy and security. Lee was therefore seeking an American hand to help counter the difficulties he saw looming. He framed this task less in terms of the prevailing moral categories of the Cold War than as an element, in the construction of a regional order, in the sustaining of which America should develop its own national interest. One of the essential qualities of a statesman is the ability to resist being swept along by the mood of the moment. Lee's performance in that long-ago Harvard seminar was instructive not only for the clarity of his analysis of both America's and Singapore's positions in the world, but also for his courage in going against the grain. It was a quality which he would display many times in his career. The Giant from Lilliput Lee's achievements were distinct from those of the other leaders described in this volume. Each of them represented a major country with a culture formed over centuries, if not millennia. For such leaders, as they attempt to guide their society from a familiar past to an evolving future, success is measured by their ability to direct their society's historical experience and values so that its potential may be fulfilled. The statesmanship practiced by Lee Kuan Yew developed from different origins. When he became leader of independent Singapore in August 1965, he took charge of a country that had never before existed, and hence, in effect, had no political past except as an imperial subject. Lee's achievements were to overcome his nation's experience, to establish a distinct conception of itself by conjuring up a dynamic future from a society composed of divergent ethnic groups and to transform a poverty-ridden city into a world-class economy. In the process, he grew into a world statesman and sought-after advisor to the great powers. Richard Nixon said he showed the ability to rise above the resentments of the moment and of the past and think about the nature of the new world to come. Margaret Thatcher called him one of the 20th century's most accomplished practitioners of statecraft. Lee accomplished all this in the face of seemingly crippling disadvantages. Singapore's territory was some 224 square miles at low tide, as he was wont to say, smaller than that of Chicago. It lacked the most basic natural resources, including sufficient drinking water. Even the tropical rains, Singapore's main domestic source of drinking water at the time of independence, were an ambiguous gift, leaching the soil of nutrients and making productive agriculture impossible. Singapore's population of 1.9 million was, by global standards, minuscule and rent by tension among three distinct ethnic groups, Chinese, Malay and Indian. It was surrounded by much larger and more powerful states, particularly Malaysia and Indonesia, that envied its deep water port and strategic location along maritime trading routes. From this inauspicious genesis, Lee initiated an epic of leadership that transformed Singapore into one of the world's most successful countries. A malarial island off the southernmost tip of the Malay Peninsula became, in the span of a single generation, Asia's wealthiest country on a per capita basis and the de facto commercial center of Southeast Asia. Today, by almost every measure of human well-being, it ranks globally in the highest percentile. In contrast to countries whose persistence through the convulsions of history is taken for granted, Singapore would not survive unless it performed at the highest possible level, as Lee relentlessly warned his compatriots. As he put it in his memoirs, Singapore was not a natural country but man, made precisely because it had no past as a nation, there was no assurance it would have a future, its margin for error thus remained perpetually close to zero. I'm concerned that Singaporeans assume Singapore is a normal country, he would say several times later in his life. 
If we do not have a government and a people that differentiate themselves from the rest of the neighborhood, Singapore will cease to exist. In Singapore's struggle to form itself and survive as a nation, domestic and foreign policy had to be closely intertwined. There were three requirements, economic growth to sustain the population, sufficient domestic cohesion to permit long-range policies, and a foreign policy nimble enough to survive among international behemoths such as Russia and China and covetous neighbors such as Malaysia and Indonesia. Li also had the historical awareness necessary for real leadership. City-states do not have good survival records, he observed in 1998. The island of Singapore will not disappear, but the sovereign nation it has become, able to make its way and play its role in the world, could vanish. In his mind, Singapore's trajectory had to be a steep upward curve with no end in sight, otherwise, it would risk being engulfed by its hinterland or by the severity of its economic and social challenges. Lee taught a kind of global physics in which societies must constantly strive to avoid entropy. Leaders are tempted by pessimism, he observed to a private gathering of world leaders in May 1979, when Singapore was in the early stages of growth, but we have to fight our way out of it. You have to show a credible, plausible way that we can keep our head above water. Parallel to Lee's dire warnings about the threat of extinction lay an equally vivid imagination of his country's potential. If every great achievement is a dream before it becomes a reality, Lee's dream was breathtaking in its audacity. He envisioned a state that would not simply survive but flourish through an insistence on excellence. In Lee's perception, excellence meant much more than individual performance. The quest for it needed to permeate the entire society. Whether in government service, business, medicine or education, mediocrity and corruption were not acceptable. There was no second chance in case of transgressions, very little tolerance for failure. In this manner, Singapore achieved a worldwide reputation for collectively outstanding performance. A sense of shared success, in Lee's view, could help to knit his society together despite the lack of a universally shared religion, ethnicity, or culture. Lee's ultimate gift to his multi-ethnic people was his unremitting faith that they were their own greatest resource that they had the capacity to unlock possibilities in themselves that they had not known existed. He also devoted himself to encouraging a comparable confidence in his foreign friends and acquaintances. He was persuasive not only because he was a subtle observer of the regional politics of Southeast Asia but because his Chinese heritage, combined with his Cambridge University education, gave him exceptional insight into the dynamics of the interaction between East and West, one of the essential fulcrums of history. Throughout his life, Lee insisted on describing his contributions as merely the unlocking of his society's existing capabilities. He knew that to succeed, his quest had to become the enduring pattern, not a personal tour de force. Anybody who thinks he's a statesman needs to see a psychiatrist, he once said. In time, Singapore's success under Lee moved even China to study his approach and emulate his designs. In 1978, Deng Xiaoping came to the city-state expecting to see a backwater and to be cheered by throngs of ethnic Chinese. Deng had spent two days in Singapore on his way to Paris in 1920 and in the intervening years his information on the city had largely been provided by an obsequious entourage, prone to paint the Singaporean leadership as the running dogs of American imperialism. Instead, the ethnic Chinese Deng met in Singapore were firm in their allegiance to their young nation. The gleaming skyscrapers and immaculate avenues Deng encountered provided him with both an impetus and a blueprint for China's own post-Mao reforms. Imperial Youth 
Lee Kuan Yew was born in September 1923, scarcely more than a century after Sir Stamford Raffles, lieutenant governor of the British colony in Sumatra, established a trading post on the small island near the Strait of Malacca known to locals as Singapura, meaning Lion City, in Sanskrit. Founded by Raffles in 1819, Singapore was technically ruled from Calcutta as part of further India. Although the limited communications technology of the day allowed considerable leeway to locally based colonial administrators, declared a free port by London, and enriched by natural resource exports from the Malayan mainland, the new outpost grew swiftly, drawing traders and fortune seekers from Southeast Asia and beyond. From 1867, Singapore was placed under the direct jurisdiction of the colonial office in London as a crown colony. Ethnic Chinese in particular flocked to Singapore and soon became its majority, some coming from the nearby Malay Peninsula and Indonesian archipelago, others fleeing from turmoil and poverty in crisis-racked 19th-century China. Among the latter group was Li's great-grandfather, who traveled to Singapore from the southern Chinese province of Guangdong in 1863. Malays, Indians, Arabs, Armenians and Jews likewise settled in the freewheeling entrepot, giving the city a polyglot character. By the 1920s, Malaya produced almost one-half of the world's rubber and one-third of its tin, exporting both via Singapore's port. By the time of Li's birth, Singapore had also become a cornerstone of British military strategy in Asia. Britain had been an ally of Japan since 1902, going so far as to call in Japanese marines to help crush an Indian army mutiny in Singapore in 1915. But by 1921, the Admiralty had become anxious about Japan's growing power and resolved to build a substantial naval base in Singapore, with the aim of turning it into the Gibraltar of the East. Despite the rise of Japan, the world of Lee's childhood was one in which the British Empire appeared both invincible and eternal. There was no question of any resentment, he recalled decades later. The superior status of the British in government and society was simply a fact of life. Lee's family prospered during the boom years of the 1920s. Influenced by a particularly anglophilic grandfather, Lee's parents also took the unusual step of giving their sons English names in addition to their Chinese ones. Lee's was Harry. From the age of six, he was educated in English language schools. Despite these English influences, Li's upbringing was traditionally Chinese. He was raised with his extended family, including seven cousins, in his maternal grandfather's house, where his parents shared a single room with their five children. From these childhood experiences and Confucian cultural influences, filial piety, frugality, and a Prizing of harmony and stability were early imprints on his mind. His parents were not educated professionals and suffered when the Great Depression struck in 1929. Lee wrote in his memoirs that his father, a storekeeper for Shell Oil Company, would often come home in a foul mood after losing at blackjack and demand some of my mother's jewelry to pawn so that he could go back to try his luck again. She always refused, safeguarding the education of the children, who, in turn, adored her and felt a lifelong obligation to meet her high expectations. A clever but at times rebellious student, the twelve-year-old Lee graduated at the top of his primary school class, thereby gaining admission to the Raffles Institution, alongside 150 of the best students of all ethnicities and classes in Singapore and Malaya who had been admitted exclusively on the basis of merit, including Miss Kwa Jik Chu, who was the only female student. Then as now, the Raffles Institution was the most rigorous English-language secondary school in Singapore, and the training ground of the city's future elite. 
It aimed at preparing the ablest colonial subjects for the entrance examinations to British universities. Later in life, upon meeting Commonwealth leaders from around the world, Lee invariably discovered that they also had gone through the same drill with the same textbooks and could quote the same passages from Shakespeare. They were all part of the Easy Old Boy Network, nurtured by the British colonial education system. Cognizant of their son's academic promise, and regretting that they had not made more of their own careers, Lee's parents encouraged him to pursue medicine or law. He dutifully made plans to study law in London, being placed first in Singapore and Malaya in the senior Cambridge examinations. But in 1940, with the outbreak of another world war in Europe, Lee decided it would be better to remain in Singapore and study at Raffles College, now the National University of Singapore, where he had been awarded a full scholarship. Lee excelled academically during his freshman year, competing with Miss Kwa for first place in various subjects. Returning to his dream to study law in England, he set his sights on attaining a Queen's Scholarship, which would cover the costs of a university education in Britain. Since only two students in the Straits settlements, Malacca, Penang and Singapore, were awarded a Queen's Scholarship every year, Lee was perpetually anxious that Miss Kwa and a top student from another school would take the first two places, leaving him behind in Singapore. There were greater anxieties to come. In December 1941, the Japanese bombed the U.S. Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and simultaneously attacked British Malaya, Hong Kong and Singapore. Two months later, in February 1942, the city was conquered by Japan in what Winston Churchill would call the worst disaster and largest capitulation in British history. Lee, then 18 years old, later described this as the first turning point of my life, contrasting the panicked departure of bourgeois British families with the stoic suffering of their colonial subjects, and the 80,000 British, Australian and Indian soldiers who had been captured by the Japanese. For Lee and countless other Singaporeans, the aura of overwhelming superiority with which the British held us in thrall was broken, never to be restored. A brutal occupation followed, as Singapore's trade, dependent economy was choked by war and its population demoralized by conditions of near starvation. Japanese authorities renamed streets and public buildings, took down the bronze statue of Raffles from Empress Place and imposed their imperial calendar. Lee himself narrowly avoided death. After being arbitrarily rounded up by Japanese troops in a mass detention of Chinese men, most of whom were summarily executed, especially those with soft hands or spectacles, singled out as the intellectuals, whose loyalties might lie with Britain. Tens of thousands were massacred. Lee was spared, took a three-month Japanese language course and found work, first as a clerk at a Japanese company then as an English translator in the Japanese propaganda department, and finally as a black market jewelry broker. During the war years, Lee learned that the key to survival was improvisation, a lesson that would shape his pragmatic, experimental approach to governing Singapore. With the war's end, Lee at last achieved a Queen's scholarship to study law at Cambridge, graduating with a first-class degree. Miss Kwa, whom Lee had begun courting during the war, followed the same path, and in December 1947 the two were quietly married in Stratford-upon-Avon. Chu, as Lee called her, was an extraordinary woman, with an unusual combination of brilliance and sensitivity. She became the indispensable anchor of his life not only in a day-to-day -day sense but above all as a pervasive emotional and intellectual support throughout his public activities. At Raffles College, she had majored in literature, reading from Jane Austen to J. R. R. Tolkien, from Thucydides' The Peloponnesian Wars to Virgil's Aeneid, 
as Lee reflected later. After their success at Cambridge, they returned to Singapore and co-founded a law firm, Lee and Lee. Lee's views during his Cambridge years were firmly socialist and anti-colonialist, even anti-British. Some of this was personal. He was occasionally turned away from hotels in England because of the color of his skin, but much more of it was to do with what he later called the ferment in the air. The independence struggles of India, Burma and other colonies were leading Lee to ask, why not Malaya, which then included Singapore? Convinced that the welfare state was the highest form of civilized society, Lee was an admirer of the post war reforms of Prime Minister Clement Attlee's Labour government as well as Indian Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru's statist economic policies. Lee first entered the public eye while in Britain, campaigning on behalf of a Labour Party friend who was running for Parliament. Standing on the back of a truck in the small town of Totnes in Devon, Lee delivered one of his first public speeches, trading on his identity as a British subject to advocate for Malaya's self-governance. His arguments foreshadowed his later style, more practical than ideological. Independence would be most successful if achieved cooperatively and incrementally between the independence movement and the mother country. Lee closed his speech with an appeal to British reason and self-interest. Even if you care nothing for fairness or social justice to the colonial peoples, then for the sake of your own self-interest, your own economic well-being, for the sake of the dollars you get out of Malaya and your other colonies, return a government that has the confidence of these peoples, who will then gladly cooperate with and be happy to grow up within the British Commonwealth and Empire. Building a state. While Lee was studying in England, Singapore was suffering wrenching post war disruptions. Well into the spring of 1947, food was rationed and tuberculosis rampant. The Malayan Communist Party and its trade union allies were organizing strikes that further damaged the economy. By the time of Lee's return to Singapore in August 1950, two major problems lingered, housing and corruption. Only one-third of Singaporeans had adequate housing, and construction was not keeping pace with demand. After stores closed for the day, it was common for employees to sleep on the floor. Corruption, untamed under British rule, had been exacerbated by wartime conditions, inflation eroded the purchasing power of civil servants' salaries, creating greater temptations for graft. Lee had returned with the intention of practicing law but was quickly drawn into Singapore's politics. His gifts were immediately rewarded. In 1954, at the age of 31, he founded the People's Action Party, PAP, within five years, galvanized by Lee's fearsome energy, it dominated the island's political landscape. Cyril Northcote Parkinson, the Raffles Professor of History at the University of Malaya in Singapore, described Lee's political positioning during these years as, as far to the left as possible, short of communism, and further to the left in words than action. With a strong social democratic message, the PAP emphasized the failure of colonial authorities to provide decent public services and clean, efficient government. PAP candidates campaigned without ties, in white short-sleeved shirts, intended at once as a no-nonsense accommodation to Singapore's tropical climate and a symbol of their commitment to honest governance. In May 1959, the city was granted self-government by London in all matters except foreign policy and defense. After the PAP secured a parliamentary majority in elections that month, Lee was appointed prime minister, a position he held until he stepped down in November 1990, more than three decades later. In the immediate aftermath of self-government, Singapore had three distinct constitutional arrangements within the space of a few years, as a British Crown colony from 1959 to 1963, 
as part of a new confederation called Malaysia from 1963 to 1965, and as an independent sovereign state after 1965. It was during this period near the end of colonial rule that the foundations of the modern Singaporean state were laid. Lee assembled an impressive cabinet, including the economist Go King Sui, appointed Minister of Finance, and the journalist S. Rajaratnam, appointed Minister of Culture, who drew up plans to ameliorate the city's social conditions. The new Housing and Development Board, HDB, soon began constructing high-rise residential projects on a massive scale, with the goal of giving all Singaporeans access to affordable housing of essentially the same type. Residents had the right to purchase their apartments from the HDB at established rates. Lee appointed a competent and dynamic businessman, Lim Kim San, to lead the board, at Lim's direction. It built more housing in three years than the British had in the preceding 32. In time, Singapore grew into a fully urban society of homeowners, providing every family with a stake in Singapore's future in the form of property. As Lee pointed out in his memoirs, closely linking individual economic prosperity to the state's well-being also ensured political stability, which in turn reinforced economic growth. At the same time, a system of racial and income quotas on Singapore's housing districts first put a limit on ethnic segregation, and then progressively eliminated it. By living and working together, Singaporeans from disparate ethnicities and religions began to develop a national consciousness. Lee moved just as quickly to eradicate corruption. Within a year of taking office, his government passed the Prevention of Corruption Act, which imposed severe penalties for corruption at every level of government and limited due process for suspected bribe-takers. Under Lee's leadership, corruption was swiftly and ruthlessly suppressed. Lee also put all foreign investments under intense scrutiny, personally performing some of his administration's uncompromising due diligence. His rigorous enforcement of Singapore's laws buttressed its reputation as an honest, safe place to do business. To achieve his objectives, Lee relied on penalizing civil servants for failure rather than encouraging them by raising their salaries, in fact, his government initially slashed them. Only in 1984, when Singapore had become wealthier, did Lee adopt his signature policy of pegging civil servants' salaries at 80% of comparable private sector rates. As a result, government officials in Singapore became some of the best compensated in the world. Success against corruption remains the moral basis of PAP rule, as a prominent Singaporean academic has observed. Corruption in Singapore is understood not only as a moral failing of the individuals involved, but also as a transgression against the ethical code of the community, which emphasizes meritocratic excellence, fair play and honorable conduct. Singapore has regularly been ranked as one of the least corrupt countries in the world, fulfilling Lee's goals for his country. As Lee observed later, you want men with good character, good mind, strong convictions. Without that Singapore won't make it. Reducing corruption made it possible to invest in government programs that ensured substantial improvement in Singaporeans' lives, and provided a fair playing field based on equality of opportunity. Between 1960 and 1963, Singapore's educational expenditure rose nearly 17-fold while the school population increased by 50 percent. In the PAP's first nine years in power, Lee set aside nearly one-third of Singapore's budget for education, an astonishing proportion in relation to neighboring countries, or indeed any country in the world. Emphasis on the quality of life turned into a defining aspect of Singapore's style. Beginning with a 1960 X-ray campaign against tuberculosis, 
Singapore made public health a major priority. As George Schultz and Vidar Jorgensen have observed, the city-state spends only 5% of GDP on medical care but has considerably better health outcomes than the U.S., which spends 18% of GDP on health. Life Expectancy in Singapore is 85.2 years, compared with 78.7 in the U.S. Within one generation, Singapore transformed itself from a disease-ridden slum into a first-world metropolis, all the while steadily shrinking the government's share of costs. To orchestrate this revolution in governance, Lee established a network of what he called parapolitical institutions to serve as a transmission belt between the state and its citizens. Community centers, citizens' consultative committees, residents' committees, and, later, town councils provided recreation, settled small grievances, offered such services as kindergartens and disseminated information about government policies. The PAP played an important role in these institutions, blurring the boundaries between party, state, and people. For example, Lee established almost 400 kindergartens that were exclusively staffed by PAP members. Through a combination of public service and what Lee described as skilled political street fighting, the PAP steadily entrenched itself following the 1959 elections and then again around the 1963 elections. By 1968, Lee had largely crushed his competitors, the opposition boycotted those elections, and the PAP won nearly 87% of the vote and all 58 legislative seats. After that, the PAP maintained itself largely unchallenged. One source of its continuing strength was Singapore's first-past-the-post electoral system, a British legacy which makes no provisions for minority votes. Another was that Lee used the legal system to isolate his political opponents and curtail unfriendly media outlets. He described his struggles with opposition figures as unarmed combat with no holds barred, in a contest where the winner took all. Lee was passionately concerned about public order. When he first came to power, the counterculture, and general relaxation of morals had not yet arisen in the West, but later Lee would reflect on this as freedom run amok. As a total system, I find parts of it totally unacceptable, he told Fareed Zakaria in 1994. The expansion of the right of the individual to behave or misbehave as he pleases has come at the expense of orderly society. In the East the main object is to have a well-ordered society so that everybody can have maximum enjoyment of his freedoms. This freedom can only exist in an ordered state and not in a natural state of contention and anarchy. As Lee was building Singapore, he did not believe a city state could stand on its own. His major effort was therefore to safeguard Singapore's impending independence from Britain by joining in federation with Malaya, believing that geography, economics, and ties of kinship created the basis for a natural unity between the two territories. Lee called a snap referendum on the merger for September 1962.To rally the Singaporean populace. He made a series of 36 radio broadcasts in the course of a single month, 12 scripts, each recorded in three languages, Mandarin, Malay, and English. His oratorical talents produced an overwhelming endorsement of his plan in the popular vote. A year later, on September 16, 1963, Lee's 40th birthday, Singapore and Malaya combined in the Malaysian Federation. The union was immediately challenged from within and without. Covetous of the augmented Malaysia's potential, dreaming of uniting the Malay peoples in a single country and enjoying the support of both Moscow and Beijing, Indonesian President Sukarno launched the Confrontasi, an undeclared war involving jungle combat and terrorism that left hundreds dead on both sides. For Singapore, 
the most dramatic event of the conflict was the bombing on March 10, 1965 of McDonald House, the first air-conditioned office building in Southeast Asia, by Indonesian Marines, which killed three people and injured more than 30. Within Malaysia, many Malay politicians distrusted Lee, despite the PAP's efforts to reduce communal tensions in Singapore and promote Malay as the national language. They feared that his dynamic personality and evident political gifts would outshine their own, leading to ethnic Chinese dominance of the new federation. Malay leaders opposed to Lee stoked violent ethnic riots in Singapore first in July and then again in September 1964, resulting in dozens killed and hundreds injured. The ostensible trigger for the riots was the demolition of Malay villages, kampongs, to make way for public housing, but there was clearly opportunism by ethnic chauvinists and communists at work as well. As a result, less than two years after they had been joined, Singapore and Malaysia separated again, ripped apart by intense partisanship and ethnic tensions. Singapore's independence came about in August 1965 not as a result of a homegrown liberation struggle, but due to Malaysia's unceremonious decision to cut its tiny southern neighbor loose. Expulsion left the island country entirely on its own, an outcome that Lee had neither expected nor sought. Announcing the failure of the merger brought him to the edge of tears. Every time we look back on this moment, it will be a moment of anguish, he said at a press conference in which he uncharacteristically struggled to keep his composure, nearly overwhelmed by the enormous task now before him. In his memoirs, Lee wrote that Singapore had become a heart without a body, as a result of the separation. We were a Chinese island in a Malay sea, he continued. How could we survive in such a hostile environment? It was the memory of this nadir which, for the rest of his life, gave Lee the sense that his country needed to overachieve because it was walking a perpetual tightrope between survival and catastrophe, building a nation. Writing in 1970, five years after Singapore's independence, the historian Arnold Toynbee predicted that the city-state in general had become too small a political unit to be practicable any longer, and that Singapore in particular was unlikely to last as a sovereign state. Much as Lee respected Toynbee, he did not share the scholar's fatalism. His response to Toynbee's challenge was to create a new nation out of the disparate peoples that the tides of history had deposited on the shores of Singapore. Only what Lee deemed a tightly knit, rugged, and adaptable people, a people united by national feeling, could endure the manifold tests of independence and guard against his two daunting nightmares, internal disorder and foreign aggression. His challenge was not primarily a technocratic task. Sacrifices might be imposed by force, but they could be sustained only by a sense of common belonging and shared destiny. We didn't have the ingredients of a nation, the elementary factors, Lee later reflected, a homogeneous population, common language, common culture, and common destiny. 78. To will the Singaporean nation into being, he acted as if it already existed and reinforced it with public policy. At the end of the press conference on August 9, 1965, announcing independence, Lee laid out an elevated mission for his people. There is nothing to be worried about. Many things will go on just as usual. But be firm, be calm. We are going to have a multiracial nation in Singapore. We will set the example. This is not a Malay nation. This is not a Chinese nation, this is not an Indian nation. Everybody will have his place. And finally, let us, really Singaporeans, I cannot call myself a Malaysian now, unite, regardless of race, language, religion, culture. Lee's immediate concern was to build a military capable of deterring further Indonesian aggression. 
separation from Malaysia had left Singapore without a single loyal regiment of its own, and it had no leaders who knew how to build a military from scratch. The able Goking Sui, now Minister of Defence, had been only a corporal in the Singapore Volunteer Corps at the British surrender to the Japanese in 1942. When Lee rode to the opening of the first Singaporean Parliament in December 1965, Malaysian troops had escorted him from his office to the session. On pounding the challenge, the island's Chinese majority did not have a tradition of soldiering, a profession that in Singapore had been historically dominated by ethnic Malays, potentially turning defense into a racial powder keg. Immediately after independence, Lee appealed to President Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt and Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri of India to send military trainers. Reluctant to antagonize Indonesia and Malaysia, both declined the request. In response, Lee made the audacious decision to accept an offer of assistance from Israel. Despite the backlash this risked among the significant Muslim population in Singapore and the region. To head off that threat, Lee simply decided not to announce the Israelis' presence. To anyone who asked, Singapore's new military advisors would instead be described as Mexicans. It proved to be an inspired combination, as Singapore's security dilemmas roughly mirrored those of Israel. Both were resource-poor countries without strategic depth, surrounded by bigger countries with revanchist temptations. Lee adopted the Israeli practice of a small but highly professional standing army, backed by a whole-of-society reserve capable of rapid mobilization. All young male Singaporeans, regardless of background, had to perform a period of military service and then regularly conduct in-camp training as reservists. Lee saw political and social benefits in national service, as contributing to a feeling of national unity and social equality across ethnic divides. In 1966, Indonesia extended diplomatic recognition to Singapore, which had proven resilient against the confrontasi. By 1971, Singapore had built up 17 National Service Battalions and an additional 14 Reserve Battalions. Despite enormous budget pressure, Lee found funding for the rapid acquisition of air and naval forces required for credible deterrence against Singapore's neighbors. He would go on to emphasize the latest technology and rigorous training as force multipliers to compensate for the island's limited space and manpower. Within a generation, Singapore's armed forces emerged as the most capable in Southeast Asia, a source of national pride and unity as well as foreign admiration, including by the United States Department of Defense. Unlike many other post-colonial leaders, Lee did not seek to strengthen his position by pitting the country's diverse communities against each other. To the contrary, he relied on Singapore's ability to foster a sense of national unity out of its conflicting ethnic groups. Despite the intense inter-ethnic violence that preceded independence, he defied the centrifugal forces intrinsic in Singapore's composition and developed a cohesive national identity. As he put it in 1967, It is only when you offer a man, without distinctions based on ethnic, cultural, linguistic, and other differences, a chance of belonging to this great human community, that you offer him a peaceful way forward to progress and to a higher level of human life. Lee's approach was neither to repress Singapore's diversity nor to discount it, but to channel and manage it. Any other course, he affirmed, would make governance impossible. Lee's most innovative initiative was his language policy. How to govern a city-state where 75% of the population spoke various Chinese dialects, 14% spoke Malay, and 8% spoke Tamil. After the failure of the merger with Malaysia, Lee no longer favored making Malay the national language. Making Mandarin the official language, 
however, was out of the question, in Lee's view, as of the 25% of the population who were not Chinese would revolt. English had long been the working language of government, but few Singaporeans spoke it as their mother tongue, as Lee did. His solution was a policy of bilingual education, requiring English language schools to teach Mandarin, Malay, and Tamil while mandating English classes in all other schools. Singapore's constitution enshrined four official languages Malay, Mandarin, Tamil, and English. As Lee said in 1994, If I had tried to foist the English language on the people of Singapore, I would have faced rebellion all around. But I offered every parent a choice of English and their mother tongue, in whatever order they chose. By their free choice, plus the rewards of the marketplace over a period of 30 years, we have ended up with English first and the mother tongue second. We have switched one university already established in the Chinese language from Chinese into English. Had this change been forced in five or ten years instead of being done over thirty years, and by free choice, it would have been a disaster. Being an English-speaking country provided an economic benefit as well. In the 1960s, Singapore stood out from rival developing economies by its distinct Anglophilic orientation. Lee's decision to retain the statue of Raffles preserved a non-sectarian figure from Singapore's past as a unifying national symbol. It also signaled to the world that Singapore was open for business and not in the business of recriminations. Let history judge. The rupture with Malaysia obliged Lee to reorient his initially socialist approach toward pragmatic essentials. For Singapore to survive as a state, its economy had to grow. For it to succeed as a nation, the fruits of that growth had to be shared equitably among its people regardless of ethnic origin. And for it to persist as an international presence, it had to build influence among the major powers, especially the U.S. and China. There are books to teach you how to build a house, how to repair engines, how to write a book, Lee would recall many years later. But I have not seen a book on how to build a nation out of a disparate collection of immigrants from China, British India the Dutch East Indies, or how to make a living for its people when its former economic role as the entrepot of the region is becoming defunct. Lee's experiences in the Second World War, in the contest for political power in Singapore and in the separation from Malaysia had given him convictions about the proper governance of states that no formal course of instruction could have offered. His travels and conversations with foreign leaders were consequential. By 1965, he had visited more than 50 countries and developed strong views about the reasons for their varying performance. A nation is great not by its size alone, he said in 1963. It is the will, the cohesion, the stamina, the discipline of its people and the quality of their leaders which ensures it an honorable place in history. This is why Lee adopted, let history judge, as his operating maxim. He rejected communism because it meant dismantling existing institutions that were working. Similarly, his preference for market economics was derived from the observation that it produced higher growth rates. When, at a dinner years later in my home, an American guest complimented him on including feminist principles in the development of Singapore, Lee disagreed. He had brought women into the labor force for practical reasons, he said. Singapore would not have been able to achieve its development goals without them. The same, he added, was true with respect to his immigration policy, which sought to convince talented foreigners to settle in Singapore. The purpose was not a theoretical notion of the benefits of multiculturalism but the requirements of Singapore's growth, and its otherwise stubborn demographics. Lee's thinking shows a strong utilitarian streak, as he demonstrated in his 1981 May Day Address. 
Every rational government wants the maximum well-being and progress for the largest numbers of their citizens. To bring this about, the systems or methods, and the principles or ideologies on which their policies are based, differ. Since the Industrial Revolution, two centuries ago, a kind of Darwinism between systems of government is at work. It is sorting out which ideological, religious, political, social, economic, military system will prevail because of its efficacy in providing the maximum good to the maximum numbers of a nation. Building an Economy One of the first major tests of Singapore's adaptability came in January 1968, when Britain, rattled by the devaluation of the pound and sapped by conflicts in the Middle East, decided to abandon its military presence east of Suez. In the House of Commons debate the previous year, Prime Minister Harold Wilson had quoted Rudyard Kipling's recessional, in a vain attempt to defend the existence of the British base in Singapore, now it read as a prophecy of Britain's imperial decline. Far called, our navies melt away, on dune and headland sinks the fire. Lo! All our pomp of yesterday is one with Nineveh and Tyre. The closure of the naval base and departure of British troops, planned for 1971, threatened to result in the loss of one-fifth of Singapore's gross national product. Seeking outside advice, Lee turned to Dr. Albert Winsemius, a Dutch economist who had first visited Singapore in 1960 at Goking Sui's invitation as part of a UN development program mission. Compared with Western countries, Singapore was poor. But in the 1960s, its wages were the highest in Asia. Winsemius advised that, for Singapore to industrialize, it needed to depress wages and make manufacturing more efficient by embracing technology and training workers. He proposed prioritizing textile manufacturing, followed by simple electronics and ship repair, a stepping stone to shipbuilding. Lee and Go, finance minister again from 1967 to 1970, followed his advice. With the British on their way out, Winsemius warned that Singapore could neither aspire to total self-reliance nor depend on regional ties. Unable to count on a common market with Malaysia, as it had from 1963 to 1965, it would have to operate in a wider sphere. Over the following years, Lee, Go, and Winsemius worked in tandem to recalibrate the Singaporean economy. While other leaders of newly independent countries rejected multinational corporations, Lee recruited them. Asked later whether such foreign investment constituted capitalist exploitation, Lee retorted unsentimentally, all we had was labor. So why not, if they want to exploit our labor? They're welcome to it. Backslash To attract foreign investment, Singapore embarked on a project to raise the quality of its workforce while giving itself the appearance and the facilities of a first-class city. As Lee remarked to me in 1978, others will not invest in a losing cause, it must look to be a winning cause. Greening the city became a high priority, reducing air pollution, planting trees and designing infrastructure to incorporate natural light. Lee also saw to it that high-quality services were provided to visiting tourists and investors. The government mounted public enlightenment campaigns promoting appropriate dress, comportment, and hygiene. Singaporeans, or foreigners, for that matter, could be fined for jaywalking, neglecting to flush a toilet or littering. Lee even requested a weekly report on the cleanliness of the restrooms at Changi Airport, which, for many travelers, would provide a first impression of Singapore. The strategy worked. Decades afterward, Lee would recount that once he was able to convince Hewlett Packard to set up a Singapore office, which opened in April 1970, other international businesses followed. 
by 1971, Singapore's economy was growing at more than 8% per year. By 1972, multinationals employed more than half of Singapore's labor force and accounted for 70% of its industrial production. By 1973, Singapore had become the world's third-largest IL refining hub. Within 10 years of independence, foreign investment in manufacturing had risen from $157 million to more than $3.7 billion. In early 1968, the mood in the Singaporean parliament had been gloomy and fearful. No one believed that the island could survive the British military's departure. Lee later admitted that the years from 1965 to the scheduled withdrawal in 1971 were the most nerve-wracking of his tenure, yet by the time the British departed, Singapore was able to absorb the economic shock, unemployment did not rise. Against all expectation and conventional wisdom, Lee's determination to adapt to change launched Singapore on an astonishing trajectory. To continue to attract investment, Singapore's productivity needed to keep climbing. To this end, Lee at first asked workers to accept temporarily reduced wages in the interest of long-term growth. He gave urgent priority to education. And he frequently revised the nation's industrial and social targets upwards. As Lee said in his 1981 May Day message, the greatest achievement of the Singapore labor movement has been to transform revolutionary fervor during the period of anti-colonialism, i.e. antagonism towards expat employers, in the 1950s to productivity consciousness, cooperation with management, both Singaporean and expat, in the 1980s. Over three decades, Lee drove Singapore to ever higher levels of development from subsistence to manufacturing, and from manufacturing to financial services, tourism and high tech innovation. By 1990, when Lee stepped down as Prime Minister, Singapore was in an enviable economic position. In 1992, looking back, he said to me that if I had asked him as late as 1975, by which time he had already attracted substantial amounts of foreign investment to Singapore, he still would not have predicted the scope of his country's eventual success. Lee and America Lee stunned my Harvard colleagues in 1968 with his defense of American involvement in Indochina. Had the political evolution of Southeast Asia attracted their attention earlier, they would have noticed that he had been propounding the same message for years. In fact, it was Lee's conviction of Washington's indispensable role for the future of Asia that had brought him to pay two important visits to America in as many years. On Lee's first state visit to Washington in October 1967, President Johnson introduced him at a White House dinner as a patriot, a brilliant political leader and a statesman of the new Asia. Lee, with his habitual bluntness, took the opportunity of his high-level meetings to instruct his hosts about how the Vietnam drama had its antecedents in American decisions dating back over a decade and a half. To Vice President Hubert Humphrey, Lee likened the Vietnam crisis to a long bus ride. The United States had missed all of the stops at which it could have gotten off. The only option now was to stay on until the final destination. In the decades to come, Lee would be admired for his candor as much as for his intelligence by presidents and prime ministers around the world. The subtlety and precision of his analysis and the reliability of his conduct turned him into a counselor, to many on whom he himself was dependent. How? Did the leader of a small and vulnerable city-state manage to exercise so significant an influence on so many leaders abroad? What was his perspective, and how was such a framework applied at moments of crisis? In a sense, Lee Kuan Yew was on a permanent quest for world order. 
he understood that the global balance of power was a product not only of anonymous forces but of living political entities, each replete with individual histories and culture, and each obliged to make a judgment of its opportunities. The maintenance of equilibrium, on which Singapore's own flourishing as a trading nation depended, required not only the balancing of the major countries against each other but a degree of comprehension of their diverse identities, and the perspectives that followed from them. For example, Lee observed in 1994, If you look at societies over the millennia you find certain basic patterns. American civilization from the Pilgrim Fathers on is one of optimism and the growth of orderly government. History in China is of dynasties which have risen and fallen, of the waxing and waning of societies. And through all that turbulence, the family, the extended family, the clan, has provided a kind of survival raft for the individual. Civilizations have collapsed, dynasties have been swept away by conquering hordes, but this life raft enables, Chinese civilization to carry on and get to its next phase. Li was respected by leaders of states far more powerful than his own to a unique degree because he furnished insights that enabled them to grasp their own essential challenges. Li's reading of foreign affairs was, like his analysis of Singapore's domestic requirements, based on his perception of objective reality. Subjective preference did not enter into his assessments, which invariably cut to the heart of the matter. Some leaders seek to impress interlocutors by demonstrating their command of minute details. Lee, whose own factual knowledge was considerable, possessed a more precious quality, the capacity to distill a subject to its essence. Just as the obstacles attending Singapore's birth had been defining experiences in Lee's political life, so, for the rest of his career, he placed special emphasis on the domestic evolution of other countries in evaluating their relevance to world order. Two countries were central to Lee's assessment of Singapore's survival and its place in the world, the United States and China. Lee defined the American relationship unpretentiously in a toast to President Richard Nixon at a White House dinner, in April 1973. We are a very small country placed strategically at the southernmost tip of Asia, and when the elephants are on the rampage, if you are a mouse there and you don't know the habits of the elephants, it can be a very painful business. A May 1981 speech likewise captures his prescience and clarity with respect to the Soviet system. Thirty-six years after the end of World War II we know that in the contest of Western free enterprise slash free market democracy versus communist command economy slash controlled distribution, the communist system is losing. It cannot deliver the goods. Unless this contest ends in mutual destruction by nuclear weapons, the outcome will see the survival of that system which is superior in providing both more security and more economic-slash-spiritual well-being to its members. If the West can prevent the Soviets from gaining easy spoils through their military superiority, the free market system of personal initiatives and incentives will be clearly proved superior to the centrally planned slash controlled market system. Ten years later, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Lee's perspective would become the conventional wisdom, at the time, few perceived the imminence of Soviet decay. In the American people, Lee discerned an unusual generosity and openness of spirit, reminiscent of elements in his own Confucian commitments. In the immediate post-war period, he observed, America did not abuse its nuclear monopoly. Any old and established nation would have ensured its supremacy for as long as it could. But America set out to put her defeated enemies on their feet to ward off an evil force, the Soviet Union, brought about technological change by transferring technology generously and freely to Europeans and to Japanese and enabled them to become challengers within 30 years. 
there was a certain greatness of spirit born out of the fear of communism plus American idealism that brought that about. As his geopolitical attention shifted in the aftermath of the Deng reforms from the threat of Maoist subversion to the more complicated grand strategic interplay among China, the Soviet Union and the United States, and later still to the management of China as a greatly empowered economic and political force. Li's assessments shifted accordingly. But he never altered the theme of the indispensable role of America in the security and progress of the world and especially Southeast Asia. It was not that Li was sentimentally pro-American, he was not sentimental at all. He could find a healthy amount to criticize in America's approach to politics and to geopolitics. He recorded his early views of Americans as mixed. I admired their can-do approach but shared the view of the British establishment of the time that the Americans were bright and brash, that they had enormous wealth but often misused it. It was not true that all it needed to fix a problem was to bring resources to bear on it. They meant well but were heavy-handed and lacked a sense of history. With the Vietnam War, Lee refined his view. It became important not only to match support for American power with understanding and encouragement of American purposes, it was now imperative to enlist America in the defense of stability in Asia. Britain's exit from Asia had made America essential as a balancer of the complicated and violent forces inimical to the region's equilibrium. The Cambridge educated Lee who had once been told by British Foreign Secretary George Brown that he was the best bloody Englishman east of Suez, adopted an attitude toward the United States that bore a resemblance to that of Churchill in establishing Britain's special relationship. Lee made himself, so far as he could, part of the American decision-making process on matters of concern to Southeast Asia. Yet in his case, the relationship would be formed by an Asian leader of a tiny post-colonial city-state. In Lee's view, the great American qualities of magnanimity and idealism were insufficient on their own. Geopolitical insight was required as a supplement to enable America to fulfill its role. Sensitivity to the tension between national ideals and strategic realities was essential. Lee feared that America's tendency toward moralistic foreign policy might turn into neo-isolationism when faced with disappointment, with the ways of the world. An overemphasis on democratic aspirations might hamper America's ability to empathize with less developed countries which, by necessity, gave priority to economic progress over ideology. Lee advanced these views in his characteristic style, a combination of history, culture and geography honed for relevance to contemporary concerns, an awareness of the interests of his interlocutor, and eloquent delivery stripped of small talk, extraneous matters or any hint of supplication. In 1994, he insisted that realism needed to be based on a clear moral distinction between good and evil. Certain basics about human nature do not change. Man needs a certain moral sense of right and wrong. There is such a thing called evil, and it is not the result of being a victim of society. You are just an evil man, prone to do evil things, and you have to be stopped from doing them. Lee presented his leadership to the world as operating within its cultural context and capable of relating regional developments to the wider world. Habitually analytic and prescriptive, he used the insights garnered from his network of contacts and extensive travels to answer questions and proffer advice. When I travel, Lee wrote, I am watching how a society, an administration, is functioning. Why are they good? After Lee stepped down from the premiership in 1990, reminding the United States of its responsibilities became a preoccupation. During the Cold War, Lee had been primarily concerned that America play a major role 
in maintaining the global equilibrium in the face of the Russian threat. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, his attention shifted to America's crucial importance in defining and maintaining the Asian equilibrium. Speaking at Harvard in 1992, at the very peak of American post-Cold War triumphalism, he warned that the geopolitical balance would be vastly impaired were the United States to turn inward, cash the post-Cold War, peace dividend, and weaken in its global responsibilities. My generation of Asians, who have experienced the last war, its horrors and miseries, and who remember the U.S. role in the phoenix-like rise from the ashes of that war to the prosperity of Japan, the newly industrializing economies, and ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, will feel a keen sense of regret that the world will become so vastly different because the U.S. becomes a less central player in the new balance. In 2002, he pointed out that global firefighting was not the same as America understanding and using its considerable leverage to produce lasting global stability. Viewing foreign policy in terms of strategic design, he defined great power balance as the key to international order and, above all, to the security and prosperity of Singapore. We just want maximum space to be ourselves, he said in 2011 and that is best achieved when big trees allow space for us, between them we have space. When, you have one big tree covering us, we have no space. Lee admired America and was made uneasy by its oscillations. He respected and feared China because of its single-minded pursuit of objectives. Out of historic proximity to China and necessary friendship with the United States, Lee distilled the security and future of Singapore. Lee and China Lee foresaw China's potential for hegemony in Asia. In 1973, when China was considered economically backward, he was already saying, China will make the grade. It is only a matter of time. As late as 1979, however, he was still expecting China to remain comparatively weak for the medium term. The world imagines China as a giant. It's more like a flabby jellyfish. We have to see how something can be made of their resources, and, their two weaknesses, the communist system, and the lack of training and know-how. Now, I fear they may not be sufficiently strong to play the role we want, for, them balancing off the Russians. I do not fear a strong China, I fear the Chinese may be too weak. A balance is necessary if we are to be free to choose our partners in progress. It will take them 15 to 20, 30 to 40 years. At the time, Li's attitude toward China's rise was ambivalent, as Singapore had conflicting objectives to make China strong enough to intimidate communist Vietnam, which Li thought would provide a relief, but not so strong that it might aggress against Taiwan. Yet even at that moment of relative weakness in China, Li warned of the country's determination and the upheaval it could unleash. I don't know if the Chinese leadership can fully comprehend the nature of the transformation that is due them if they succeed. One thing is certain, they want to succeed. His prediction aligned closely with the way a great strategist of a previous era, Napoleon, is said to have viewed China. Let China sleep, for when she wakes, she will shake the world. But when? By 1993, Li's views had evolved. China's rise was no longer a far-off event, it had become the overriding challenge of the era. The size of China's displacement of the world balance is such that the world must find a new balance in 30 to 40 years, he said. It's not possible to pretend that this is just another big player, he added. This is the biggest player in the history of man. He elaborated on this view a few years later. Short of some major unforeseeable disaster which brings chaos or breaks up China once again into so many warlord fiefdoms, 
it is only a question of time. Before the Chinese people reorganize, re-educate, and train themselves to take full advantage of modern science and technology. Li's approach to China, like his analysis of America, was unsentimental. If America's challenge, in Li's view, lay in its fluctuations between insufficiently reflective idealism and habitual bouts of self-doubt, the problem posed by China was the resurgence of a traditional imperial pattern. The millennia during which China conceived of itself as the middle kingdom, the central country in the world, and classified all other states as tributaries were bound to have left a legacy in Chinese thinking and to encourage a tendency toward hegemony. At this moment, I think the American outcome is best for us, he told an interviewer in 2011. I don't see the Chinese as a benign power as the Americans. I mean, they say Biu Cheng Ba won't be a hegemon. If you are not ready to be a hegemon, why do you keep on telling the world you are not going to be a hegemon? Determined to resist China's destabilizing policies during the Mao era, and afterward to ward off any impression that majority Chinese Singapore should be viewed as naturally aligned with the motherland. Li had long proclaimed that Singapore would be the last ASEAN country to establish diplomatic relations with Beijing. Singapore had also relied on Taiwanese investments and know-how to develop its industries, beginning with textiles and plastics. Following the opening to China by the West during the 1970s, Li was true to his word. He defined Singapore as autonomous toward both neighbors and superpowers. In 1975, he ignored an invitation from Zhou Enlai to visit China, a decision which ensured that Li and the ailing Zhou would never meet. Singapore officially recognized the PRC only in 1990. In November 1978, however, Li welcomed China's paramount leader, Deng Xiaoping. To Singapore. That event marked the beginning of the contemporary Singapore-China relationship. To symbolize the importance Li attached to this visit, he arranged for an ashtray and spittoon to be placed in front of China's then-leader, who was an avid smoker, despite Singapore's laws against smoking, and Li's strong allergy to smoke. Deng's agenda on that trip was to build opposition to the Soviet Union and unified Vietnam among Southeast Asian countries. Li was primarily concerned with easing domineering tendencies in Chinese policy toward Singapore. He explained to Deng that China's radio broadcasts aimed at radicalizing Southeast Asia's Chinese diaspora, made it difficult to cooperate with Beijing. Li asked that Deng halt the propaganda. Within two years it was gradually stopped. Years later, Li identified Deng as one of the three world leaders he most admired, the other two being Charles de Gaulle and Winston Churchill. Deng, in Li's view, was a great man because he changed China from a broken-backed state, which would have imploded like the Soviet Union, into what it is today, on the way to becoming the world's largest economy. According to the distinguished sinologist and Deng biographer Ezra Vogel, Deng was still undecided with respect to his economic policies when he visited Singapore, but the visit helped strengthen Deng's conviction of the need for fundamental reforms. The following month, he announced his open-door policy, which created special economic zones in coastal China to welcome foreign direct investment. As Vogel observed, Deng found orderly Singapore an appealing model for reform and dispatched emissaries there to learn about city planning, public management, and controlling corruption. During Deng's period of preeminence, Li began to pay annual visits to China, even before full recognition, to examine its urban development and agricultural reform and establish contacts with its leading officials. Li advised Zhao Ziang, the Chinese premier and later general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, 
that the openness required for economic growth did not have to come at the expense of Confucian values. In a later reflection beginning with a riff on Deng Xiaoping's phrase, crossing the river by feeling the stones, Zhao said that Li had shortened this river crossing for us. Li's advice would be manifested in the creation of a Singaporean industrial park in Suzhou, an ancient Chinese city near Shanghai famous for its many beautiful traditional Chinese gardens. Opened in 1994, the park was designed to integrate Singaporean management practices with local labor, thereby accelerating industrialization and attracting foreign capital to China. Singapore's sovereign wealth funds, Temasek Holdings and GIC, formerly Government of Singapore Investment Corporation, became major investors in China. In 1989, Li joined most of the West in condemning the Chinese leadership's suppression of the student protests in Tiananmen Square. He decried the brutality of the methods and called their human cost unacceptable. But he was also convinced that a political implosion in China would be a terrible risk for the world, posing a variety of dangers that the Soviet Union's own disintegration would soon illustrate. As Li later put it, comparing the two cases, Deng was the only leader in China with the political standing and strength to reverse Mao's policies. A veteran of war and revolution, he saw the student demonstrators at Tiananmen as a danger that threatened to throw China back into turmoil and chaos, prostrate for another 100 years. He had lived through a revolution and recognized the early signs of one at Tiananmen. Gorbachev, unlike Deng, had only read about revolution, and did not recognize the danger signals of the Soviet Union's impending collapse. After Tiananmen, China's economic reforms appeared to be faltering, and they were revived only following Deng's 1992 Southern Tour, an epic and highly influential month-long trip through several southern cities in which the 87-year-old and nominally retired Deng persuasively restated the case for economic liberalization between the U.S. and China. For the United States, Li's message about China was sobering and, in its deepest sense, unwelcome. America would be obliged to share its preeminent position in the Western Pacific, and perhaps in the wider world, with a new superpower. It just has to live with a bigger China, Li said in 2011, and this would prove completely novel for the U.S., as no country has ever been big enough to challenge its position. China will be able to do so in 20 to 30 years. Such an evolution would be painful for a society with America's own sense of exceptionalism, Lee warned. But American prosperity was itself due to exceptional factors, geopolitical good fortune, an abundance of resources and immigrant energy, a generous flow of capital and technology from Europe and two wide oceans that kept conflicts of the world away from American shores, backslash in the approaching world, as China became a formidable military power with cutting-edge technology, geography would provide no hedge for the United States. Li anticipated that the impending change would challenge the prevailing international equilibrium, and make the position of intermediate states precarious. Julius Nyerere the former prime minister of Tanzania, had warned Li, when elephants fight, the grass gets trampled. To which Li, who as we have seen was himself fond of elephant analogies, had responded, when elephants make love, the grass gets trampled, too. Singapore's aims of stability and growth would be best served by a cordial but cool relationship between the two superpowers, Li believed. Yet in his own interactions with Washington and Beijing, Li acted less as a national advocate for Singapore than as a philosophical guide to the two awesome giants. In his meetings with Chinese leaders, Li tended to marshal arguments attuned to their historical traumas and delivered with an otherwise rare emotion. In 2009, 
He cautioned the rising generation of Chinese leaders who had not experienced the deprivations and cataclysms of their elders, but felt a deep-seated resentment about their place in the world. This, older, generation has been through hell, great leap forward, hunger, starvation, near collision with the Russians. The cultural revolution gone mad. I have no doubt that this generation wants a peaceful rise. But the grandchildren? They think that they have already arrived, and if they begin to flex their muscles, we will have a very different China. Grandchildren never listen to grandfathers. The other problem is a more crucial one, if you start off with the belief that the world has been unkind to you, the world has exploited you, the imperialists have devastated you, looted Beijing, done all this to you, this is no good. You are not going back to the old China, when you were the only power in the world as far as you knew. Now, you are just one of many powers, many of them more innovative, inventive, and resilient. As a counterpart to this advice, Li counseled America not to treat China as an enemy from the outset, lest it develop a counter-strategy to demolish the U.S. in the Asia-Pacific. He warned that, in fact, the Chinese could already envision such a scenario, but that an inevitable contest between the two countries for supremacy in the Western Pacific need not lead to conflict. Accordingly, Li advised Washington to integrate Beijing into the international community and accept China as a big, powerful, rising state, with a seat in the boardroom. Rather than presenting itself as an enemy in Chinese eyes, the United States should acknowledge China as a great power, applaud its return to its position of respect and restoration of its glorious past, and propose specific concrete ways to work together. Lee considered that the Nixon administration had practiced this type of approach, describing President Nixon as a pragmatic strategist. In the world ahead, America's posture should be to engage, not contain, China, but in a way that would also quietly set pieces into place for a fallback position should China not play according to the rules as a good global citizen. In this way, should the countries of the region ever feel compelled to take sides, America's side of the chessboard should include Japan, Korea, ASEAN, India, Australia, New Zealand, and the Russian Federation. I was present during presentations by Lee on both sides of the Pacific. His American interlocutors, while generally receptive to Lee's geopolitical analysis, tended to inquire after his views on immediate issues, such as the North Korean nuclear program or the performance of Asian economies. They were also imbued with an expectation that China in the end would achieve an approximation of American political principles and institutions. Li's Chinese interlocutors, for their part, welcomed his arguments that China should be treated as a great power, and that differences, even in the long term, did not necessitate conflict. But beneath their smoothly polite manners, one also sensed a discomfort at being instructed by an overseas Chinese about principles of Chinese conduct. Li envisioned an apocalyptic scenario for war between the U.S. and China. Weapons of mass destruction guaranteed devastation, beyond that, no meaningful war aims, including especially the characteristics of the victory, could be defined. So it is no accident that, toward the end of his life. Li's appeals to China were persistently addressed to the generation that had never experienced the turmoil of his generation, and that might be too reliant on its technology or power. It is vital that the younger generation of Chinese, who have only lived during a period of peace and growth in China and have no experience of China's tumultuous past, are made aware of the mistakes China made as a result of hubris and excesses in ideology. They have to be imbued with the right values and attitudes to meet the future with humility and responsibility. 
Lee never tired of reminding his interlocutors that globalization meant that every nation, including, perhaps especially, those that had created the system and written its rules, would have to learn to live in a competitive world. Globalization had developed its ultimate form only in his lifetime with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the rise of China. In that world, great prosperity in close proximity to great want would generate flammable passions. Regionalism is no longer the ultimate solution, he said in 1979. Interdependence is the reality. It's one world. Global interconnection, he believed, could benefit everyone if handled wisely. After all, as he said to me in 2002, Singapore's own engagement with the world was the main reason its development had outpaced China's. In Li's view, the end of the Cold War had produced two contradictory phenomena globalization and potential strategic rivalry between the U.S. and China with the risk of a catastrophic war. Where many detected only peril, Li asserted the indispensability of mutual restraint. It was the essential obligation of both the U.S. and China to invest both hope and action in the possibility of a successful outcome. As few others, Li foretold at an early stage the dilemmas that China's evolution would present for both China and the U.S. Inevitably the two nations would impinge on each other. Would this new relation lead to growing confrontation, or would it be possible to transform adversarial conduct into joint analysis of the requirements of peaceful coexistence? For decades, Washington and Beijing proclaimed the latter goal. But today, in the third decade of the 21st century, both appear to have suspended efforts to give coexistence an operational expression and are turning instead toward sharpening rivalry. Will the world slide toward conflict as in the run-up to the First World War, when Europe inadvertently constructed a diplomatic doomsday machine that made each succeeding crisis progressively more difficult to solve until, finally, it blew up, destroying civilization as it was then perceived? Or will the two behemoths rediscover a definition of coexistence that is meaningful in terms of each side's conception of its greatness, and of its core interests? The fate of the modern world depends on the answer. Lee was one of the few leaders respected on both sides of the Pacific for both his insight and his achievements. Starting his career by developing a concept of order for a tiny speck of an island and its neighborhood, he spent his last years appealing for wisdom and restraint on the part of the countries capable of wreaking a global catastrophe. Though he would never have made such a claim for himself, the old realist had assumed a role as world conscience. Lee's Legacy After his long tenure, Lee resigned the office of Prime Minister in November 1990. In order to provide for a steady, managed transition, he gradually separated himself from day-to-day -day governance. With the titles first of Senior Minister and then Minister Mentor, he remained influential but progressively less visible through two prime ministerial successors. An assessment of Lee's legacy must begin with the extraordinary growth of Singapore's per capita gross domestic product, from $517 in 1965 to $11,900 in 1990 and $60,000 at present, 2020. Annual GDP growth averaged 8% well into the 1990s. It is one of the most remarkable economic success stories of modern times. In the late 1960s, it was received wisdom that post-colonial leaders ought to shield their economies from international market forces and develop autonomous, local industries. Through intensive state intervention, as an expression of their newfound liberation and out of nationalist and populist impulses, some even felt compelled to harass foreigners who had taken up residence on their soil during colonial days. The result, as Richard Nixon wrote, was that 
We live in a time when leaders are often judged more by the stridency of their rhetoric and the coloration of their politics than by the success of their policies. Especially in the developing world, too many people have gone to bed at night with their ears full but their stomachs empty. Lee took Singapore in the opposite direction, attracting multinational corporations by embracing free trade and capitalism and insisting on the enforcement of business contracts. He prized its ethnic diversity as a special asset, working assiduously to prevent outside forces from intervening in domestic disputes, and thus also helping to preserve his country's independence. While most of his peers adopted a posture of non-alignment in the Cold War, which in practice often meant de facto acquiescence in Soviet designs, Lee staked his geopolitical future on the reliability of the U.S. and its allies. In charting a path for his new society, Lee attached decisive importance to the centrality of culture. He rejected the belief, held in the liberal democracies of the West as well as in the Soviet-led communist bloc, that political ideologies were paramount in defining the evolution of a society and that all societies would modernize, in the same way. To the contrary, said Lee, the West believes the world must follow, its, historical development. But, democracy and individual rights are alien to the rest of the world. The universality of liberal claims was as inconceivable to him as the notion that Americans would someday choose to follow Confucius. But neither did Lee believe that such civilizational differences were insurmountable. Cultures should coexist and accommodate each other. Today, Singapore remains an authoritarian state, but authoritarianism per se was not Lee's goal, it was a means to an end. Nor was family autocracy. Go Chok Tong, no relation of Go King Sui, served as Prime Minister from November 1990 to August 2004. Lee's son Li Xiang Long, whose competence no one questions, succeeded Go and is now engaged in withdrawing from the premiership so that a successor can be determined in the next election cycle. They led Singapore further down the path on which Lee had set it. Elections in Singapore are not democratic, but they are not without significance. While in democracies discontent expresses itself through the possibility of electoral change, in Singapore Lee and his successors have used voting as a performance evaluation to inform those in power of the efficacy of their actions, thereby giving them the opportunity to adjust their policies depending on their judgment of the public interest. Was there an alternative? Might a different approach, more democratic and pluralist, have succeeded? Lee did not think so. He believed that at the beginning, as Singapore moved toward independence, it was in danger from the sectarian forces that tore apart many other post-colonial countries. As he saw it, Democratic states with significant ethnic divisions run the risk of succumbing to identity politics, which tend to accentuate sectarianism, asterisk, a democratic system functions by enabling a majority, variously defined, to create a government through elections, and then to create another government when political opinion shifts. But when political opinions, and divisions, are determined by immutable definitions of identity rather than by fluid policy differences, the prospects for any such outcome decline in proportion to the extent of the division, majorities tend to become permanent, and minorities seek to escape their subjugation through violence. In Lee's view, governance operated most effectively as a pragmatic unit of close associates untethered to ideology prizing technical and administrative competence and ruthlessly pursuing excellence. The touchstone for him was a sense of public service. Politics demands that extra of a person, a commitment to people and ideals. You are not just doing a job. This is a vocation, not unlike the priesthood. You must feel for people, 
you must want to change society and make lives better. What, then, of tomorrow? The key issue for Singapore's future is whether continuing economic and technological progress will lead to a democratic and humanistic transition. Should the country's performance falter, causing voters to seek protection in ethnic identity, elections in the Singaporean system could run the risk of turning into authentications of one-party ethnic rule. For idealists, the test of a structure is its relation to immutable criteria, for statesmen, it is adaptability to historical circumstance. By the latter standard, Lee Kuan Yew's legacy has thus far succeeded. But statesmen must also be judged by the evolution of their founding models. Scope for popular change will sooner or later become an essential component of sustainability. Can a better balance be devised between popular democracy and modified elitism? This will be Singapore's ultimate challenge. As in the mid-1960s, when Singapore first came into being, the world is today once again in a period of ideological uncertainty about how to build a successful society. Free market democracy which in the wake of the Soviet Union's collapse proclaimed itself the most viable arrangement, is simultaneously facing alternative external models and declining internal confidence. Other societal arrangements are asserting themselves as better at unlocking economic growth and instilling social harmony. Singapore's transformation under Lee's leadership bypassed such struggles. He avoided the rigid dogmas he decried as pet theories. Rather, he devised what he insisted was Singaporean exceptionalism. Lee was a relentless improviser, not a theoretician of government. He adopted policies that he thought stood a chance of working and revised them if he saw that they did not. He experimented constantly borrowing ideas from other countries and trying to learn from their mistakes. Nonetheless, he made sure that he was never mesmerized by the example of others, rather. Singapore had to ask itself constantly whether it was achieving goals imposed by its unique geography, and enabled by its special demographic makeup. As he himself would put it, I was never prisoner of any theory. What guided me were reason and reality. The acid test I applied to every theory or science was, would it work? Perhaps Kwa Jik Chu had taught him the adage of Alexander Pope, for forms of government let fools contest, whatever is best administered is best. Lee both founded a nation and laid down the pattern of a state. In the categories established in the introduction, he was both a prophet and a statesman. He conceived the nation and then he strove to create incentives for his state to develop through exceptional performance, in an evolving future. Lee succeeded in institutionalizing a creative process. Will it be adapted to evolving notions of human dignity? The Spanish philosopher Ortega y Gasset asserted that man has no nature, what he has is history. In the absence of a national history, Lee Kuan Yew invented Singapore's nature from his vision of the future and wrote its history as he went along. In doing so, he demonstrated the cogency of his conviction that the ultimate test of a statesman lies in the application of judgment, as he journeys along an unmarked road to an unknown destination. Lee the Person It was circumstances that created me. Lee told an interviewer three years before his death. In particular, he explained, it was his upbringing in a traditional Chinese family that explained his personality and made him an unconscious Confucianist. The underlying philosophy is that for a society to work well, you must have the interests of the mass of the people. That society takes priority over the interests of the individual. This is the primary difference with the American principle, which stresses, the primary rights of the individual. For Lee, the Confucian ideal was to be a junzi, or gentleman, 
loyal to his father and mother, faithful to his wife, who brings up his children well, and treats his friends properly, but who is most of all a good loyal citizen of his emperor. Li resolutely refused to engage in social chatter. He believed he was put into this world to accomplish progress for his society and, to the extent possible, for the world at large. He was disinclined to waste the time allotted to him. On his four visits to our weekend house in Connecticut, he would always bring his wife and generally one of his daughters. I would, by prior agreement, arrange meals with leaders and thinkers who were working on issues of concern to Lee, as well as some mutual personal friends. Lee used these occasions to inform himself on American affairs. Twice, at his request, I took him to local political events, one, a fundraiser for a congressional candidate, the other, a town hall meeting. I introduced him, as he asked, simply as a friend from Singapore. On the occasions when I visited Lee, he would invite leaders from neighboring countries as well as senior associates for a series of seminars. There would be a dinner and a discussion with him alone the duration of which depended on the subjects that most moved either of us at the moment but was never brief. The meetings took place at the Astana, a stately government building in the center of Singapore. In my many trips to Singapore, Lee never invited me to his home, neither have I ever encountered or heard of any recipient of this gesture, an attitude similar to de Gaulle's at Colum Bay to which Adenauer's visit was the single exception. Our friendship also came to include another Secretary of State, George Schultz, and Helmut Schmidt, who served as Chancellor of Germany from 1974 to 1982, asterisk, we met as a group, sometimes only three of us when Schultz's or Schmidt's schedules interfered first in Iran in 1978, and then in Singapore in 1979, in Bonn in 1980, and on the porch of Schultz's house in Palo Alto shortly after his appointment as Secretary of State in 1982. The four of us also attended a retreat in the Redwood Forests north of San Francisco, Schmidt, who incidentally shared Lee's disdain for small talk, as a guest of Schultz and Lee at my invitation. Though our views on specific policies were not always congruent, we shared a commitment, we always tell each other the absolute truth, as Schmidt put it to a German journalist. Conversations with Lee were a personal vote of confidence, they signaled an interlocutor's relevance to his otherwise monastically focused existence. In May 2008, Chu, Lee's beloved wife and companion of 60 years, was felled by a stroke that left her a prisoner in her own body unable to communicate. This ordeal lasted for more than two years. Every evening when he was in Singapore, Lee sat by her bedside reading to her aloud from books, and sometimes poems including Shakespeare's sonnets that he knew she cherished. Despite the absence of any evidence, he had faith that she understood. She keeps awake for me, he said to an interviewer in the months that followed her death in October 2010, Lee took the unprecedented step of initiating several phone conversations with me in which he made reference to his grief, and specifically to the void left in his life by Chu's passing. I asked whether he ever discussed his solitude with his children. No, replied Lee, as head of the family, it is my duty to support them, not lean on them. After Chu's death, Li's effervescence diminished. His intelligence remained, but his driven quality essentially disappeared. To the very end, he carried out what he considered his duties but, without his ultimate inspiration, joy had gone out of his life. Though I considered Li a friend for nearly half a century, he was restrained in expressing any personal ties. The closest he came was in the form of an unsolicited dedication that he inscribed in 2009 on a photograph of himself, and Chu, Henry, 
your friendship and support after our fortuitous meeting in Harvard, November 1968, made a huge difference in my life. Harry. In friendship as in politics, Lee let the significance speak for itself. Verbal elaboration would only diminish its magnitude. When Lee Kuan Yew died in March 2015, 25 years after stepping down as Prime Minister, dignitaries from all over the world converged on Singapore to offer their final respects. Many Asian heads of government attended, including the Prime Ministers of Japan, India, Vietnam and Indonesia, as well as the President of South Korea. China was represented by Vice President Lee Yuan Chao, the United States by former President Bill Clinton, former National Security Advisor Tom Donilon and myself. All of us had frequently encountered Lee on consequential questions in political life. The most moving aspect of the obsequies was its demonstration of the bond that had grown between the people of Singapore and their nation's founder. For the three days of Lee's lying in state, hundreds of thousands defied drenching monsoons to stay in line and pay homage at his beer. Television news channels carried cheerins informing mourners of how long they would have to wait to pay their respects. It was never less than three hours. Out of an amalgam of races, religions, ethnicities and cultures, Lee Kuan Yew had forged a society that transcended his own life. Lee meant his legacy to inspire, rather than inhibit, progress. That is why he requested that his home on Oxley Road be demolished after his death to avoid its becoming a memorial shrine. His aim was for Singapore to develop the leaders and institutions relevant to the challenges ahead, and to concentrate on its future rather than on worship of its past. All I can do, he told an interviewer, is to make sure that when I leave, the institutions are good, sound, clean, efficient, and there is a government in place that knows what it has got to do. Regarding his own legacy, Lee was as always unsentimentally analytical. He allowed for regrets, including for some of his own actions as national leader. I am not saying that everything I did was right, he told the New York Times, but everything I did was for an honorable purpose. I had to do some nasty things, locking fellows up without trial. Citing a Chinese proverb, a man cannot be judged until his coffin is closed, Lee said, close the coffin, then decide. 179. Today, the name of Lee Kuan Yew is falling into obscurity in the West. Yet history is longer than contemporary biography, and the lessons of Lee's experience remain urgent. World order today is being challenged simultaneously from two directions, the unraveling of entire regions where sectarian passions have overwhelmed traditional structures, and the intensifying antagonism of great powers with conflicting claims of legitimacy. The former threatens to create an expanding field of chaos, the latter, a cataclysmic bloodletting. Lee's statesmanship is relevant to both of these circumstances. His life's work is a testament to the possibility of evoking progress and sustainable order out of the least promising of conditions. His conduct in Singapore and on the world stage alike is a tutorial in how to foster comprehension and coexistence amidst diverse perspectives and backgrounds. Most significantly, Lee's statesmanship illustrates that the best determinants of a society's fate are neither its material wealth, nor other conventional measures of power but rather the quality of its people and the vision of its leaders. As Lee said, if you are just realistic, you become pedestrian, plebeian, you will fail. Therefore you must be able to soar above the reality and say, this is also possible. Leadership Six Studies in World Strategy Book by Henry Kissinger Chapter 6 Margaret Thatcher, The Strategy of Conviction A. A Most Unlikely Leader B. Thatcher and the British System 
c. The challenges ahead, Britain in the 1970s. d. The ascent from Grantham. e. A framework for leadership. f. The economic reformer. g. In defense of sovereignty, the Falklands conflict. h. Negotiations over Hong Kong. i. Confronting a legacy of violence, Northern Ireland. J. Fundamental Truths, The Special Relationship, and the Cold War. K. A Problem in Granada. L. A Strategic Shift, East, West Engagement. M. Defending Kuwaiti Sovereignty, The Gulf Crisis. N. The Limits to Leadership, Germany and the Future of Europe. O. Europe, The Endless Difficulty. P. The Fall. Q. Epilogue. R. Conclusion, The Evolution of Leadership. From Aristocracy to Meritocracy. S. Hard Truths. T. The Faltering Meritocracy. U. Deep Literacy and Visual Culture. V. Underlying Values. W. Leadership and World Order. X. The Future of Leadership. 6. Margaret Thatcher. The Strategy of Conviction A Most Unlikely Leader Few leaders define the era in which they govern. Yet from 1979 to 1990, this was Margaret Thatcher's singular achievement. As Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Thatcher labored to cast off the shackles that had limited her predecessors particularly the nostalgia for lost imperial glories and the abiding regret of national decline. The Britain that emerged as a result of her leadership was, to the world, a newly confident nation, and to America, a valued partner in the late Cold War. When she first took office, however, Thatcher's success was far from guaranteed, indeed, she was not expected to remain in power for long. Having wrested control of the Conservative Party from an exclusively male establishment that tolerated her under duress, she possessed only a meager share of political capital. Her previous record in government had been unremarkable, she had no great following in the country at large, and her experience in international relations was negligible. Not only was she Britain's first female Prime Minister, she was also at that time a rare conservative leader drawn from the middle class. In nearly every way, she was a complete outsider. Thatcher's greatest resource in these unpropitious circumstances was her unique approach to leadership. At the heart of her successes lay personal fortitude. As Ferdinand Mount, leader of the 10 Downing Street Policy Unit, 1982-3, would succinctly put it in describing her reforms, what is remarkable is not their originality but their implementation. The political courage lay not in putting them into practice but in creating the conditions which made it possible to put them into practice. Although I held no government position during Thatcher's tenure, it was my good fortune to witness her approach through the lens of a friendship that lasted nearly four decades. Thatcher and the British System To appreciate Margaret Thatcher's ascent and years in office, as well as her fall, it helps to have an understanding first of the British political system. Americans tend to experience their presidential system as a succession of individual leaders. At least until the recent hardening of partisan differences in America. The electorate generally conceived of the political parties as embodied expressions of public preferences. Presidents won office by grasping those preferences, embracing them and projecting them into the future. British political parties, by contrast, are rigorously institutionalized, and electoral victory functions first to empower a party in Parliament and, as a consequence of that, to install a new premier. As Thatcher put it in a 1968 speech to the Conservative Party's education wing, the essential characteristic of the British constitutional system 
is not that there is an alternative personality in the figure of the party leader, but that there is an alternative policy, and a whole alternative government ready to take office. That policy, moreover, is generally worked out in the party manifesto, which itself features as a major element in a UK election campaign. The Prime Minister therefore sits within and, in some ways, below the political party to which he or she belongs. Unlike the American presidential system, in which legitimate decision-making power flows downward from the top, the British cabinet system elevates the importance of ministers, who represent the highest echelons of the party. Authority moves in both directions between the prime minister and the cabinet. Ministers, though all appointed by the premier, are at once managers of the bureaucracy, the premier's supporters, actual or nominal, and sometimes aspiring leaders themselves. Within cabinet, the descent of an influential clique, or the machinations of a single magnetic personality, can limit the premier's ability to pursue desired policy objectives. In extraordinary circumstances, a cabinet minister's resignation may even threaten the premier's hold on power. While the prime minister's authority formally derives from the monarch, in practice it rests primarily on the maintenance of party discipline, that is, the leader's ability to sustain a parliamentary majority as well as the confidence of the party rank and file. Whereas the separation of powers system insulates the American executive from direct legislative pressure, in Britain the executive and legislative branches are largely fused together. In addition to being vulnerable during general elections, British premiers may be brought down by either a parliamentary vote of no confidence or a party mutiny. The former is rare, if a premier loses a no confidence vote, a general election must be called, in which members of parliament, MPs, have to defend their own seats. Less rare is the party leadership contest. If MPs fear that their party leader is growing personally unpopular, putting them at risk of losing their seats in the next general election, they may attempt to elevate a new one. When the party and the prime minister are in agreement and enjoy a solid majority, the system works smoothly. When prime ministers diverge from orthodoxy or appear weakened in parliament or public opinion, they must court both cabinet and party for continued support. Weak leadership can survive in the American system thanks to the executive's fixed four-year term in the British system. However, retaining the executive position requires all of the leader's fortitude, conviction mastery of substance and powers of persuasion. Since failure to convince colleagues to support one's policies can be catastrophic, a premier must also be nimble, lest a policy discarded foreshadow the end of one's political fortunes. In November 1974, Margaret Thatcher challenged Edward Heath for leadership of the Conservative Party. Heath had lost the February 1974 general election and thereby his position as prime minister. Usually, following an electoral defeat, the outgoing prime minister also resigns as party leader, but Heath held firm, remaining as party leader even after a second consecutive electoral defeat in October 1974 because he expected the relationships he had cultivated over a decade of leadership to serve as a bulwark against a serious challenge. And so, when Thatcher stepped forward, the contest was expected to be a mere formality, which would end by reaffirming Heath's authority over the party. To the surprise of many, her challenge was successful. Heath's electoral appeal was lackluster, and the conservative right had sensed an opportunity to reorient the party. After two conservative hopefuls, Keith Joseph and Edward Ducan, chose not to stand, the former endorsed Thatcher, his friend and intellectual ally. She thereby became the default selection of the right and the begrudging preference of the center. Besting Heath by 11 votes in the first ballot, 
she proceeded to outrun the centrist Willie Whitelaw by a wide margin in the second round, becoming the first female leader of a European major party. Upon winning party leadership, Thatcher was asked by a journalist, what quality would you most like the Tory party displaying, sick, under your leadership? She responded, win, the winning quality. The questioner pressed, what sort of philosophical quality? You only win by being for things, came Thatcher's spontaneous reply. For a free society with power well distributed amongst the citizens and not concentrated in the hands of the state, she continued. And the power supported by a wide distribution of private property amongst citizens and subjects and not in the hands of the state. These were the fundamental beliefs which she would translate into policy as Prime Minister, from 1979 to 1990 and for which she would become famous. The challenges ahead, Britain in the 1970s. When Thatcher assumed office in May 1979, Britain's fortunes were at a low ebb. The country, as she put it in her memoirs, had had the stuffing knocked out of it, the challenges it faced, not least in economic performance, were very real, but no less real was a psychological handicap the widespread belief that the country's best days were in the past. In 1945, the United Kingdom had emerged from six years of total war victorious but exhausted and bankrupt. Its post-war foreign relations were marked by a series of disappointments. Wartime solidarity with the United States was replaced by watching with some unease as Washington proceeded to supplant Britain's global preeminence. Within weeks of the Allied victory, Britain suffered the indignity of having the generous U.S. Lend-Lease program cancelled, replaced by a loan on commercial terms that it could ill afford. America's rising power and Britain's loss of status combined to produce new geopolitical realities. In his landmark 1946 speech in Fulton, Missouri, Winston Churchill not only spoke of the Iron Curtain, descending across Europe but also proposed a special relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States. Churchill hoped to cement a partnership that would secure Britain's influence in the world beyond what its raw power alone might allow, effectively borrowing U.S. power through a close consultative relationship. While a shared Anglo-American assessment of the Soviet threat helped to place the transatlantic alliance on new foundations, in this post-war phase it was already painfully apparent that this was not a partnership between equals. By 1956, the emerging balance of power, already disappointing for post-war Britain, was made both conspicuous and embarrassing. In July of that year, Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal. Three months later, during the Anglo-French invasion of Egypt to retake the canal, Britain came up against the might of the new American superpower, and folded. President Eisenhower had little patience for Britain's efforts to revive its imperial prerogatives, and even less for the invasion of a strategically important zone without prior consultation. The financial pressure he soon brought to bear put a swift end to the British, French venture and dealt a devastating blow to both nations' global aspirations. Chastened, Britain withdrew its forces and reduced its international role. The abiding lesson for many in the British governing class was never in the future to cross the Americans. The burdens of decolonization abroad and a faltering economy at home further diminished Britain's standing. In 1967, Harold Wilson's Labour government was forced to devalue the pound sterling. A year later, his country beset by recurring financial crises, Wilson announced the withdrawal of all British forces east of Suez. A once global actor had been forced to retreat to a regional stage. The final stanza of Philip Larkin's Homage to a Government, 1969, captures Britain's dour mood well. 
next year we shall be living in a country that brought its soldiers home for lack of money. The statues will be standing in the same tree-muffled squares, and look nearly the same. Our children will not know it's a different country. All we can hope to leave them now is money. As Britain's global influence receded, the continuing lure of the Atlanticist paradigm came up against the competing possibility of a closer relationship with continental Europe. The UK in those years exhibited a confusion over its broader identity that at times seemed to border on schizophrenia. Before the Suez debacle Prime Minister Anthony Eden had rejected British participation in what became the 1957 Treaty of Rome, which created the forerunner of today's European Union. The following year, however, Eden's successor Harold Macmillan, while seeking to maintain a close defense relationship with the United States, decided to set Britain on a pro-European course. In 1963 and again in 1967, Britain belatedly tried to join the European Economic Community EEC, only to find its efforts vetoed by French President Charles de Gaulle. Former Secretary of State Dean Acheson's assertion in 1962 that Great Britain had lost an empire but not yet found a role became famous and wounded British pride because it rang so true. Edward Heath, who became Prime Minister in 1970, sought to turn the pro-European course first developed by Macmillan into the guiding principle of British foreign policy. Britain's entry into the EEC in 1973 proved to be Heath's crowning achievement. But it also placed a nettlesome burden on UK-US relations. President Nixon had been delighted by Heath's victory at the polls, much preferring him to Harold Wilson, whose Labour Party the president identified with the US Democratic Party. In fact, the Labour Party under both Wilson and his successor, James Callaghan, unstintingly honored the special relationship, especially with respect to NATO and East-West relations, and also believed in the British independent nuclear deterrent. But Michael Stewart, the first Labour foreign secretary encountered by Nixon, had challenged him in the Oval Office over American intervention in Vietnam, and the sour impression lingered. In his years out of office, Nixon had become acquainted with Heath and expected their personally friendly relationship to continue once the Conservatives returned to power. As late as February 1973, Nixon was still speaking warmly of Heath as a friend in Europe. The only solid one we've got. Unfortunately, these sentiments did not prove reciprocal. As a result of de Gaulle's repeated vetoes of British membership in the European community, Heath had drawn the lesson that the British Prime Minister had to be a good European. Viewing a special relationship with the US as an obstacle to that goal, he strove to reduce the ties that had been nurtured for more than a generation, at least in their public manifestations. Only after Heath lost the February 1974 election did the incoming Labour government begin to restore the partnership. It thus remained to be seen whether the Conservatives, should they return to power, would revive the remoteness of Heath's later years or return to their historically Atlanticist roots. British foreign policy uncertainties of this period were compounded by the U.S. domestic crisis, the Watergate scandal which led to Nixon's resignation. In the aftermath, Congress imposed limits on executive authority, which in turn complicated efforts to carry out Allied Cold War strategy. Sensing opportunity, the Soviets embarked on renewed adventurism. In 1975, Moscow intervened militarily in Angola via Cuban proxies. The Soviets also flexed their muscles in South Yemen and Afghanistan without drawing an effective Western response. In 1976, the Soviet Union began deploying SS-20 medium-range nuclear missiles to Warsaw Pact countries, 
establishing the greatest threat to NATO's defensive doctrine in a generation. NATO's equivalent weapons system, composed of medium-range land-based missiles, was then still under development. European member states would struggle to rally public support in favor of its eventual deployment. Europe therefore largely rested its defense doctrine on the viability of the American nuclear umbrella. In other words, Soviet military planners had to assume that American policymakers would respond to a conventional military conflict in the European theater by drawing on the U.S. long-range intercontinental arsenal. That an escalation of this nature would naturally invite Soviet nuclear retaliation, not only on Europe but also on the American homeland, placed a severe strain on the credibility of extended deterrence, as has been discussed in the chapters on Adenauer and de Gaulle. By the late 1970s, moreover, Europeans had become increasingly attracted to the anti-nuclear movement, making it much more difficult for European leaders to base their security policies on nuclear deterrence. The most meaningful response was the deployment of U.S. intermediate-range ballistic missiles on European soil, which was anathema to the nuclear disarmament movement. The protesters favored seeking accommodation with the Soviets and, no doubt, an attendant drift toward neutrality in the East-West conflict. The greatest challenge for Britain in the 1970s, however, was its moribund economy. Stifled by low productivity and onerous taxation, the British economy lagged behind its competitors for much of the 1970s. The high inflation of the period led to strife between employers and trade unions. As workers saw their earnings eaten up by higher prices, they pressed for wage increases, intensifying the inflationary cycle. The strains of this escalating conflict between the government and the National Union of Mine Workers led Heath to declare a three-day workweek starting on January 1, 1974. Television broadcasts were cut at 10.30 p.m. Commercial use of electricity was restricted to three days a week to conserve coal while the miners were on strike. By early March, a new Labour government had been elected. Prime Minister Harold Wilson immediately agreed to raise miners' wages by 35 percent. The economic crisis, however, was just beginning. In 1976, Britain suffered the indignity of having to approach the International Monetary Fund IMF, for a $3.9 billion emergency loan, nearly $18 billion in 2020 dollars. Consumer prices, which had been rising at the stable pace of 2.5 percent as recently as 1967, increased by 24.2 percent in 1975, a record in Britain's modern economic history. By the following year, Britain's economy appeared to have stabilized, but the reprieve was short-lived, creating a historic opening for the new leader of the opposition, Margaret Thatcher. By late 1978, inflation had returned with a vengeance. In November, Ford Motor Company's British operations gave striking workers a 17% raise, in contravention of the 5% cap on pay increases which the Labour government, now led by James Callaghan, had introduced. The government's strategy to fight inflation by imposing wage and price controls was thereby thrown into disarray. The following January, temperatures averaged below freezing across Britain, making it the third coldest winter of the 20th century. Emboldened by Ford's 17% raise, truck drivers began a wildcat strike on January 3, 1979. Not only did they fail to show up for work, they also used their vehicles to block roads, ports and oil refineries. Fearful of shortages, customers emptied grocery store shelves in what became a self-fulfilling premonition of scarcity. Conditions grew more severe as the strikes spread to the public sector, rail services ceased, buses idled. 
Leicester Square, the center of London's theater district, was transformed into a makeshift garbage dump. Emergency calls went unanswered and, in more than one locality, the dead went unburied. This was the bitter harvest of a generation of British leadership which had embraced as its principal task, the orderly management of decline. To get itself out of this sorry condition, the nation would soon turn to a very different kind of leader. The Ascent from Grantham In 1948, Margaret Roberts, a recent graduate of Oxford with a degree in chemistry, applied for a research job at Imperial Chemical Industries, ICI. She was rejected. The internal assessment of her candidacy read, This woman is headstrong, obstinate, and dangerously self-opinionated. Three decades later, it was an inkling of these same qualities that persuaded the people of the United Kingdom to choose this woman to tackle the challenges facing their nation. Born in 1925 in the market town of Grantham, Margaret Roberts was brought up in a strict Methodist family that prized hard work, integrity, and biblical teachings. Sundays were wholly devoted to church. Margaret and her older sister Muriel attended worship and Sunday school in the morning, often returning to church for another round of classes and prayer in the afternoon and early evening. Their father, Alfred Roberts, was a Methodist lay preacher. The Roberts' home was modest, consisting of a few rooms above Alfred's grocery store and lacking hot water or an indoor bathroom. Shortly before her eleventh birthday, Margaret enrolled as a scholarship student at the Castephen and Grantham Girls School, a selective grammar school, where she excelled academically. When she was granted a peerage later in life, she chose to style herself Baroness Thatcher of Castephen, rather than of Grantham, as a tribute to the school that had shaped her. It was during these formative years, in April 1939, to be precise, that the Roberts family welcomed into their midst a 17-year-old Jewish girl from Vienna named Edith Mulbauer, who had been Muriel's pen pal. Shortly after the Nazi occupation of Austria, Edith's parents wrote to ask Alfred Roberts whether he could arrange a visa for her, and she ended up living with his family briefly before moving to more comfortable arrangements with another Grantham household. Edith's parents were later able to flee Austria, eventually settling in Brazil. This and other early memories, such as Margaret's mother's weekly habit of baking loaves of bread to pass discreetly to needy families, reinforced the enduring pertinence in her upbringing of the biblical commandment to love thy neighbor as thyself. After a strong academic performance in high school, Margaret Roberts gained admission to Oxford University, where she became president of the Oxford University Conservative Association. Following a brief stint as a research chemist, she passed the bar exam and became a barrister. Yet, even as she ventured far from her parents' home in Grantham, she always carried inside herself the values inculcated by her family and faith, discipline, thrift, sympathy, and practical support. In 1950s Britain, the political terrain was notably inhospitable to women. Through sheer persistence, determination, and a healthy dose of charm, Mrs. Thatcher, as she became following her 1951 marriage to Dennis Thatcher, a businessman who was her lifelong support, secured the nomination for a safe conservative seat and by 1959 had been elected to Parliament for a North London constituency. In 1960, at the age of 34, she gave her first speech before the House of Commons. The purpose of the speech was twofold, first, to advocate for the legislation she was sponsoring and, second, to introduce herself to her colleagues and the country. The second goal she achieved briskly, omitting any introduction or preliminary embellishments. This is a maiden speech, she said, but I know that the constituency of Finchley, which I have the honor to represent, 
would not wish me to do other than come straight to the point and address myself to the matter before the house. Speaking without notes, she explained what she viewed as a serious constitutional problem. At the time, it was common for local elected officials to use procedural maneuvers to block members of the public from attending local government meetings. Then as now, local councils were responsible for overseeing schools, libraries, public housing and waste collection, the essential public services of everyday life. Without direct access, Thatcher noted, the public had to rely on the press alone for information, but the press, too, was barred from attendance. In her view, public access was a matter of first principles. In England and Wales, local authorities spend £1,400 million a year and, in Scotland, just over £200 million a year. Those sums are not insignificant, even in terms of national budgets. The first purpose in admitting the press is that we may know how those monies are being spent. In the second place, I quote from the report of the Franks Committee, publicity is the greatest and most effective check against any arbitrary action. The bill passed and remains in force across the United Kingdom. She would reprise the theme of fiscal stewardship throughout her career in public service. Thus began Thatcher's climb up the parliamentary ladder, on each of its rungs, her competence and commitment left a clear mark. At the same time, she was carving out a position on the right of the political spectrum that was often at odds, with the conservative leadership's more moderate line. Although her self-description as a conviction politician would come later, her uncommonly straightforward manner was already evident. As she said of the relationship between voters and politicians in 1968, if the elector suspects the politician of making promises simply to get his vote, he despises him, but if the promises are not forthcoming, he may reject him. I believe that parties and elections are about more than rival lists of miscellaneous promises, indeed, if they were not, democracy would scarcely be worth preserving, emphasis in original. With the Conservative Party's return to power under Heath in 1970, Thatcher entered the cabinet for the first time as Secretary of State for Education and Science. She immediately attracted controversy, in part for the sheer intensity of her pace. In an attempt to redirect funds for more promising educational investments elsewhere, she cut bloated budgets, including, notoriously, a free milk program for primary school children, for which she earned the sobriquet, Milk Snatcher. She also reversed Labour's attempt to mandate the closure of grammar schools and helped pass free market legislation to make scientific research more competitive. Heath's willingness to defer to the status consensus, however, left Thatcher disillusioned. Convinced that the economic status quo was untenable, she turned to friends at the Institute of Economic Affairs, a free market think tank, who introduced her to the contributions of Frederick Bastiat, F. A. Hayek and Milton Friedman. Undertaking such a self-education in economics would have been an impressive intellectual feat for anyone, doubly so for an established politician in middle age. Meanwhile, with regard to foreign policy, Thatcher's instincts similarly ran counter to Heath's prioritization of Europe over a close relationship with the United States. Having recognized their fundamental differences, she waited until Heath lost the October 1974 general election to challenge him for the party leadership. Thatcher's decision to put herself forward, given the expectation that she would almost certainly lose, was a notable exhibition of courage and conviction. The Conservatives, long dominated by patrician men, surprised not only themselves but much of the Western world by electing her as their leader in February 1975. The party of Winston Churchill, Anthony Eden and Harold Macmillan was now led by a grocer's daughter. 
Despite the novelty value of Thatcher's election, the widespread expectation was that her tenure would prove brief. As President Gerald Ford's national security adviser, I was hardly immune to this conventional wisdom. In May 1975, I highlighted the credentials of Winston Churchill's son-in-law, Christopher Soames, whom I felt was likely to become a big conservative leader in the future. My prognosis for the current leader was less positive, I don't think Margaret Thatcher will last. While my judgment of her prospects was less than perspicacious, my evaluation of her character proved more enduring. I first met Thatcher in 1973, during her tenure as Education Secretary. The meeting came about at the urging of my future wife, Nancy Magins, who in connection with an educational study she was producing for New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller had consulted Thatcher. Impressed, Nancy suggested I seek a meeting of my own. My request ran into considerable resistance from Heath, then at the height of his effort to distance Britain from the United States. Nevertheless, I managed to arrange a get. Together through the auspices of a friend. I would see Thatcher again in late 1973 and in February 1975 days after she had outmaneuvered Heath and assumed party leadership. From the first meeting, Thatcher's vitality and commitment fixed her notion of leadership firmly in my mind. Nearly every other politician of the era argued that to win elections, one had to capture the center ground. Thatcher demurred. That approach, she asserted, amounted to a subversion of democracy. The quest for the center was a recipe for vacuity, instead, different arguments had to clash, creating real choices for the voter. Another event that helped shape our burgeoning relationship was Thatcher's visit to Washington in September 1977. President Jimmy Carter's attitude toward either large or small c conservatives recalled that of Nixon toward the Labour Party. Correspondingly, Carter's treatment of the visiting leader of the Conservative Party was correct but aloof. National Security Adviser Zbigniew Brzezinski advised Carter to plead a heavy schedule and refuse to meet with Thatcher, Carter obliged. As a result, she was treated with less attention than she had expected given her own warm feelings for the United States. Nancy and I invited Thatcher to dinner one evening, together with leading Washington personalities from both parties, an informal occasion which set the tone for our future meetings. After becoming Prime Minister, Thatcher generally invited me for private discussions, by then I no longer held office, to exchange views on international topics, or simply to cross-check the prevailing views of her foreign office. If others were present, it was usually a close aid, cabinet officials were rarely invited to our meetings. From 1984 onward, a key figure in those meetings was Thatcher's foreign policy adviser Charles Powell, one of the public servants to whom Britain owed its eminence. Highly intelligent, self-effacing, and unostentatiously patriotic, Powell had been transferred from the Foreign Office after a distinguished diplomatic career that had taken him to Helsinki, Washington, Bonn, and Brussels. He became a lifelong friend of Thatcher's, sustaining her through her difficult retirement. Shortly after Thatcher became leader of the Conservative Party, she outlined her thinking at a meeting with me over a traditional English breakfast at Claridge's. Articulate and thoughtful, she made clear that her ambition was nothing less than to transform the country. She aimed to do so not by pursuing some vague middle ground, but by articulating a program that would make the middle ground see things as she did. Her rhetoric and policies would strike a genuine contrast to the staid conventional wisdom that, in her view, had doomed Britain to stagnation. Then, after winning the next election, she would carry out fundamental reforms to overcome conventional wisdom, the doctrine of complacency, 
and the prevailing passivity with respect to the ravages of inflation, the power of the trade unions or the inefficiency of state-owned enterprises. For Thatcher, there were no sacred cows, much less insurmountable obstacles. Every policy was up for scrutiny. It was not sufficient, she argued, for conservatives to sand down the rough edges of socialism. They had to roll back the state before Britain's economy collapsed in catastrophic fashion. In the realm of foreign affairs, she was disarmingly honest about her inexperience, confessing that she had yet to formulate detailed ideas of her own. But she made clear that she believed passionately in the special relationship with the United States. By articulating her views as clearly and forcefully as possible, she aimed to shift the political center of gravity in her direction. And she had confidence that the British people would recognize the difference between sturdy principles and passing fads. As she put it in a 1983 interview, there would have been no great prophets, no great philosophers in life, no great things to follow, if those who propounded their views had gone out and said, O oh, brothers, follow me. I believe in consensus. Our meetings continued long after Thatcher left office and through the rest of her life. I describe our relationship in this way to make a point, unlike the President of the United States, the British Prime Minister does not have the ability to override the cabinet and still maintain his or her government. Thatcher was aware of these limits. To help her compensate, she would discreetly call on friends in Britain and around the world to discuss her vision and her options. A Framework for Leadership Thatcher's foreign policy views would, over time, come into tighter focus, in no small part thanks to her extraordinarily diligent habits of study, including reading and annotating briefing papers late into the night and her practice of convening weekend seminars on long-term trends with university professors and other intellectuals. Some of her strategic convictions, such as the inviolable sovereignty of the nation-state, were apparent from our earliest meetings. An implacable advocate of self-determination, Thatcher believed in the right of citizens to choose their own form of government and in the responsibility of states to exercise sovereignty, on their own behalf. For Thatcher, British sovereignty was inextricably tied to the country's unique history, geographical integrity, and fiercely guarded independence. Although she rarely spoke in abstract terms, in practice she subscribed to the broader notion dating back to the Peace of Westphalia of 1648, that the sovereignty of individual nations was instrumental to stability between them. She believed in each country's right to uphold its own law-based governance and to act according to its interests without illegitimate interference. Although I am a strong believer in international law, she remarked in her memoirs, I did not like unnecessary resort to the UN because it suggested that sovereign states lacked the moral authority to act on their own behalf. The logic of these convictions led Thatcher to an unqualified belief in a strong national defense. To her, credible deterrence was the only real guarantee of peace and of the preservation of Westphalian sovereignty. In practice, this meant that Western military capabilities would have to be restored before productive negotiations with the Soviet Union could be held. Thatcher was also motivated by a staunch anti-communist conviction, fueled, in part, by her belief that Soviet expansionism posed an existential threat to the West. She did not hesitate to express her belief that communism's subjugation of the individual was intrinsically immoral. Actively promoting liberal democracy throughout her career as inherently morally superior, she emerged as a champion of freedom. Thatcher's idealism was bounded by important limits, specifically, the existence of a nuclear-armed Soviet Union. Britain now had far fewer capacities to act unilaterally in the world than it did before the Second World War, 
national sovereignty could only be defended by closely partnering with America. Churchill's notion of a special relationship with the United States included a substantial element of realism. Britain could magnify its influence by gearing its policies closely to those of the United States. Such a relationship did not specify a formal structure, but it did include patterns of conduct. The US and the UK developed close intelligence cooperation during the Second World War and continued it. During the Cold War, when they invited Australia, Canada and New Zealand into what became the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance. Privately, both US and UK leaders would engage in intense consultation before major decisions, publicly, they would pay tribute to historical amity. British diplomats became exceptionally skillful at making themselves part of the American decision-making process even inducing guilt in American policymakers if they disregarded British precepts. No British Prime Minister had a deeper commitment to this transatlantic orientation than Margaret Thatcher. As leader of the opposition, she had made it her mission to rebuild the relationship with the United States following the disappointments of the Heath years. She believed in the indispensability of U.S. leadership for the well-being of both Britain and the world. As she once told me, anything which weakened the United States weakened the free world. Beyond this practical judgment, she was a genuine admirer of the United States. She believed that the United States and the United Kingdom, inheritors of many shared values and much common history, needed to engage in a joint project to reinvigorate the Western alliance. Under her leadership, Britain became less a beneficiary and more a partner in that joint enterprise. While Thatcher's leadership was governed by principles, she never allowed her decisions to be overwhelmed by abstractions. Her strength lay in her indomitable willpower, made effectual by ample reserves of charm. Part of her genius as a leader inhered in the ability to adapt to the dictates of reality without relinquishing her larger vision. In her determination to effect change, she accepted results that in themselves were only stages in a lengthier process. As Charles Powell has observed, like a sensible naval officer, she knew when to make smoke and retire to avoid tactical defeats but always maintained the ultimate objective and battled on to achieve it. To her mind, acting imperfectly was always preferable to doing nothing. The Economic Reformer Outside Britain, Thatcher is remembered as a commanding presence on the international scene, but Britons elected her primarily as a domestic reformer. Her victory was not foreordained, in the autumn of 1978, the dramatic events that would lead to the Labour government's demise were unforeseeable. Thanks to her self-education in economics, however, Thatcher was intellectually prepared to exploit political opportunities when they presented themselves. She understood the sources of Britain's woes and would go on to propose compelling solutions. That would win support in the May 1979 general election. Measured against the exacting standards of Hayekian theory, Thatcher's economic program was perhaps slow and half-complete. Viewed within the context of electoral politics, however, her approach was decisive, unusually amenable to experimentation and ultimately history-making. Determined to whip inflation, Thatcher's new government raised interest rates to the recession-inducing level of 17%, to date, an all-time high. And the recession came. In 1980, gross domestic product contracted by 2%. Hundreds of thousands of jobless workers were thrown on the dole. Yet as public sentiment and thinking within the Conservative Party, and even within her cabinet, Grew increasingly skeptical of her reforms, Thatcher maintained her steely resolve. Initially, she was not as consistent in private as in her public appearances, 
but gradually her political resolve began to win out. She backed the reform proposals of her Chancellor of the Exchequer, Geoffrey Howe, frustrating consensus politicians such as the Employment Minister, Jim Pryor. Despite intense public pressure to change course, she told the annual Conservative Party conference in October 1980, the ladies not for turning, echoing Hayek's thinking on the subject, but infusing it with a sharper cast, equal parts moral and patriotic. Thatcher saw inflation as a threat to the national interest. Inflation destroys nations and societies as surely as invading armies do, she told the conservatives. Inflation is the parent of unemployment. It is the unseen robber of those who have saved. Thatcher did not reverse her monetary policy even when the preliminary results were unpopular. Her perseverance was all the more remarkable given that, unlike in the United States, where interest rates are set by an independent central bank, in Thatcher's Britain responsibility for setting interest rates was ultimately vested in the Treasury, until 1997, therefore resting directly with the Prime Minister. By 1982, the British economy had returned to growth. But unemployment continued to increase well into 1984, the year Thatcher faced another domestic crisis that demanded all the political skill, foresight and sanfroi she could muster. In March 1984, Arthur Scargill, head of the National Union of Mine Workers, NUM, declared a strike against the National Coal Board, the statutory corporation tasked with managing Britain's state-run mines. Under Thatcher, the board had closed down the least productive coal pits. Although Scargill never called an endorsing vote of his union members, the strike would continue for a year. In its course, more than a thousand police officers were injured during violent confrontations with the striking miners, flying pickets, mobile protests designed to prevent non-striking miners from entering their workplaces. While public sympathy for the miners was widespread, so was public disapproval of both the violence resulting from the strike and Scargill's failure to call a vote before initiating it. Determined not to become trapped as Heath had been a decade earlier, Thatcher had initiated a policy of stockpiling coal that enabled her to hold her ground. As a result, Britain's electrical grid would not experience the blackouts endured during previous miners' strikes. As months passed, miners began to trickle back to work. At one point during the strike, I had breakfast with former Prime Minister Harold Macmillan, a traditional conservative and scion of a family-owned publishing house. Macmillan approved of Thatcher's courage during the miners' strike, he told me, adding that she had no other choice. Yet, I could never have brought myself to do it, he acknowledged, explaining that he, as a young officer in the First World War, remembered sending the miners, fathers and grandfathers over the top, in the trenches of France. He would not have had the heart to conduct the battle of human endurance Thatcher was now waging. In March 1985, after 26 million days of labor lost, the strike ended. In Samuel Taylor Coleridge's Statesman's Manual, a lay sermon, for those who make politics their vocation, the romantic poet observes that, it is no uncommon foible with those who are honored with the acquaintance of the great, to attribute national events to particular persons, rather than to the true proximate cause, the predominant state of public opinion. Yet, in Thatcher's case, more often than not, she was prepared to challenge public opinion in order to shape events and, in the end, bring public sentiment along with her. Thatcher's reforms changed Britain irrevocably. During her premiership, the Conservatives ended foreign exchange controls, eliminated fixed trading commissions and opened Britain's stock market to foreign traders in what became known as the Big Bang which, by the end of the 1980s, turned Britain into an international financial centre. Conservative policies also restrained public expenditure. 
though they did not succeed in reducing it outright. Taxes on income and investment came down, the consumption tax went up. British Telecom, British Airways, British Steel and British Gas were all privatized. The number of Britons owning equities nearly quadrupled. In defense of sovereignty, the Falklands conflict. Thatcher considered it her duty to defend British interests in the world, whether near or distant, and to protect Britain's capacity to maintain the Atlantic alliance. She was eloquent in expressing the British point of view on these subjects, relentless in pursuing opportunities for British business abroad, and unyielding in her defense of British subjects. In April 1982, her willingness to act on these beliefs was put to the test when Argentina invaded the Falkland Islands, a British territory since 1833. For sovereignty, that is, the ultimate authority within a defined territory, to retain its meaning, she had to act. As she later wrote, the Argentine attack involved a crisis of Britain's honor. But within the UN, whose founding documents had enshrined the Westphalian sovereign equality of states, Thatcher's defense of sovereignty was nonetheless contested. For many new members of the UN, who had achieved their independence by opposition to colonialism, Argentina's takeover of the Falklands appeared to be merely a long, overdue episode of decolonization. Thus, even many members of the Westphalian system were unlikely to support Thatcher's view of what was at issue, in some lightly inhabited islands in the South Atlantic. Furthermore, despite Ronald Reagan's high regard for Thatcher and the long-standing relationship with Britain, the American administration was ambivalent, and support among NATO was tepid too. By contrast, French President François Mitterrand saw the cogency of Thatcher's argument, assuring her, you should realize that others share your opposition to this kind of aggression. Thatcher's conduct during the Falklands crisis was depicted by critics as unyielding, deaf to any effort toward compromise and bloody-minded in its determination to enact her will. In fact, Thatcher's conduct during this conflict was built on her resolve to stand firm on principle, but it also reflected a shrewd understanding of when objective reality required a measure of diplomatic flexibility, especially in relations with Washington. The Falkland Islands lie some 300 miles off the Argentine mainland. Their strategic importance lay in their proximity to Cape Horn, the southern tip of the American continent and, along with the Strait of Magellan, a historic passageway between the Atlantic and the Pacific. In the 18th century, control over the islands was a subject of dispute among France, Britain, and Spain. The colony changed hands frequently, depending on the outcome of various European wars. During the early 1830s, the islands were governed from Buenos Aires, the capital of newly independent Argentina. Britain occupied them in January 1833, retaining continuous possession thereafter. By the early 1980s, therefore, the Falkland Islanders had been subjects of the British Crown according to international law for nearly 150 years, even as Argentina continued to assert its claim to sovereignty. General Leopoldo Galtieri, who in December 1981 became president of Argentina by military coup amid economic chaos and substantial violence, verging on civil war, resolved to increase his public support by summarily vindicating the country's long-standing claim to the Falklands. On April 2, 1982, Argentina invaded and quickly subdued the lightly defended islands. News of the invasion shocked the British government. I could not believe it, Thatcher later wrote, insisting, these were our people, our islands. But her instinct to act was met with little succor from her advisers. The Foreign Office saw no diplomatic route, and Defense Secretary John Knott advised that military action to retake the islands, 
some 7,000 miles away, was impossible. An ultimate function of leadership is to inspire associates beyond what they deem possible. Bringing to bear her distinctive inner confidence, Thatcher pushed her government onward. You'll have to take them back, she told Not. When he insisted it could not be done, she simply repeated, you'll have to. Thatcher's refusal to take no for an answer was vindicated when First Sea Lord Sir Henry Leach found a way forward. He advised her to assemble a naval task force capable of doing the job, albeit at substantial risk. Thatcher duly instructed him to undertake the necessary preparations. While this decision in no way bound her to a military solution, it preserved the possibility of one while Thatcher exhausted the diplomatic options that had been put forward by skeptical cabinet members and her American allies. Having established a strategy, Thatcher wasted no time in implementing it. She publicly laid down her principles and made a solemn vow to defend them. An emergency debate was convened in the House of Commons the day after the invasion, a Saturday. Thatcher explained her thinking in clear terms, for the first time for many years, British sovereign territory has been invaded by a foreign power. I must tell the House that the Falkland Islands and their dependencies remain British territory. In short, this was not a colonial issue, but a challenge to Britain's national self-respect and sovereignty. Defiantly, she concluded, no aggression and no invasion can alter that simple fact. It is the government's objective to see that the islands are freed from occupation and are returned to British administration, at the earliest possible moment. Thatcher had unequivocally conveyed her resolve by cutting off the possibility of her own retreat. Thatcher hoped that the reaction from Britain's most powerful and important ally, the United States, would be positive. Washington's position, however, proved rather more conflicted. Bolstered by the 1980 election of President Ronald Reagan, the Anglo-American relationship was in good standing by early 1982. Reagan and Thatcher first met in 1975, shortly after she became party leader and while he was preparing to campaign in the 1976 Republican presidential primaries. The meeting proved a great success. The two aspiring leaders, products of comparable ideological trajectories, found themselves in agreement on many policy issues. They also connected on a personal level. Please know you have an enthusiastic supporter out here in the colonies, Reagan wrote to her shortly afterward. Transatlantic ties grew stronger once Reagan was in office. In February 1981, Thatcher became the first European ally to visit Reagan's Washington, attending a glittering state dinner at the White House, and, in an unusual diplomatic honor, Thatcher proceeded to host a return dinner for Reagan at the British Embassy the following evening. Recalling that night in his diary, Reagan noted that it was truly a warm and beautiful occasion, adding, I believe a real friendship exists between the PM, her family and us, certainly we feel that way and I'm sure they do. Early in his term, Reagan proved supportive of Thatcher's economic reforms, and the two stood together in adopting a more assertive approach to East-West relations. Yet for all the rejuvenated warmth between Washington and London, the U.S. also maintained important ties with Argentina. Under Reagan, relations with the Argentine junta were upgraded, and Buenos Aires joined Washington in overt, and later covert, efforts to aid the anti-communist opposition forces, Contras against the Soviet-backed Sandinista regime in Nicaragua. Some U.S. leaders feared that any show of support for Britain in the Falklands conflict would compromise this joint venture with Argentina, and weaken America's standing with the underdeveloped Third World. 
This picture was further complicated by CIA warnings that if the Galtieri government suffered a military defeat, it was likely to be replaced by a highly nationalistic military regime which would establish military ties with the USSR. Facing these conflicting pressures, the U.S. administration pursued a divided and sometimes contradictory course. Under the direction of Caspar Weinberger, a committed conservative, the Pentagon provided Britain with a broad supply of badly needed military material from the beginning of the conflict. Much of this assistance took place covertly, not least because the State Department, led by Secretary of State Alexander Haig, opposed public U.S. support for Britain. Seeking to avoid a rupture with Argentina, Haig undertook a mediation effort. Though his sympathies lay with the British, Reagan acquiesced to Haig's shuttle diplomacy between London and Buenos Aires. When Haig briefed me about his plans, I privately voiced serious doubts despite my own history of conducting shuttle diplomacy in the Middle East. Then, the shuttles had been between capitals that were only a few hundred miles apart, in the South Atlantic crisis, the capitals were separated by nearly 7,000 miles. In the Middle East, not only could decisions be made overnight, enabling adjustment amid contingencies, but the principles on both sides were committed to making progress. By contrast, both Thatcher and the Junta had taken fixed positions in the Falklands crisis, precluding compromise. In all likelihood, Thatcher agreed to the mediation largely to satisfy American wishes and to give her fleet time to reach the waters off the Falklands. Whenever the mediation threatened to impair her view of British sovereignty, she would doubtless have rejected it. Thatcher expected the United States to take Britain's side without question. Haig's efforts, therefore, came as an unwelcome shock. Though she remained convinced of the virtue of her position that British sovereignty must be restored to the Falklands, she was now obliged to consider compromise measures. She agreed to listen to American proposals for a mediated outcome and not publicly insist that the solution had to be of a military nature. But, even as such diplomatic initiatives were pursued, the April 5 dispatch of the British Naval Task Force ensured that pressure on Argentina would build. Acutely conscious of American public opinion, not to mention the need to maintain broad support and the appearance of flexibility at home, Thatcher entertained various options along the lines of turning the Falklands into a UN trusteeship. At the end of April, shuttle diplomacy collapsed due to Argentine intransigence. As the likelihood of military conflict grew, pressure to find a negotiated solution intensified. On a visit to London in early May, I experienced the limits of Thatcher's diplomatic flexibility. Months before the Falklands crisis, I had been invited by Foreign Secretary Lord Carrington to deliver a speech marking the 200th anniversary of the founding of the British Foreign Office. By the set date, however, Carrington was no longer in office. The perceived failure of the Foreign Office to foresee or prevent the Falklands invasion had aroused great ire on the Conservative backbenches, reflecting a long-standing but by no means universally observed tradition. Carrington had chosen to accept responsibility for the government's failures by resigning, thereby shielding the Prime Minister and the Cabinet as a whole. Carrington, the quintessence of honor, was not personally at fault. Under his conception of duty, resignation was the only appropriate course of action. In fact, in the year leading up to the crisis, Carrington had resolutely opposed the British decision that, as it turned out, had invited Argentine aggression, the planned withdrawal of the icebreaking vessel HMS Endurance from the Falklands Theatre which had been proposed by Defense Secretary Knott as a cost-cutting measure that would save around $2.5 million a year. 
Carrington argued that Argentina would interpret this decision as a stage in a deliberate British policy of reducing support for the Falkland Islands. In a debate in the House of Commons over HMS Endurance on February 9, 1982, Thatcher unwisely expressed support for Knott's view rather than Carrington's. But the price of gutting deterrence in the South Atlantic proved steep, as the cost of the Falklands War ran to more than $7 billion in all. As historian Andrew Roberts writes of the decision, rarely has the truth been more starkly displayed that relatively high defense spending represents good value for money, because combat is always far more expensive than deterrence. With Carrington out, the Foreign Office Bicentennial proceeded under the stewardship of Francis Pym, the new Foreign Secretary. Having left office five years earlier, I was visiting in a private capacity, but official courtesies were nevertheless extended, a lunch with Pym and senior officials, followed by an afternoon tea with Thatcher. Over lunch, the discussion focused on the putative compromises that had emerged from the Hague Shuttle. There was neither consensus on details, nor a hint of any alternative course save some form of compromise. Over tea at 10 Downing Street, I asked Thatcher which of the new approaches she favored. I will have no compromise, she thundered, how can you, my old friend? How can you say these things? She was so irate I did not have the heart to explain that the idea was not mine but her chief diplomats. Her position, Thatcher explained, was a matter of principle and of strategy. Hence her disappointment that her closest ally had offered mediation in response to an unprovoked attack on British territory. In my speech that evening, titled, Reflections on a Partnership, I endorsed Thatcher's position on the Falklands crisis. The United States would be unwise to abandon a close ally, as it had over Suez in 1956. The strategic position or self-confidence of a close ally on a matter it considers a vital concern must not be undermined. It is a principle of no little contemporary relevance. In this sense the Falklands crisis in the end will strengthen Western cohesion. Still, as was occasionally the case with Thatcher, ideas she had resisted at the outset would later reach a point of apparent acceptance. This was no less true with respect to her position on the Falklands. She allowed her negotiating position to evolve inch by inch, even as Argentina foolishly showed little sign of responding in kind. By the time of what was described as the final British offer, transmitted via UN Secretary General Javier Pérez de Cuellar on May 17, Thatcher had agreed to allow UN administration of the islands in exchange for Argentine withdrawal. Falkland's sovereignty itself would be a matter for future negotiation. These concessions, made largely to maintain American support, had carried her a considerable distance from her initial insistence on restoring the status quo ante. Was her final proposal based on cold, rational analysis? Or was there a Machiavellian element in Thatcher's stance? Having witnessed Argentine intransigence throughout the negotiations, she may have concluded that chances were slim that Galtieri would accept her offer. The offer may also have been a fallback if the fleet by then approaching the Falklands were to suffer unacceptable losses. With such an uncertain outcome, and in pursuit of the high ground bestowed by a UN brokered solution, she assumed considerable risk. Had Buenos Aires accepted her proposal, she would have faced a Herculean struggle to persuade the House of Commons to accept such a settlement or to convince the UN to give up its administration to Britain after the dispute was resolved. Had this come to pass, I believe she would have drawn the negotiations onto a ground that would have enabled the British task force to achieve her initial objective, of restoring British sovereignty. Fortunately for her, however, the gamble paid off. On May 18, 
the Argentines rejected the British offer point blank. Three days later, British forces launched their assault. Once the fighting began, British victory was by no means assured. With extraordinarily long supply lines, and finite in theater resources, the British task force was quite vulnerable. Moreover, Argentina had acquired a number of Exocet missiles from France, which exacted a punishing toll on the British ships. Had either of the aircraft carriers HMS Hermes or HMS Invincible fallen prey, the British position would have become precarious. Thatcher was only too aware of these dangers and the potential human toll. While projecting a public image of unremitting toughness, in private she felt each loss keenly. Her authorized biographer records that following news of one Argentine attack, Dennis Thatcher found his wife sitting at the edge of their bed, weeping, Oh no, oh no. Another ship. All my young men. By war's end, she had sent 255 handwritten letters to the families of Britain's fallen servicemen. Thatcher's modus operandi as a wartime leader was to establish parameters and then leave the flag officers to manage the campaign, as they saw fit, while providing steadfast political support. One such parameter was the 200 nautical mile exclusion zone surrounding the Falklands declared on April 30 by the British government. Within it, any Argentine vessel could be attacked without prior warning. This rule was soon put to the test, and a decision was required. On May 1, the Argentine cruiser General Belgrano was sighted skirting the edge of the exclusion zone. The following day, Thatcher ordered the sinking of the Belgrano despite the fact that it had since sailed some 40 miles outside the zone. More than 300 Argentine sailors were killed. While her decision attracted much controversy, the Belgrano's position had represented a latent threat to the British task force approaching the Falklands. By the end of May 21, the first day of land combat, 5,000 British troops had landed on the islands. From that point onward, Thatcher's position hardened regardless of the increasing international pressure for a ceasefire. With British blood now spilled on land as well as at sea, she reverted to her basic position and refused to countenance anything short of full restoration of sovereignty. This stance was unwelcome in Washington where the administration was under growing pressure from Latin American allies to end the fighting. For a moment, the demands of British sovereignty seemed to have overstepped the bounds of U.S. national interests. On May 31, with British forces advancing on the island's capital of Port Stanley, President Reagan was persuaded to call Thatcher and appeal for magnanimity. She stood her ground, I'm not handing over the islands now, she told Reagan. I didn't lose some of my finest ships and some of my finest lives to leave quietly under a ceasefire without the Argentines withdrawing. As the rhetorical barrage continued, Reagan chose not to contest the substance of the argument. The U.S. made no further effort to slow the British advance. In another indication of the underlying strength of the U.S., UK relationship. It was later revealed by former U.S. Secretary of the Navy John Lehman that Reagan had even agreed that, in the event of the loss of a carrier of the Royal Navy, the U.S. would lend the USS Iwo Jima, an amphibious assault ship, or helicopter carrier, which could accommodate Britain's vertical takeoff Sea Harrier fighters. Give Maggie everything she needs to get on with it, Reagan told Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger. After heavy fighting, the Argentine occupying forces surrendered on June 14. Britain's victory was complete and held an incalculable symbolic value. Taken in tandem with the decisive economic reforms Thatcher had instituted at home, the Falklands victory effectively transformed Britain's standing on the world stage. As she herself put it, 
we have ceased to be a nation in retreat. We have instead a newfound confidence, born in the economic battles at home and tested and found true 8,000 miles away. We rejoice that Britain has rekindled that spirit which has fired her for generations past and which today has begun to burn, as brightly as before. In the United States, the reaction was more ambivalent. Reagan's acquiescence to Thatcher's policy damaged relations with Argentina, which abruptly ended its cooperation with Washington. But for other countries, the broader picture was more favorable. By demonstrating credibility on the battlefield, Thatcher had also strengthened the West's hand in the Cold War. Her policy made a crucial distinction between colonial issues and strategic challenges and clearly placed the Falklands in the latter category. Negotiations over Hong Kong Shortly after the Falklands War, Thatcher was obliged to confront a challenge arising out of Britain's explicitly colonial past, the future of Hong Kong. Although the island of Hong Kong proper had been established as British territory since 1842, the new territories surrounding it were governed by Britain only as part of a 99-year lease from China, which was due to expire in 1997. Rejecting Britain's historical claims regarding these arrangements, Beijing insisted that both territories revert to Chinese control by 1997, two years before the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, would celebrate the 50th anniversary of its victory over the nationalist forces of Chiang Kai-shek. China viewed British governance in Hong Kong and the new territories as a historical aberration. The British position relied on three agreements, the Treaty of Nanjing, 1842, by which China ceded Hong Kong Island in perpetuity, the Convention of Kowloon, 1860, by which China similarly ceded a neighboring peninsula, and the Convention for the Extension of Hong Kong Territory, 1898, by which the new territories were leased for 99 years. As such, Thatcher believed that Britain's claims were well-founded. According to international law. From China's perspective, however, these treaties had been signed under duress, rendering Britain's claims no more legitimate than if London had taken the islands by force. I was familiar with Chinese thinking on the matter, having heard it expressed in conversations with Zhou Enlai. China's chief diplomat and titular head of government under Mao Zedong from 1949 to 1975, and more extensively in speaking with Deng Xiaoping, China's paramount leader from 1978 to 1989. During these discussions, which dealt mainly with U.S.-China relations, Hong Kong was broached only tangentially. Deng explained that China would be patient in negotiations but would not compromise on the issue of sovereignty, which it identified with the inviolability of Chinese territory. It might, however, agree to a degree of autonomy for Hong Kong if doing so would facilitate reunification with Taiwan. By 1982, with the 1997 deadline for the new territory's lease on the horizon, China publicly communicated its intention to expand negotiations so as to include the island of Hong Kong itself. Thatcher, flush with success in the Falklands, had adopted an entrenched position against any surrender of British sovereignty, especially regarding Hong Kong proper. Thatcher was also resolutely opposed to relegating British citizens to rule by the Communist Party. Given her belief that any communist system, Chinese, Soviet or other, subverted individual freedom, she felt that Beijing could not be relied upon to uphold the rights of Hong Kong citizens. On one occasion, she complained to me of the great cruelty of which Deng Xiaoping was capable, during another meeting in Hong Kong, held on a private plane to avoid eavesdropping. She left me with no doubt regarding her negative view of the Chinese leadership as a whole. But Thatcher's political choices were limited. Unlike the Falklands, 
there was no possibility of a military solution against the People's Liberation Army. Hong Kong was indefensible. A solution would have to be found through negotiation, lurking in the background, however, was the fact that, should the two parties reach a stalemate, China had the power to settle the question unilaterally. Thatcher's tactic was to hold flexibility in reserve. In early conversations, she avoided discussing sovereignty, instead seeking a Chinese pledge that Britain would continue to administer Hong Kong. This arrangement, she argued, was the only way to retain the confidence of international business, which was vital to Hong Kong's prosperity at the time and would continue to be essential after 1997. In September 1982, Thatcher carried these sentiments with her to Beijing. But in strained meetings with Deng and Prime Minister, and later General Secretary of the Communist Party, Zhao Ziyang, she received a lesson in Chinese realities. Both publicly and privately, she was informed not only that the issue of sovereignty was non-negotiable, but also that continued British administration was out of the question. Beijing would permit Hong Kong's capitalist system to endure, but only under Chinese auspices. As one British official later noted, for the Chinese, if it came to the crunch, sovereignty took priority over prosperity. There were few straws here at which Thatcher might grasp. Leaving her meeting with Deng, she stumbled down the steps of the Great Hall of the People. Chinese superstition held this to be a bad omen. Within 10 days, the Hong Kong stock market had fallen by around 25%. Thatcher's initial response was to dig in deeper, as I witnessed during a working dinner at 10 Downing Street that November. The meeting's purpose was to seek my views on how the British might best play our hand in our negotiations with the Chinese on the future of Hong Kong. As I recall it, however, the substance of the discussion was rather different. Although British officials must have previously informed Thatcher of their view that sovereignty over Hong Kong would have to be ceded, she certainly did not show an awareness of it. Initially, she rejected the cession of sovereignty out of hand, adamantly asserting that she would never give up Hong Kong. Her every instinct militated against surrendering the island, with its unique British-Chinese way of life. Her first modification of that position was that Britain would negotiate only over the new territories, where, in contrast to its freehold over Hong Kong, Britain maintained only a leasehold whose deadline was approaching. Our dinner companions on this occasion included Foreign Secretary Pym, Foreign Office Permanent Undersecretary Sir Anthony Ackland and Governor of Hong Kong Sir Edward Yud. The diplomats took on Thatcher's arguments. I admired their studied persistence as wave after wave of prime ministerial vehemence broke across the dinner table. Neither the Foreign Office contingent nor Yud flinched. While I did not participate in the internal British debate, I did reply to Thatcher's question regarding possible autonomy. Reflecting my discussions with Deng, I noted that China might have an interest in preserving some autonomy for Hong Kong, in order to establish the credibility of the one country, two systems principle for the future of Taiwan. But Deng would not, in my opinion, yield on the principle of sovereignty. Much of the evening had gone by before, gradually, a few glimpses of prime ministerial retreat could be made out. By the end of the meal, Thatcher had very reluctantly conceded that the whole package would be up for discussion, that is to say, that the future of Hong Kong Island and Kowloon could be negotiated together with that of the new territories. I recall this dinner as a distillation of Thatcher's evolution during the Hong Kong negotiations. As with the Falklands crisis, she sought to avoid concessions of any kind, yet ultimately agreed to explore them. This time, the difference was that her concessions were not just tactical maneuvers against a ham-fisted enemy.
and in Hong Kong no British fleet could save the day. In March 1983, Thatcher made her decision. She wrote privately to Zhao that she was prepared to recommend to the British Parliament that sovereignty over the entirety of Hong Kong revert to China, if an agreement could be reached between Britain and China on future administrative arrangements to ensure Hong Kong's prosperity and stability. This correspondence cleared the way for formal talks that would require successive, hard-fought concessions including British acceptance of the Chinese condition that the British administrative link to Hong Kong be entirely severed, in 1997. In her memoirs, Thatcher recalled a conversation with Deng Xiaoping that reveals the tense nature of their negotiations. He said that the Chinese could walk in and take Hong Kong back later today if they wanted to. I retorted that they could indeed do so, I could not stop them but this would bring about Hong Kong's collapse. The world would then see what followed a change from British to Chinese rule. For the first time, he seemed taken aback. In December 1984, Thatcher and Zhao signed the Sino-British Declaration under the terms of which the transfer of sovereignty would occur on June 30, 1997. The treaty dealt not only with the fixed conditions of sovereignty but, uniquely, with a 50-year process through which the territory would transform itself from a British possession into a theoretically autonomous component of the Chinese state. With the completion of the handover, the agreement stipulated, China's sovereignty over Hong Kong would coexist with the contingent and subjective condition of autonomy for a 50 year period. Yet in any clash between the two, Chinese sovereignty was bound to prevail. The functional success of the 50-year Hong Kong Agreement thus depended on the perception that all parties were pursuing its terms, but the perceptions of the two parties differed even as the agreement was drafted, and their differences only congealed with the passage of time. Whether at the end of the 50-year autonomy period the ultimate transition would be smooth depended on whether Chinese evolution to that point was reconcilable with the British legacy. China for its part was unlikely to accept the final return of Hong Kong with political institutions that it considered vestiges of colonialism. The interim preservation of Hong Kong's institutions ensured some level of democratic participation for its residents, and restored confidence in its financial center, the foundation of the territory's wealth. Although the agreement was certainly not what Thatcher wanted, she had judged the situation reasonably. A harder line would have risked consigning the British to irrelevance. A more accommodating approach would likely have undermined all Hong Kong's hope for autonomy. For the British negotiators, Thatcher's reputation for intransigence was a considerable asset. Experienced negotiators cannot but welcome to their side an apparently unreasonable third party with whom any deal must pass muster. Thatcher played this role skillfully allowing her negotiators to reassure their Chinese counterparts of their own desire to agree on particular points, while citing their terror of running afoul of a formidable prime minister, whose convictions on the subject were well known. Thatcher's method, public intransigence to strengthen the hand of her negotiators, paired with private dialogue to ensure the two sides' common interest in a prosperous Hong Kong maintained a measure of British influence over a tenuous situation. Her stance also showed that, even in disputes where Britain held the far weaker hand, there was a point beyond which it could not be pushed. In the final years of British administration, after she had left office, she returned to Hong Kong often and strongly supported Chris Patton, the last British governor of Hong Kong in his efforts to embed more representative institutions and processes in the colony before it was handed over. Diplomatic agreements are often completed with assurances of their longevity. The evolution of Hong Kong's autonomy did not fulfill British expectations. 
Thatcher and her chief negotiators were deeply committed to preserving British-type institutions and concepts of legal process, and they pursued them with skill and Thatcherian determination. They achieved a definition of autonomy that lasted for 22 of its stipulated 50 years. The arrangement on autonomy ended because the Chinese domestic evolution diverged increasingly from the expectations that had predominated. When the concept of one country, two systems was formulated by Deng. And in any handover of colonial territory, the recipient country is more focused on its own trajectory than on a legacy from the colonizers. In this conflict between sovereignty and autonomy, the latter has been severely curtailed. The uncertainties that now loom over Hong Kong's future recall Thatcher's warning to Deng where freedom is threatened, can economic dynamism long endure? Other questions inexorably follow. When agreements are prematurely abrogated, can strategic trust remain? Will the evolution of Hong Kong further strain tensions between China and the Western democracies? Or will a way be found by which Hong Kong can have a place in a dialogue over world order and political coexistence? confronting a legacy of violence, Northern Ireland. No affair of state touched Margaret Thatcher more directly than the conflict in Northern Ireland, the six counties that remained part of the United Kingdom after Ireland was partitioned in 1921. Paradoxically, however, no major issue during her premiership provoked as much self-doubt. Thatcher refused to submit to the intimidation tactics of the Irish Republican Army, IRA, frustrating its demand that Northern Ireland be absorbed into the Republic of Ireland, which consisted of the 26 southern counties. Through summit diplomacy, she mended relations between Britain and the Republic of Ireland to a great degree. In 1985, she secured the landmark Anglo-Irish Agreement, aimed at working toward an end to the Troubles, the violent, decades-long conflict between Northern Ireland's mainly Protestant Unionists and the mainly Catholic Nationalists. Thatcher's actions were even more striking considering that, only weeks before she became Prime Minister in May 1979, Airy Neve, the man who would have been her Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, was assassinated by an IRA splinter group. The murder of this close personal friend and hero of the Second World War reaffirmed Thatcher's basic instincts concerning how to approach Northern Ireland, reinforcing security while pressing the Irish Republic to combat terrorism. She understood that terrorists were following a strategic logic. Reflecting on the situation later, she defined her understanding of their approach as the calculated use of violence and the threat of it to achieve political ends, specifying, in the case of the IRA those ends are the coercion of the majority of the people of Northern Ireland, who have demonstrated their wish to remain within the United Kingdom, into an all-Ireland state. In Northern Ireland as elsewhere, terrorism was the method of the weak. The IRA's supporters were a minority of a minority, seeking by use of spectacular violence to provoke the British government into either granting concessions, or lashing out in a brutal overreaction that would drive the Catholic minority in Northern Ireland, further into the nationalist camp. Neve's killing failed to shake Thatcher, whose sympathies remained firmly with Northern Ireland's Protestant and Unionist majority a view reinforced by her lingering grudge against the Republic of Ireland for its neutrality during the Second World War. On August 27, 1979, the IRA subjected the new Prime Minister to two additional tests, first by killing 18 British soldiers in an ambush outside the northern Irish town of Warren Point, and then by assassinating Lord Mountbatten, the Queen's cousin and former Chief of the Defence Staff. The victims of the latter attack included not only Mountbatten, but also his 14-year-old grandson, his 15-year-old boatman and the dowager Lady Brabourne. 
though she mourned the dead, Thatcher refused to be provoked. Instead, she authorized her government to continue its regular meetings with the Irish government in pursuit of a peaceful outcome. A year later, the IRA would throw another wrench into these ongoing negotiations. On October 27, 1980, IRA inmates in Northern Ireland's Mays Prison launched a hunger strike. Protests of one form or another had been ongoing since 1976, when the Labour government had stripped these prisoners of the special category status that Heath had granted them two years earlier. Perhaps the prisoners now hoped that Thatcher would follow the example of her conservative predecessor, but she immediately grasped what was at stake, acceding to the inmates' demand to be treated as political prisoners would legitimate their cause and complicate effective control of the prison. When the UK's Foreign Intelligence Service, MI6, quietly reactivated its secret link with the IRA in early December 1980, it learned that some IRA leaders favoured an end to the strike. This information was passed to Thatcher. While she was not willing to speak with the IRA directly, she said that if the hunger strike ended, she was prepared to extend humanitarian concessions, such as the freedom to associate on weekends and wear civilian-type clothing during the workday, to all prisoners in Northern Ireland, whether IRA or not. On December 18, the prisoners called off their strike, and Thatcher's government duly announced the new measures. No prisoners had died as a result of the strike, and Thatcher's reputation for steadiness under pressure emerged enhanced. But the calm was not to last. On March 1, 1981, Bobby Sands, the 26-year-old leader of the Mesa's IRA prisoners, announced another hunger strike reiterating their demand that IRA inmates be treated as political prisoners. Thatcher was unimpressed. There is no such thing as political murder, political bombing, or political violence, Thatcher said in a speech in Belfast on March 5, insisting, there is only criminal murder, criminal bombing, and criminal violence. We will not compromise on this there will be no political status. The battle lines were drawn. Then, in a stroke of extraordinary luck for the IRA, a parliamentary seat opened up in a heavily nationalist constituency in Northern Ireland. Sands declared his candidacy and, from his prison cell, became the first candidate affiliated with the Nationalist Party Sinn Féin to win a seat in the UK Parliament since 1955. When the second hunger strike culminated in his death on May 5, riots broke out across Northern Ireland, and pressure mounted on Thatcher's government. Tens of thousands attended Sands' funeral in Belfast. The hunger strike by other prisoners continued throughout the summer. Despite additional pressure from the Catholic Church and U.S. House Speaker Tip O'Neill, Thatcher maintained her position, which enjoyed broad support from the British public. Pressed about Sands' fate during question time in the House of Commons, she replied, acidly, Mr. Sands was a convicted criminal. He chose to take his own life. It was a choice that his organization did not allow to many of its victims. In total, ten prisoners died before those remaining gave up on October 3. With great steeliness, Thatcher had sacrificed compassion to duty. Ireland, a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council from 1981 to 1982, had damaged relations with the United Kingdom by stridently criticizing the Falklands War at the UN. Nevertheless, Thatcher authorized the senior civil service to pursue confidence-building negotiations. Ireland's Dermot Nally and Britain's Robert Armstrong, the cabinet secretaries of their respective countries, led the steering committee of the Anglo-Irish Intergovernmental Council, which had been set up by Thatcher and her Irish counterpart in 1981. 
Nally and Armstrong's doggedness and dedication helped carry the relationship through its rough patches. Little was achieved at first, but after the June 1983 elections widened the conservative majority in Parliament, Thatcher and the Irish Tawasich, Prime Minister, Garrett Fitzgerald, communicated regularly, allowing them to overcome challenges such as the escape of 38 prisoners from the maze in September, and the IRA's bombing of Harrods Central London Department Store in December, which killed six people, including three police officers, and injured 90 others. When another IRA-planted bomb ripped through Brighton's Grand Hotel in the early morning hours of October 12, 1984, Thatcher was awake in her suite, having just finished editing her address for the next day's Conservative Party conference. Unhurt but caked in dust, she changed into a navy suit and by 4 a.m. was speaking to the cameras. The conference will go on, as usual, she informed the nation. Her presence at the lectern the following afternoon was proof of the attack's failure. It was an attempt not only to disrupt and terminate our conference, it was an attempt to cripple Her Majesty's democratically elected government. That is the scale of the outrage in which we have all shared, and the fact that we are gathered here now, shocked, but composed and determined is a sign not only that this attack has failed but that all attempts to destroy democracy by terrorism will fail. Proceeding to thank the first responders who had raced to the scene, Thatcher expressed her sympathy for those who were suffering and then, in typically no-nonsense style, announced that her speech would cover business as usual, one or two matters of foreign affairs as well as two economic topics selected for special consideration unemployment and the miners' strike. Immediately after her address, she visited the bombing victims who had been hospitalized. Today we were unlucky, the IRA said in its statement claiming responsibility for the attack, but remember, we have only to be lucky once. You will have to be lucky always. Five people were killed in the attack, including one MP, and 30 were injured some very seriously. Had the bombers possessed more accurate intelligence about her location, the Prime Minister would likely have been among them. Thatcher refused to permit the IRA's attempt on her life to jeopardize negotiations with the Republic of Ireland. After a brief pause, the summits resumed. By July 25, 1985, the British cabinet had approved a draft of the Anglo-Irish Agreement. The basic formula was for Britain to permit a formal consultative role for Ireland in the affairs of Northern Ireland, in exchange for Dublin's agreement to temper its ambition to reclaim the province, which had been codified in Articles 2 and 3 of the 1937 Irish Constitution. In signing the agreement, Fitzgerald and Thatcher were acknowledging reality. Ireland formally agreed that any change in the status of Northern Ireland would only come about with the consent of a majority of the people of Northern Ireland, noting that at present this same majority favoured remaining in the United Kingdom. Britain agreed that, due to the province's significant Catholic minority, the Irish Republic would be given an opportunity to exert a significant influence in Northern Ireland. The agreement's importance lay in its directing Ireland's influence into legitimate channels, such as the new intergovernmental conference, without undermining British sovereignty. The House of Commons approved the agreement by a vote of 473 to 47 demonstrating British support as overwhelming as the Northern Irish Unionists' rejection of it. Thatcher and Fitzgerald officially signed the document at Hillsborough Castle in Northern Ireland on November 15, 1985. Over the following months, the Protestant majority counties of Ulster erupted in demonstrations, reserving the choicest venom for Thatcher. Northern Irish Unionists in the British Parliament collectively resigned their seats in protest. Meanwhile, 
Dublin's supporters in Washington cheered the British concession of a formal consultative role for the Republic of Ireland in Northern Irish affairs. It was not for nothing that Thatcher later confided to Fitzgerald, you've got the glory, and I've got the problems. Although the agreement permanently lifted Anglo-Irish relations into a friendlier stratum, it failed to curtail the IRA's violence, which intensified during the late 1980s and continued unabated into the early 1990s. Reflecting on Ireland in her memoirs, Thatcher characterized her approach as disappointing. Our concessions alienated the Unionists. Without gaining the level of security cooperation we had a right to expect, she wrote in 1993, concluding, In the light of this experience it is surely time to consider an alternative approach. Peace was not finally achieved in the province until the Good Friday Agreement of 1998. This successor accord to Thatcher's Anglo-Irish Agreement was much more ambitious, yet it stoked less Unionist rancor with three of the four important Unionist parties agreeing to it. The agreement established a devolved legislature and power-sharing executive in Northern Ireland, guaranteeing that both nationalists and Unionists would be represented in the regional government. And, in accordance with its side of the agreement, the Republic of Ireland removed the territorial claim to Northern Ireland from its constitution. Thatcher's Irish legacy is rife with ironies. She never developed her own distinct vision for Northern Ireland, allowing the negotiations to be led by Robert Armstrong, the cabinet secretary, to whom she delegated the task, yet the Anglo-Irish agreement was a major diplomatic achievement. The agreement would not have been possible had she not kept Unionist leaders in the dark about the substance of the negotiations, which, had they known, would likely have led to a Protestant workers' strike and paralyzed the province. In the end, the peace she sought came by way of direct talks among Northern Ireland's factions, negotiations for which Thatcher's labors had helped establish the necessary conditions. Thus, the regret she later expressed over the policy her government carried out across the Irish Sea seems unwarranted. Her vision approached the limits of the possible in a region so deeply divided along religious lines, and so indelibly stamped by a bitter legacy of violence. Despite seemingly insurmountable challenges, she laid the foundations for a generation of relative peace in Northern Ireland. Fundamental Truths, The, Special Relationship, and the Cold War In Thatcher's time, East-West relations were debated largely in terms of absolutes. For realists, the Cold War would end by convincing Soviet leaders that their efforts to divide and defeat the NATO alliance were futile. Idealists, for their part, insisted that the issue was ideological. Communism would be defeated when its philosophy was proven intellectually bankrupt and politically fruitless. Thatcher had a major influence on the outcome of the Cold War by synthesizing the realists and idealists' competing truths. She insisted on the overriding importance of national defense, an independent nuclear deterrent and allied cohesion, principles from which she never deviated but her thought evolved to include a conviction that peace could best be preserved and Western values vindicated by exploring coexistence with the USSR. She was never tempted by prospects of appeasement, the child of a generation that had drawn lessons from Munich. She sought to combine strong defense with constructive negotiations. Further, she understood the importance of public diplomacy. Receiving an enthusiastic popular welcome on official visits to Eastern Bloc countries such as Hungary and Poland. The management of East West relations, the central foreign policy challenge of Thatcher's age, required a broader approach than was needed with respect to the Falklands or Hong Kong, where her leadership was primarily aimed at protecting British concerns. In her early days as Conservative leader, 
Her governing premise was that the Soviets posed a growing threat to the West. In early 1976, three years before she became prime minister, she castigated the Soviets in a manner that raised eyebrows. The Russians are bent on world dominance, she insisted, and they are. Rapidly acquiring the means to become the most powerful imperial nation the world has seen. Instead of seeking a relaxation of tensions, she argued, Moscow was engaged in a military build-up, expanding its influence around the globe in a manner that threatens our whole way of life. She continued by warning that the Soviets' advance is not irreversible, providing that we take the necessary measures now. In this rousing call to arms, Thatcher was laying out a personal manifesto for the Cold War. She included a searing judgment of Soviet leadership. The men in the Soviet Politburo don't have to worry about the ebb and flow of public opinion. They put guns before butter, while we put just about everything before guns. They know that they are a superpower in only one sense, the military sense. They are a failure in human and economic terms. Red Star, the newspaper of the Soviet Ministry of Defense, responded by calling Thatcher an Iron Lady. The nickname, intended as an unflattering comparison with Bismarck, backfired, indeed, the history of propaganda offers few own goals as spectacular and long-lasting. Thatcher seized on the intended slur as a badge of honor, and the phrase became a defining sobriquet. Three years before she was elected prime minister, the Soviet Union had inadvertently elevated a previously obscure opposition leader into a figure of global significance. Thatcher's opposition to the Soviet Union derived not only from Britain's fear of Soviet aggression, it was more deeply rooted in a pronounced moral objection to state control and the negation of human dignity that were inherent in the communist system. In her youth, she had been profoundly affected by the imposition of the Iron Curtain. The formation of satellite states orbiting the Soviet sun had reinforced her view of East. West relations as a defining struggle between tyranny and liberty. The doctrine publicly outlined in 1968 by Soviet Communist Party leader Leonid Brezhnev, asserted a Soviet right to defend. Embattled Communist parties anywhere, and especially the totalitarian rulers of Eastern Europe, against their own people. As Thatcher was wont to remind her audiences, Brezhnev had described his position with brutal honesty, maintaining that the total triumph of socialism all over the world is inevitable. Thatcher never hesitated to contrast this overweening ambition with the record of the West. We do not aim at domination, at hegemony, in any part of the world. Of course, we are ready to fight the battle of ideas with all the vigor at our command but we do not try to impose our system on others. Thatcher understood that rhetoric alone would not end the Cold War or keep the West united. East-West relations would need to be reshaped, a task inconceivable without the support and leadership of the United States. This was perhaps chief among the many reasons for her fundamental commitment to reinvigorating transatlantic ties, the heart of her foreign policy. In September 1975, shortly after she became party leader, Thatcher visited the United States. On American soil, she stressed the shared ideals, particularly the exercise of individual freedom, that underpinned her vision of the relationship between the two countries. In a speech at Washington's National Press Club, she sought to shake off the pessimism that threatened to paralyze the free world rallying spirits with a message based on both morality and efficacy. My real reason for believing in the future of Britain and America is because freedom under the law, the essence of our constitutions, is something that both honors human dignity and at the same time provides the economic opportunity to bring greater prosperity to our people, a personal prosperity based on individual choice. 
In short, it works incomparably better than other systems. The principal other system to which she referred was, of course, communism. Her thinking about the Cold War thus combined an understanding of the primacy of American power with a strong conviction that Britain, which had provided ballast to the occasionally fluctuating character of American foreign policy for more than 40 years, could still play a vital international role. Britain's international posture had long been defined by both a clear-eyed assessment of human nature in the raw and a high estimation of its own contributions to history. In the British political tradition, the concept of balance of power was treated as axiomatic. The British leaders of the 19th and early 20th centuries, the high point of British influence, recognized the importance of maintaining alliances in at least part of the European continent, as well as bases in other parts of the world. They did not hesitate to intervene where they felt it was necessary to vindicate their multipolar conception of international order. This, together with Britain's preponderant naval power, had engendered in its citizens a global perspective and in its politicians an ethos of permanent engagement abroad. In contrast, the American perspective until the end of the Second World War had been to view foreign policy achievements as disconnected, practical as solutions, without prescriptive value for the future. From this faith there developed an avoidance of permanent responsibilities and vacillation in external commitments. On assuming office, Thatcher was determined to reassert the earlier theme of partnership, best exemplified by Anglo. American solidarity in the Second World War. She was prepared to support American diplomatic efforts in the Cold War, but she also insisted that the British government provide input on the direction of U.S. policy. To this end, she supported President Carter's response to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in December 1979. But it was during the Reagan presidency that a true partnership developed and flourished. Reagan's approach to the Soviets was the essence of simplicity, we win, they lose. Thatcher's view was more nuanced, but she nonetheless admired the assertiveness. Energy and optimism Reagan brought to the struggle. Above all, she shared his commitment to democratic values. She encouraged him as best she could, while Reagan, for his part, understood the value of advice from a trusted and ideologically compatible outsider. Communist doctrines continued to dominate Soviet policy, with the invasion of Afghanistan in December 1979 serving as a reminder of ongoing adventurism. Thatcher remained focused on the importance of a strong national defense and bolstering NATO's cohesion. She supported Reagan's efforts to strengthen the alliance's credibility. In 1982, Thatcher persuaded Reagan to supply Britain with the new Trident II submarine-launched ballistic missile on favorable financial terms, hoping to guarantee the future of Britain's independent nuclear deterrent. With the same convictions she helped guide NATO's response to the Soviet deployment of intermediate-range SS-20 missiles aimed at Europe and the consequent debate within the alliance over accepting U.S. Pershing and cruise missiles as a counterforce. By November 14, 1983, American intermediate-range cruise missiles were arriving in Britain. Such weapons would also be sent to West Germany later that month. Thatcher's advocacy for an effective counterforce to the Soviet missile deployment had borne fruit. Although the anti-nuclear movement had suffered a tactical defeat, it found an improbable sympathizer in Reagan, the president, who once described nuclear weapons as totally irrational, totally inhumane, and good for nothing but killing, harbored an unshakable distaste for them. His greatest obligation as president, he believed, was to bring about a world free of nuclear weapons. In March 1983, to the astonishment of the world, Reagan announced the Strategic Defense Initiative, 
SDI, a plan to develop a defensive shield of space-based weapons capable of intercepting and disabling incoming Soviet intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs. In Reagan's words, SDI would help the world begin to achieve our ultimate goal of eliminating the threat posed by strategic nuclear missiles. Thatcher harbored doubts about whether the SDI system was technologically feasible or could achieve the grand potential Reagan had assigned to it. She feared Reagan's plan was getting beyond a reasonable scope and directed her efforts to what she viewed as the more practical task of assuring Europe's defense. Further, she feared that even an imperfect SDI system might undermine the rationale for Britain's independent nuclear deterrent. Navigating between Reagan's personal commitment and her own doubts, Thatcher opted, not for the first time, for constructive ambiguity. In public, she took pains to praise SDI, although she kept her focus firmly confined to the research component, which she supported as a matter of principle. She viewed the actual deployment of SDI, a more controversial matter, to be relegated to the distant future, and a subject for eventual negotiation within the alliance and with the Soviet Union. In candid exchanges with Reagan at Camp David in December 1984, she made clear her concerns. Although Reagan had no intention of retreating from his fundamental view, he offered one crucial concession. In a press statement at the conclusion of their meeting, Thatcher announced Reagan's concurrence that SDI-related testing and deployment would, in view of treaty obligations, have to be a matter for negotiation. The Pentagon bitterly opposed this promise, which went beyond anything to which the administration had previously agreed. But this measure not only offered a degree of reassurance to anxious NATO members, it also demonstrated the enduring closeness of the U.S.-U.K. relationship. More than any other European leader, Thatcher saw it as her task to interpret between allies on both sides of the Atlantic. At the same time, she continued to back increased defense spending at home. Thatcher's attitude toward SDI reflected the ambivalence of the European allies combined with special British circumstances. All NATO allies relied on the American nuclear guarantee while fearing a nuclear war that might devastate their territories. They were uneasy about any new weapons system that might limit American readiness to fulfill its guarantee or affect the nuclear equation. Thatcher's special concern derived from her commitment to protecting Britain's independent nuclear deterrent. The development of nuclear weapons in the United States had occurred with the cooperation of the British science community during the Second World War. Britain therefore had a moral claim to American assistance in its determination to develop nuclear weapons of its own, or to acquire nuclear weapons from America. In September 1944, Roosevelt and Churchill had made a secret agreement at Hyde Park, New York, to continue cooperation on nuclear affairs after the war. After some turbulence in the relationship in the immediate post-war period, in 1958 the two countries concluded the U.S.-U.K. Mutual Defense Agreement, which remains the gold standard for nuclear weapons cooperation among states. The U.S. agreed to supply nuclear weapons to the Royal Air Force until the British nuclear deterrent was of sufficient size, cooperate with Britain on nuclear submarine technology and allow transfers of enriched uranium and plutonium. The treaty remains in place. The British commitment to a nuclear role was constant in every cabinet of both parties. It gave Britain a capacity to resist nuclear blackmail, as happened when the Soviet Union implied a nuclear threat during the Suez Crisis in 1956. It also gave Britain the capacity to negotiate competently in arms control discussions. On the American side, the attitude was not always uniformly shared, 
due to U.S. concerns about nuclear proliferation. Nonetheless, a minority of U.S. believed that a British nuclear capability was in the American long-term interest, because it bolstered a partner on the other side of the Atlantic that had a historical record of shared objectives. It also increased Soviet difficulty in attempting to read, or anticipate, NATO's reaction in a potential crisis. A Problem in Grenada Thatcher's desire for close Anglo-American relations did not override defending British interests even against Reagan, despite her high regard for him. A dramatic example came in October 1983 following the U.S. invasion of the Caribbean island of Grenada. After a hardline Marxist faction seized power on the island, which was a member of the British Commonwealth, the Reagan administration sought to reverse the coup through military intervention. As early soundings suggested that the British would oppose such a course, the White House chose to exclude Thatcher from its deliberations. She was told of American plans only hours before they were executed. Grenada had shed its status as a British colony after choosing independence in February 1974. Because it remained within the Commonwealth, however, the Queen continued as its head of state, and the British government still felt a sense of responsibility for its sovereignty. A more searing objection was the humiliation Thatcher felt on discovering that her closest ally had acted against a Commonwealth nation, without meaningful consultation. Worse, the invasion occurred mere days before U.S. intermediate-range nuclear missiles were due to be deployed in Britain. If the U.S. could not be trusted to consult Britain prior to the invasion of a small Caribbean island, how could it be relied upon to confer regarding the use of missiles on British soil? Rejecting a charm-laden apology from Reagan, she made the disagreement public, we in the Western countries, the Western democracies, use our force to defend our way of life. Not, to walk into other people's countries, she told the BBC, pulling no punches as she explained, if you are pronouncing a new law that wherever communism reigns, there the United States shall enter, then we are going to have really terrible wars in the world. Thatcher's comments prompted a note from U.S. National Security Advisor, Robert Budd McFarlane, to the British cabinet secretary deploring her statement as unusually harsh and stressing the administration's profound disappointment at her stance. Meanwhile, events in Grenada moved apace. Within four days of the October 25th invasion, the Americans had deposed Grenada's ruling military junta. By December, the U.S. had withdrawn from the island altogether. The pre-revolutionary constitution had been restored, and democratic elections were on the horizon. Having reminded the U.S. administration not to take Britain for granted, Thatcher chose not to allow the Grenada upset to linger. The deployment of intermediate-range missiles on British soil proceeded. A strategic shift, east-west engagement. In December 1983, for days before Christmas, Thatcher invited me to dinner at 10 Downing Street. Although we did not dwell on recent events in the Caribbean, I found her dispirited by the state of East-West relations. Moscow seemed rudderless, she said, observing that she could scarcely recall. A situation where there was at once so much uncertainty and so little contact. That September, the Soviets had shot down a South Korean civilian airliner, KAL Flight 007, that had inadvertently strayed into their airspace. Moscow's callous response to the tragedy heightened tensions and convinced the West that there was little to be gained from dialogue, with Soviet General Secretary Yuri Andropov, whose health was known to be failing. In November, as U.S. intermediate-range missiles began arriving on European soil, the Soviets had walked out of the Geneva arms control negotiations. Soviet isolation had become as complete as Soviet intransigence. 
Responding to Thatcher's disquiet that night at dinner, I asked whether she intended to urge a new East-West dialogue, and if so, how best to initiate it. As it turned out, her mind was already moving in that direction. In the dying days of the Brezhnev era, when the Soviet gerontocracy was at its most rigid, Thatcher had consciously eschewed engagement. Only after her second electoral victory in June 1983 did she begin a formal reassessment of East-West relations and start to move toward it. Over the weekend of September 8, Thatcher hosted a seminar of Soviet scholars at Chequers, the Prime Minister's official country residence. The meeting's stated purpose was ambitious, to consider the government's strategy in international affairs with a view to establishing clear aims for the next few years. The Foreign Office initially attempted to staff the retreat with experienced hands from its own ranks, but Thatcher would have none of it. As she wrote in response to the proposed list of attendees, I want some people who have really studied Russia, the Russian mind and who have some experience of living there. More than half the people on the list know less than I do. In the end, eight Soviet specialists, all but one of them university professors, were invited. One attendee, Archie Brown, a lecturer on Soviet institutions at Oxford, suggested that Thatcher make contact with a promising leader in the younger echelon of Soviet leadership such as Mikhail Gorbachev, whom he described as the best educated member of the Politburo and probably the most open-minded. Thatcher was receptive to this proposal, the official record of the seminar noted, it was agreed that the aim should be to build up contacts slowly over the next few years. When Thatcher visited Reagan in Washington later in September, she shared her thinking. While we should not e deceive ourselves about the true Soviet character, she told the president, at the same time we must live on the same planet with the Soviets. Therefore the key question is what will be our future relations. She favored establishing normal relations. Reagan replied that he shared her views. Like Thatcher, Reagan had come into office determined to confront the Soviets. But unlike many of his supporters, and some of his staffers, his aversion to nuclear weapons made him favorably disposed to arms control negotiations. As early as March 1981, shortly after surviving an assassination attempt, Reagan had written to Brezhnev from the hospital to suggest opening a dialogue. George Shultz, who became Secretary of State in July 1982, encouraged such a connection. The following February, at Shultz's urging, and in the face of vehement opposition from his National Security Advisor and Secretary of Defense, Reagan agreed to meet with Soviet Ambassador Anatoly Dobrynin. Some of the NSC, National Security Council, staff are too hardline and don't think any approach should be made to the Soviets," Reagan wrote in his diary that April. I think I'm hardline and will never appease, Reagan continued, but I do want to try and let them see there is a better world if they'll show by deed they want to get along with the free world. Thatcher, who fully agreed with this sentiment, sought to cultivate it within the Reagan administration. A more constructive relationship with the Soviet Union, however, required a willing partner in Moscow. Andropov's death in February 1984 propelled Konstantin Chernenko to the leadership, but the 72-year-old operatchik, who suffered from emphysema and a heart condition, gave Thatcher little reason to hope for an immediate improvement in relations. Thatcher's crucial insight was to set aside Chernenko and his generation and look instead to the ranks of their likely successors. At her direction, the British Foreign Office developed a shortlist consisting of three younger members of the Politburo, Grigory Romanov, Viktor Grishin, and Mikhail Gorbachev. Inviting Gorbachev, to whom she had already been alerted, 
made the most sense given his position as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee of the Soviet legislature. With Chernenko still head of state, diplomatic protocol had to be observed. Thatcher arranged for Gorbachev to be invited to Britain as head of a visiting Soviet parliamentary delegation, a suitably innocuous overture that would allow her to meet him and take his measure. Accepting, Gorbachev arrived in Britain with his wife, Riesa, in December 1984. Over lunch at Chequers, he and Thatcher entered into a robust argument over the relative benefits of capitalist versus communist systems. The record of their private conversation recounts that Thatcher did not wish to have the power to direct everyone where he or she should work and what he or she should receive. Gorbachev replied that he understood the British system, but the Soviet system was superior. He discussion continued in this vein, with neither participant giving ground. As their meeting drew to a close, no new initiatives or agreements had emerged. Notwithstanding the apparent impasse, however, this lunch would prove to be one of the most consequential meetings of Thatcher's premiership. As she later wrote, Thatcher recognized that, while Gorbachev's remarks parroted familiar Marxist dogma, his personality could not have been more different from the wooden ventriloquism of the average Soviet operatic. Later in the day, Thatcher came to understand that it was the style far more than the Marxist rhetoric which expressed the substance of the personality beneath. She sensed that Gorbachev was inherently more flexible than his predecessors. And, as usual, she did not hesitate to make her views known. I am cautiously optimistic, she told the BBC the next day, adding, in a remark which became famous, I like Mr. Gorbachev. We can do business together. But at a Camp David visit with Reagan that December, she adopted a cautious tone. Yes, Gorbachev was charming and open to discussion and debate, White House records of the meeting recount, but Thatcher also mused. The more charming the adversary, the more dangerous. Yet this concern did not detract from her central conclusion. As Reagan later put it, she told me that she believed that there was a chance for a great opening. Of course, she was proven exactly right. After Gorbachev became general secretary following Chernenko's death in March 1985, Support grew for Thatcher's positive evaluation of the new Soviet leader, as did pressure on Reagan to participate in an early summit with him. Hardliners in the Reagan administration argued strongly against this course, insisting that unremitting pressure would eventually cause the Soviet system to crash. They argued that through dialogue much allied cohesion could be lost. Taking up the other side of the argument, Schultz sought to reinforce Reagan's instinctive desire to meet with the new Soviet leader. My own view, as expressed to Thatcher, was that Reagan's efforts to build U.S. strength and gain Soviet respect during his first term had put him in a strong negotiating position in his second. By the early summer, Reagan had made up his mind, announcing plans for a summit with Gorbachev in Geneva that November. It proved to be a turning point. In the best tradition of the special relationship, Margaret Thatcher served as a trusted partner and counselor, providing the administration with independent and well-informed judgment. Reagan based much of his negotiating approach at Geneva on an unsolicited and unusually detailed letter from Thatcher, dated September 12, 1985 in which she provided advice on how to engage with Gorbachev. In effect mediating between Reagan and Gorbachev at this time, Thatcher was at the height of her international influence. Thatcher's enthusiasm for dialogue with Gorbachev grew during the later 1980s as he embarked upon an extensive program of domestic reform. For the European left, Gorbachev's talk of reform and openness, Glasnost and Perestroika, 
sufficed to undercut the Thatcherite premise of a continuing Soviet threat. The anti-nuclear movement found new grist for the cause of complete disarmament. Such talk was anathema to Thatcher, who never tired of reiterating to her European colleagues the virtues of combining diplomatic flexibility with the need for a strong defense and awareness of a continuing Soviet threat. Against this backdrop, a serious crisis in transatlantic relations erupted. In October 1986, Reagan and Gorbachev met in Reykjavik, Iceland, where they decided to pursue the American president's vision for a nuclear-free world. What had been billed as an informal meeting to prepare for a fully-fledged summit in Washington evolved into exchanges, of a magnitude rarely choreographed, much less improvised, on the international stage. Gorbachev had come to Reykjavik prepared to agree to dramatic cuts in the Soviet nuclear arsenal, hoping to persuade Reagan not only to follow suit but also to abandon the Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI. Behind closed doors, the two leaders discussed ever greater cuts, reaching a crescendo with Reagan's suggestion that they agree to phase out nuclear weapons altogether. We can do that confirmed Gorbachev. We can eliminate them. The dialogue reached the point of preparing the draft of a memorandum of understanding to that effect. The talks eventually foundered over the issue of SDI. Gorbachev insisted that SDI be confined to the laboratory for 10 years. Reagan, convinced that SDI was needed as a hedge even in a non-nuclear world and that testing it in outer space was essential, refused. The American president ended the stalemate by abruptly walking out of the meeting, thereby scuttling the provisional agreement to abolish all nuclear weapons, which had already been drafted. A decade or so later, I asked Anatoly Dobrynin, who was foreign policy advisor to Gorbachev at the time of Reykjavik, why the Soviet negotiators had not accepted the main feature, freezing and then mutually and radically reducing the number of weapons. The issue of testing in outer space could have been relegated to a follow-up, technical conference in, say, Geneva. Because we had nobody in the room who knew much about nuclear strategy, he replied and because it never occurred to us that Reagan would walk out of the room. Thatcher was profoundly unsettled. In urging Reagan to do business with Gorbachev, she had not thought it possible that such engagement might lead to a complete appending of existing U.S. and British defense policy. Meeting with her two months after Reykjavik, I found her greatly disturbed by the course of events. The summit had been an earthquake that would jeopardize all the good work done by the Reagan administration to improve relations between the U.S. and its European allies, she said. By attempting to undermine the long-standing NATO agreement over the role of nuclear weapons, Reagan had come close to delegitimizing a pillar of the transatlantic alliance. Thatcher conceived her challenge now to help bring the president to a position on more solid ground. She was, she told me, determined to set aside Reykjavik. Her initial approach was to cocoon her message in the warmest of praise. Calling Reagan at the White House the day after the summit, she opened disingenuously by telling him he had done wonderfully at Reykjavik. The summit, she judged looked like a Soviet setup, and it was essential to put the blame for stalemate on Gorbachev. Then she went on the offensive, warning Reagan that to advocate the elimination of nuclear weapons altogether would be tantamount to surrender, so we must be very, very careful. Her pleas left Reagan unmoved. When Thatcher reiterated her concern that if nuclear weapons were eliminated, the Soviets with their conventional superiority, could just sweep across Europe, Reagan replied that he was sure we could develop a strategy to defeat the Soviets, implying that he believed the task could be achieved by conventional military means. 
none of this was what Thatcher wanted to hear. She realized that on an issue as deeply embedded in Reagan's mind as the abolition of nuclear weapons, he simply would not retreat, at least not directly. So she changed tactics. Her new vehicle of persuasion was a previously arranged visit to Camp David in November 1986, a month after Reykjavik. At the prompting of her longtime aide Charles Powell, she had decided to avoid asking Reagan to reject anything he had agreed to at Reykjavik. Instead, her goal was to pick out the elements of Reykjavik which we could accept and argue that they should receive priority, she told me at the time. By implication, everything else should be left aside, although not explicitly abandoned. To her great relief, she found Reagan receptive. The two agreed that priority would be given to an intermediate-range nuclear forces INF, agreement that would also include a 50% cut in strategic offensive weapons alongside a ban on chemical weapons. No mention was made of the more sweeping elements of the Reykjavik package, which now slipped out of the realm of active consideration. This approach was not without costs. In supporting the INF agreement, Thatcher appeared to be offering her blessing to Reagan's ultimate aim of eliminating nuclear weapons from Europe altogether, far from her preferred outcome. Nonetheless, as she explained the decision to me, in order to preserve nuclear deterrence, to prevent the U.S. from negotiating away its strategic nuclear weapons and ensure we would receive Trident missiles, we accepted the lesser evil of a zero INF agreement. Thatcher knew when to hold fast to a deeply held belief and when to accept a new reality, and, in her words, put the best face on it. The joint statement produced by the end of her Camp David visit also reaffirmed NATO's reliance on effective nuclear deterrence, and Reagan's continuing support for Britain's Trident system. As far as public posture regarding nuclear deterrence was concerned, this statement represented, in effect, a rhetorical return to pre-Reykjavik norms. As I told Thatcher at the time, she was the only person outside the United States to whom the president listened. It remained important that she continue to offer him her advice, sympathetically, but by no means always agreeing. Thatcher's arguments also benefited from the administration's weakening in the wake of the Iran-Contra scandal, as officials were exposed for having used the proceeds from unauthorized American weapon sales to Iran to fund the Contra insurgency against the Marxist-Leninist Sandinista regime in Nicaragua. As Reagan's friend and staunch supporter, Thatcher saw that her role was to help him find a way forward. She also did the West a great service by reaffirming the fundamentals of NATO's defensive doctrine. But the Reykjavik episode, in addition to illustrating the intimacy of Anglo-American relations, also revealed their limits. On issues where the imbalance of forces between the Allies was a major factor, and presidential convictions especially strong, the ties of emotion and history could fray and America might insist on pursuing its preferences unilaterally. Defending Kuwaiti Sovereignty, the Gulf Crisis Under Thatcher's leadership, the British voice was heard not only on matters pertaining to NATO and the Cold War, but also on disputes around the globe. When Saddam Hussein's Iraq invaded and occupied the neighboring country of Kuwait in August 1990, it was not immediately obvious that Britain would have a special role to play. Britain's operational capability had declined markedly since an analogous episode in 1961, when ABD al Karim Qasim, the army brigadier who had risen to power after overthrowing the Iraqi monarchy, appeared to threaten newly independent Kuwait's territorial integrity. At that time, the UK had successfully deployed troops and ships to deter Qasim, fulfilling its agreement to guarantee its former colony's defense. In Thatcher's mind, 
Saddam Hussein was a reckless dictator in the mold of General Galtieri, as with the Argentine leader. Appeasing Hussein would only embolden him. Should his aggression go unchallenged, the integrity of the international system would be severely strained. She took a dim view of historical episodes in which Britain had elected to appease aggressors. Reflecting on the 1938 Munich Agreement that helped precipitate the Second World War, she commented, British foreign policy is at its worst when it is giving away other people's territory, as in the Sudetenland and Czechoslovakia. From the beginning of the conflict in Kuwait, as on the Falklands, Thatcher determined that the only honorable course was to restore the status quo ante. The moral clarity she brought to bear ultimately had a significant impact on the American administration's decision-making. During the crisis, President George H. W. Bush's first reaction to the crisis was cautious. Speaking to the press from the White House the morning of August 2, Bush appeared guarded, stating that he was not contemplating dispatching troops to the region, but then again, that he would not discuss any military options even if we'd agreed upon them. Immediately following Bush's remarks, the National Security Council convened to discuss the matter. Opinions drifted toward accepting the invasion as a fait accompli. It was serendipitous that, well before the crisis broke, Thatcher had accepted an invitation to appear alongside President Bush at a conference in Aspen, Colorado, on the afternoon of August 2. The time they spent together in Aspen would prove enormously consequential, for the Middle East, the U.S., U.K. relationship and the principles of world order. Thatcher's relationship with Bush was not as warm as the one she had developed with Reagan, but Bush understood its value. Charles Powell, who accompanied Thatcher to Aspen, noted that the two leaders were in very close agreement on Kuwait, although Thatcher appeared to be more impressed than Bush with the urgency of marshalling a military response. At a joint press conference with Thatcher that afternoon, Bush spoke first. His brow furrowed, voice measured and hands buried deep in his suit pockets, the American president exuded caution. He recounted that he had been on the phone with Middle Eastern leaders, expressed his concern over Iraqi aggression and called for a peaceful solution. After thanking Bush for welcoming her to Colorado, Thatcher lost no time in getting to the main question, just as she had in her maiden speech to Parliament 30 years earlier. Iraq has violated and taken over the territory of a country which is a full member of the United Nations. That is totally unacceptable. And if it were allowed to endure, then there would be many other small countries that could never feel safe. Although Thatcher chose these words carefully, it was not so much the substance of her remarks as her method of delivering them that made an immediate impression. She spoke in staccato bursts, with great emphasis and total conviction. She was simply in her element as a leader. By the time Bush returned to the White House on August 5, his view had hardened significantly. I view very seriously our determination to reverse this aggression, he said, declaring, this will not stand. Speaking with Charles Powell a week later, I attributed much of the president's shift in tone to Thatcher's presence. The White House party had gone out to Aspen leaning toward the view that there was nothing much to be done, but had returned braced and determined. With the benefit of hindsight, I believe Bush was evolving toward a more muscular response before he arrived in Aspen, but his discussions there with Thatcher strongly reinforced his instincts. Later that month, she offered Bush similar encouragement following the passage of a UN resolution that permitted the use of force to interdict oil tankers, seeking to breach the sanctions against Iraq. This was no time to go wobbly, she insisted. The firm tone that Thatcher helped to set during the early days of the conflict was an important factor in the eventual liberation of Kuwait. 
while Thatcher was quick to defend Kuwaiti sovereignty. She was reluctant to grant the United Nations a major role in the country's liberation. She did welcome UN Security Council Resolution 660, passed the day after Kuwait was invaded, which condemned Iraqi aggression and demanded an immediate withdrawal. However, she viewed the prospect of greater UN involvement with pronounced skepticism. When it became clear that an Iraqi withdrawal would not be achieved through purely diplomatic means, she resisted efforts to seek an additional Security Council resolution that would authorize the use of force. If any military action was treated as requiring a Security Council mandate, she argued, a precedent would be set that would undermine the right of self-defense inherent in the principle of national sovereignty. As a practical matter, she also wanted to preserve maximum freedom of action over the manner of Kuwait's liberation. On this point, she initially had President Bush's support, she does not want to go back to the UN on use of force, nor do I, Bush wrote in his diary in early September. In the end, however, her intentions fell victim to the domestic situation in the United States. Bush understood the resistance in Congress and among the public to taking military action without UN backing. Thatcher did not face equivalent constraints in the United Kingdom and so, in private, she proceeded to argue intensely against an additional UN resolution. But the internal needs of US politics prevailed. In early November 1990, she conceded the argument. For entirely unrelated reasons, however, she would be forced from office mere weeks later. The Limits to Leadership, Germany and the Future of Europe Great statesmen operate at the outer limits of what is commonly thought possible. Rather than parroting whatever orthodoxy defines the times, they probe its boundaries. Throughout her career, Thatcher had challenged the dictates of conventional wisdom providing leadership that shifted the terms of debate. On occasion, however, her belief in her ability to achieve the seemingly impossible turned out to be misplaced. Following the fall of the Berlin Wall on November 9, 1989, Thatcher deviated from the prudence and flexibility that generally served her well. Instead of leading the West toward a policy of German unification and anchoring a united Germany within NATO, she found herself increasingly at odds with her Atlantic peers. For Thatcher, the fall of the Berlin Wall was indeed cause for celebration. Similarly, the subsequent collapse of communist regimes throughout Eastern Europe represented a culmination of the dismantling of the Soviet satellite orbit what she had been working to achieve throughout her time in office. But she was left deeply troubled by the logical corollary to the Iron Curtain's demise, namely, that East and West Germany, artificially divided since the Second World War, should now unify. Thatcher's concerns about German reunification had a legitimate basis. In 1871, the last time the newly unified Germany had entered the international system, Benjamin Disraeli had deemed it a greater political event than the French Revolution. The British statesman was proven prescient by a series of crises that erupted following Bismarck's 1890 retirement, culminating in the outbreak of the First World War in August 1914. A united Germany would once again inevitably alter the balance of power in Europe, and Thatcher was not alone in believing that the implications of such a change required careful consideration. Seared by her experiences as a child of the Second World War, Thatcher doubted that the assertive and expansionist conduct of Germany had come to an end with Hitler's defeat. She distrusted what she perceived as an immutable German national character, in her pessimistic moments, she feared that not all the demons of Germany's past had been exorcised. To understand a man, Napoleon is said to have observed, look at the world when he was twenty. 
Thatcher had turned 20 in 1945. She was not shy about giving expression to these skeptical sentiments. At a dinner we both attended in Toronto on the sidelines of the June 1988 G7 summit, I quoted Bismarck in a toast to her, suggesting that the best a statesman could do was to grasp the hem of God's cloak and walk with him a few steps. Thatcher, who had only been half listening, asked whose cloak I had proposed latching on to. When the host explained that I was quoting Bismarck, she asked, Bismarck, the German? To the host's response in the affirmative, she replied, time to go home. As momentum built for prompt unification, Thatcher remained resolutely opposed. While other leaders hesitated to air their doubts, she assumed a contrarian posture. Rather than contemplating unification, she argued that attention should focus on establishing genuine democracy in East Germany, insisting that two democratic German states could continue to exist side by side indefinitely. And attempting to underscore her concern that a united Germany might once again aspire to dominate Europe, she added another argument, German unification could derail Mikhail Gorbachev's historic experiment in reform, emboldening hardline factions in Moscow, which might oust him from office. These arguments found little favor even among Thatcher's allies. The Bush administration considered reunification the natural outgrowth of Western victory in the Cold War. Just days before the Berlin Wall fell, Bush left no doubt as to his position. I don't share the concern that some European countries have about a reunified Germany, he told the New York Times, because I think Germany's commitment to and recognition of the importance of the alliance is unshakable. European leaders such as French President François Mitterrand, who had initially shared her hesitation, began to tiptoe toward accepting reunification while still seeking to shape the conditions under which it would take place. When I met with Thatcher in London on January 10, I urged just such a course. She proved unpersuadable. The record of our meeting illustrates her fixed position. The Prime Minister said that one should not regard anything in international relations as inevitable. Her starting point was to establish what would serve British interests and then try to make it happen. These were laudable sentiments, but in January 1990 they were no substitute for a policy firmly tethered to the emerging reality in Europe. Her leadership, which was so often marked by creative agility and a firm grasp of realities, now displayed elements of rigidity. Without the pragmatic impulse that had served her so well in earlier crises, Thatcher was left with a policy that amounted to little more than ineffectual opposition. Her proposal to leave behind some Soviet forces to stabilize East Germany after reunification was a non-starter. The Germans, with U.S. backing and French acquiescence, moved ahead. Thatcher was left sidelined and diminished. German unification was further enmeshed in the broader project of European integration. The prevailing view on the continent was that a united Germany would be best managed by binding it closely to the European community. Chancellor Helmut Kohl espoused this view and was prepared to bring German sacrifices to the enterprise, his foreign minister, Hans, Dietrich Genscher, echoed the novelist Thomas Mann's appeal to, create not a German Europe but a European Germany. Thatcher fundamentally disagreed with this strategy. Germany's large population and economic potential would guarantee it a substantial if not dominant weight in any integrated European structure. She understood that de facto German power could not be neutered by legalistic or institutional means. Yet she felt strongly that folding Germany into Europe would entrench German power rather than contain it. In the end, she was proven partly right, as Germany's economic progress has allowed it greater influence within the EU than any other member state. 
but on the fundamental question of German character and politics, she was wrong. Germany was transformed by Adenauer and his legacy and has remained an integral member of the Western Alliance since unification in October 1990. Europe, the endless difficulty. It was not simply German reunification, but the entire agenda of European integration, that was at odds with Thatcher's worldview. As a defender of parliamentary sovereignty, she regarded the transfer of powers from nation-states to European supranational institutions staffed by unelected bureaucrats as an abrogation of democratic and sovereign rights. Thatcher's strategy had been to encourage economic liberalization in Europe without advancing political integration. Attempting to maintain this balance became her ultimate foreign policy dilemma. In 1984, after years of painstaking negotiations, she had won a major political victory over Brussels, granting Britain an annual rebate that reduced Britain's contribution to the European budget by two-thirds. In 1986, she had embraced the single European Act in pursuit of a single market, indeed it had been principally drafted by the British. She failed, however, to foresee that the Act would be used to extend qualified majority voting in European councils thus accelerating the shift of power away from national capitals. As she later acknowledged in her memoirs, It is now possible to see the period of my second term as Prime Minister as that in which the European community subtly, but surely shifted its direction away from being a community of open trade, light regulation, and freely cooperating sovereign nation-states towards statism and centralism. The stage had been set for a conflict, both between London and Brussels and within the Conservative Party, that would last for more than a generation. How to manage Britain's relationship with Europe is a perennial question and, for the leader of the Conservative Party, a perilous one. From Margaret Thatcher in November 1990 to Theresa May in July 2019, for conservative premierships foundered on the shoals of the European relationship. The first sign of Thatcher's struggle to manage her party's divides over Europe came with the resignation of Defence Minister Michael Heseltine in January 1986. The controversy was nominally about Westland, Britain's sole remaining helicopter manufacturer but essentially about Heseltine's ambition to replace Thatcher as Prime Minister. The American company Sikorsky had expressed interest in becoming a minority shareholder in Westland, hoping to turn around the unprofitable British manufacturer by infusing it with capital, an option that appealed to Thatcher's free market as well as her Atlanticist convictions. But Heseltine favored a statist and European solution. Under the Heseltine plan, the struggling British company would join a consortium with British, French, German and Italian defence companies. A fracas ensued in which Downing Street sought to discredit Heseltine, touching off a brief period of turbulence that appeared to threaten Thatcher's grip on the Conservative Party. In the end, Heseltine resigned and Sikorsky bailed out Westland. Charismatic Wealthy and fiercely ambitious, Heseltine positioned himself as a pro-European successor to Thatcher. His unsubtle insurgency would smolder on the backbenches for years, before suddenly bursting into a conflagration in November 1990. By then, plenty of tinder had accumulated. Conservative political giants rose and fell in relation to their stances on Europe. The United Kingdom had joined the European Economic Community, EEC, under Heath in 1973. But in 1979 Britain declined to enter the nascent European Rate Mechanism, ERM, a loose precursor to the euro currency that would require participating countries to keep their foreign exchange rates within a certain range of the value of the European Currency Unit, ECU 
which was itself determined by weighting member countries' currencies according to the size of their economies. The knockdown, drag out fights over the EEC, the ERM, and the ECU had divided the British cabinet and steadily undermined Thatcher's leadership. She rejected the possibility of Britons joining the ERM in 1985, but by early 1987 Chancellor of the Exchequer Nigel Lawson had found a workaround, without Thatcher's approval. He made sure that the pound sterling would shadow the West German Deutschmark at a specified rate. By November 1987, however, Thatcher became aware of the tacit agreement and cancelled the policy by early 1988. Amid this context of increasingly ambitious schemes for European integration, as well as an incurably divided Conservative Party, Thatcher accepted an invitation to deliver an address on the continent's future at the College of Europe in Bruges, Belgium. Aware that her audience of aspiring Eurocrats was not a natural constituency for her Eurosceptic message, she leavened the speeches opening with a joke. If you believe some of the things said and written about my views on Europe, she said, flashing a broad smile, it must seem rather like inviting Genghis Khan to speak on the virtues of peaceful coexistence. Like Genghis Khan, however, Thatcher had come to conquer. The joke would be the extent of her gentility. Rather than offering an encomium to the idea of Europe, Thatcher set out to prescribe its limits. In this way, the Bruges speech can be read as a declaration of independence from her cabinet critics. In Thatcher's view, the European community was supposed to pursue five guiding principles, rely on willing and active cooperation among independent sovereign states, tackle present problems in a practical way, encourage enterprise, not be protectionist, and maintain a sure defense through NATO. By practical, Thatcher meant a streamlined, politically accountable, pro-market European bureaucracy that would regulate with a light touch and focus on immediate problems rather than grand schemes. In line with this, her vision of Europe was based on retaining distinct nation-states. To try to suppress nationhood and concentrate power at the center would be highly damaging and would jeopardize the objectives we seek to achieve. Europe will be stronger precisely because it has France as France, Spain as Spain, Britain as Britain, each with its own customs, traditions, and identity. It would be folly to try to fit them into some sort of identical European personality. It was a passage Charles de Gaulle would have endorsed word for word. Thatcher's skepticism of centralization, so prominent in the Bruges speech, had grown out of her study of Hayek before she became prime minister. By the time she spoke in Bruges, she had the experience of implementing reforms in Britain such as privatizing industry and public housing, initiatives that succeeded in large part because they returned the state's power to private enterprise. In her view, the European project's promoters were ignoring the major economic lessons of the age. She took direct aim at them in her speech, observing. Indeed, it is ironic that just when those countries such as the Soviet Union, which have tried to run everything from the center, are learning that success depends on dispersing power and decisions away from the center. There are some in the community who seem to want to move in the opposite direction. We have not successfully rolled back the frontiers of the state in Britain, only to see them reimposed at a European level with a European superstate exercising a new dominance from Brussels. This statement was crafted to shock, and it achieved its desired effect. It represented a direct rebuff to a speech given three months prior by European Commission President Jacques Delors, in which the French socialist had suggested that, within ten years, national legislatures would delegate as much as 80% of their economic decision-making to the European Parliament. Thatcher could hardly have been more incensed. 
The Bruges speech also offered a sage yet less frequently recalled meditation on the meaning of European civilization, and Britain's place in it. It touched on two of her great convictions, her sympathy for those struggling for freedom in Eastern Europe and her deep admiration for the United States. The European community was one manifestation of European identity, she observed, but not the only one. Moving from detached analysis to passionate exhortation, she continued. We must never forget that east of the Iron Curtain, people who once enjoyed a full share of European culture, freedom, and identity have been cut off from their roots. We shall always look on Warsaw, Prague, and Budapest as great European cities. Nor should we forget that European values have helped to make the United States of America into the valiant defender of freedom, which she has become. Thatcher's words were prophetic. Warsaw, Prague, Budapest and East Berlin were soon welcomed back to Europe, and the continent's prosperity, then and now, has depended on the security supplied by the United States itself a great extension of European civilization. This is why Thatcher's Bruges speech would eventually win a place in the British oratorical canon, not only for its pivotal place in her own biography but for its prescience and clear articulation of the enduring tensions between British identity and European integration. The Fall The immediate effect of the Bruges speech, however, was to drive Thatcher and her cabinet colleagues further apart. This was a matter of no small moment, suggesting a hardening of differences on economic policy no less ominous than similar episodes over foreign and defense policy. As noted earlier, the British system elevates members of the cabinet to the highest echelons of their party, meaning that authority moves in both directions between the prime minister and the cabinet. An element of personal goodwill between the two is therefore crucial to the operation of effective government. In June 1989, hours before Thatcher was to speak at a European Community Summit in Madrid, Chancellor of the Exchequer Nigel Lawson and Foreign Secretary Geoffrey Howe paid her a Sunday morning visit at No. 10. Here was a spectacle rare in British government the two most powerful ministers in Thatcher's government threatening to resign if the prime minister refused to propose a deadline for formally joining the ERM, thus giving up her country's independent monetary policy. Thatcher carefully recorded their demands and expressed willingness to amend her stance on the subject, but refused to accede to a public deadline. Shortly after returning from Madrid, she demoted Howe to leader of the House of Commons while softening the blow by giving him the nebulous title of Deputy Prime Minister. Thatcher was more merciful to Lawson, allowing him to remain in his post. However, he soon resigned over exchange rate policy, as well as her refusal to dismiss her chief economic adviser Alan Walters, whose public views Lawson claimed were undermining his authority. By October 1990, however, Thatcher had been forced by the newly minted Chancellor of the Exchequer, John Major, to acquiesce in Britain's joining the ERM. In an October 30 speech to the House of Commons, she defended this move while, totally and utterly, rejecting economic and monetary union, which she saw as the back door to a federal Europe. Furious at her cabinet and bent on forestalling additional challenges to her policies, she appeared to take her rhetorical cues from God's words of caution to Job, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no farther. Setting up Jacques Delors as her foil, Thatcher recounted that, he wanted the European Parliament to be the democratic body of the community, he wanted the Commission to be the executive, and he wanted the Council of Ministers to be the Senate. Her response was straightforward, no, no, no. No, 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 quietly but emphatically uttered, would become another immortal Thatcher phrase, but not before it helped to topple her government, which was already bleeding support due to her espousal of the unpopular, 
community charge, a local government poll tax. Two days later, Jeffrey Howe resigned his cabinet post over matters of substance as well as of style, as he would explain in a November 13 address to the House of Commons. Thatcher's policy on economic and monetary union, he argued in his resignation speech, increasingly risks leading herself and others astray. Howe's oration was a masterpiece, peppered with backhanded compliments. After saluting Thatcher's courage and leadership before a spellbound house, he then aimed squarely at her approach by invoking Harold Macmillan's belief that Britain had to place and keep ourselves within the EC. He saw it as essential then, as it is today, not to cut ourselves off from the realities of power, not to retreat into a ghetto of sentimentality about our past and so diminish our own control over our own destiny in the future. Growing more heated, how characterized Thatcher's rhetoric on Europe as e tragic and disturbing. Then he modulated to a more in sorrow than in anger tone. The tragedy is, and it is for me personally, for my party, for our whole people and for my right honorable friend herself, a very real tragedy, that the Prime Minister's perceived attitude toward Europe is running increasingly serious risks for the future of our nation. It risks minimizing our influence and maximizing our chances of being once again shut out. We have paid heavily in the past for late starts and squandered opportunities in Europe. We dare not let that happen again. If we detach ourselves completely, as a party or a nation, from the middle ground of Europe, the effects will be incalculable and very hard ever to correct. Howe's conclusion made clear that he saw no constructive future for the nation under Thatcher's leadership. Alluding to a conflict between his loyalty to his friend the Prime Minister and allegiance to what I perceive to be the true interests of the nation, he concluded that it was no longer possible to continue serving in government. Claiming to have wrestled at length with this decision, how urged others in the party to consider their own responses and follow his lead in doing what is right for my party and my country. This appeal for others in the Conservative Party to reconsider their loyalty to Thatcher's government implicitly blessed her overthrow. Michael Heseltine declared his leadership challenge the following morning. The timing was highly inconvenient for Thatcher. She was due to visit Northern Ireland on November 16 and then travel to Paris for a three-day conference, scheduled for November 19 to 21, of the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe, CSCE, a period which now would be the final days of the new Conservative Party leadership campaign. Despite the challenge, Thatcher opted to honor her travel commitments. Observing this, to an outsider, surprising leadership contest from afar, I was taken aback by Thatcher's decision. Perhaps overstepping previous bounds, which had always confined my judgments to foreign policy, I called Charles Powell, by now a close friend, and asked why she seemed to be absenteeing herself from the field at the height of battle. It was true that the conference represented a post-Cold War moment of great promise. Bush and Gorbachev were set to meet with their European counterparts and chart the future of the continent. But, for Thatcher, Surely a more prudent course would be to stay in Britain and argue her case with waver in supporters. My suggestion did not find favor, Thatcher believed her duty lay on the world stage. Eschewing the conference to conduct a Conservative Party dispute would, in her mind, have signaled a dangerous lack of confidence. Suffused as it was with character, her decision proved disastrous. Thatcher left the management of her campaign to what may only be described as a posse of half-dedicated inadequates. On the evening of November 20, AIDS brought her news at the British Embassy in Paris of the vote on the first ballot, 
not quite as good as we had hoped and not quite good enough. She had won 204 votes to Heseltine's 152, with 16 abstentions. Under arcane Conservative Party rules, however, she had come up short of the supermajority required. Had two of Heseltine's supporters backed her instead, she would have won. A second ballot would now be required. Putting on a brave face before the cameras, she told reporters that she would indeed contest this ballot. The adverse events that built over the following 48 hours have an air of Shakespearean tragedy. Stores of goodwill that had accumulated in her cabinet over the years were running low, the same conviction, fighting spirit and charm that previously had won her allies were now coupled with a stubbornness that cost her friends and supporters. As Heseltine basked in media attention, some of Thatcher's loyalists began to quiver and defect. The cabinet murmured about drafting a Stop Heseltine candidate, either John Major or Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd. All night and into the next day, Thatcher witnessed fortune's tide receding. She interviewed cabinet members one by one, who all told her that, though of course he personally supported her, regrettably she could not prevail in another vote. By midnight on November 21, having run aground, she decided to resign. At 9 a.m. the following morning, she formally announced the decision to her cabinet. As I said to Powell at the time, her resignation felt worse than a death in the family. To most American observers, Thatcher's fall was mystifying. The magnitude of her achievements on the world stage, and the substantial confidence she enjoyed in America made it difficult to understand why her fellow conservatives would oust her. President Bush was crestfallen when he heard the news during a trip to Saudi Arabia, where he was visiting coalition troops who were massing to repel Iraqi forces from Kuwait. General Norman Svartskopf spoke for many friends of Britain when he demanded of his British counterpart, what sort of a country have you got there when they sack the prime minister halfway through a war? Equally remarkable to observers was the public grace Thatcher mustered despite her private grief. In the morning, she had announced her intention to resign, that same afternoon, she was obliged to face down a vote of no confidence in Parliament. Labour had called the vote to take advantage of the disarray in Conservative ranks. What? Thatcher delivered that afternoon was, in the words of the Liberal Democrat leader Patty Ashdown, a bravura performance. Mounting a rousing defense of her government's policies, and, by extension, her own leadership, she asked, when the windy rhetoric, of labor, has blown away, what are their real reasons for bringing this motion before the House? Her answer was unyielding. It cannot be a complaint about Britain standing in the world. That is deservedly high, not least because of our contribution to ending the Cold War and to the spread of democracy through, e. a stern Europe and the Soviet Union, achievements that were celebrated at the historic meeting in Paris from which I returned yesterday. It cannot be the nation's finances. We are repaying debts, including the debts run up by the Labour Party. The real issue to be decided, is how best to build on the achievements of the 1980s, how to carry conservative policies forward through the 1990s and how to add to three general election victories a fourth, which we shall surely win. In this, too, Thatcher was entirely prescient. John Major would best Heseltine in the forthcoming leadership contest and win a fourth consecutive victory for the conservatives in the 1992 general election. The following week, Thatcher faced questions from Parliament for the last time. What strikes one most when revisiting this session is the praise that was offered for her by politicians outside the Conservative Party. For instance, the Northern Irish Unionist politician James Molyneux took the opportunity to reflect somewhat penitently on their earlier brawl 
over the Anglo-Irish Agreement. Does the Prime Minister recall an important debate in November 1985, when relations between us were a little strained? Does she recall my addressing her thus? Millions of our fellow British citizens throughout this nation feel that the Prime Minister has a lasting contribution to make to the destiny of the nation? Is the Prime Minister now aware that the vast majority of those people wish that contribution to continue? Forgoing the opportunity to score on an adversary, Thatcher graciously replied, the right honorable gentleman is very generous indeed. The following day, November 28, 1990, Margaret and Dennis Thatcher left 10 Downing Street. Her final statement as Prime Minister was, characteristically, to thank the staff who maintained the residence. Epilogue The revival of Britain brought about by Thatcher was at once an economic and spiritual undertaking. When she became Prime Minister, national decline was not merely a matter of a sputtering economy. Decline was a collective, self-reinforcing and ultimately debilitating belief. Its hallmarks were high inflation, slow growth and crippling labor strife. The political center of 1970s Britain simply was not working. Rejecting that exhausted consensus, Thatcher conjured up a positive vision for the future as leader of the opposition. And later, once she became prime minister, she proceeded to take her society where it had never been before. This required both courage and character, courage, in departing so dramatically from the received wisdom of the time, and character, in staying the course consistently as her tough medicine drew sharp complaint from the patient. Again and again, Thatcher displayed calm nerves and unyielding commitment to her convictions, even when conditions were ambiguous, downside risks loomed large and public support appeared to be waning. Her strategy of tightening the money supply to curb inflation at the beginning of her time in office saw no U-turn. She prosecuted a vigorous response to aggression in the Falklands. And she assured Britain's power supply during the miners' strike, sustaining her policies even when public opinion threatened to turn against them. To be sure, tenacity alone is rarely sufficient for success. To sustain her strategy to renew Britain, Thatcher had to rally supporters within the Conservative Party, particularly for domestic reform, which is inherently more polarizing than mobilization against an external foe. Her rhetoric had an impact on her supporters that recalls Isaiah Berlin's description of Churchill's words rousing the nation during the Second World War. So hypnotic was the force of his words, so strong his faith, that by the sheer intensity of his eloquence he bound his spell upon them until it seemed to them, that he was indeed speaking what was in their hearts and minds. Doubtless it was there, but largely dormant until he had awoken it in them. Likewise, in Thatcher's time, dismay at Britain's dysfunction was already in the air. Her achievement was to channel it for the cause of domestic reform. Her rhetoric mobilized enough support from her wing of the Conservative Party to sustain her ambitious agenda, realigning the political center for decades. She balanced a strong government presence in society with individual freedom in the economy, not, perhaps, the program that a majority of her contemporary conservatives were advocating but certainly ideals. The party had followed in earlier periods of its history. In the process, she assembled new coalitions of voters who had not traditionally voted conservative, enabling her to win three elections in a row and laying the basis for a fourth victory shortly after her retirement. She had seen the future, and made it work. Not that she was lacking for enemies, even conservatives sometimes accused Thatcher of betraying her party's basic principles. She was, of course, an outsider, both as a woman who had trained as a scientist, and as one coming from a middle-class background, her father a grocer. Yet her actions, though assuredly disruptive, 
spoke of a total commitment to her party. Rather than betraying its principles, she was working steadfastly to restore them. Thatcher's ideals echoed those of the greatest conservative leaders since Disraeli, preservation of the United Kingdom, international engagement on the basis of democratic principles and domestic governance founded on individual self. Sufficiency, supplemented by acknowledgement of Britain's post-war consensus on the need for a stable health service and welfare state. In international affairs, although she initially saw little value in diplomatic outreach to the Soviet Union, she changed course when she came across Mikhail Gorbachev and judged the time right to make progress. With an eye firmly on the longer term, she engaged with Gorbachev on substantial issues, believing that opening such a dialogue would ultimately strengthen the position of the democratic West. Thatcher also saw no conflict between her free market principles and the obligation of environmental stewardship. A great champion of the Montreal Protocol, the rare international treaty that has been both universally praised and highly effective, Thatcher deserves her share of credit for the remarkable healing of the ozone layer in recent decades. Toward the end of her premiership, she became one of the first world leaders to speak out vigorously on the dangers of climate change. Addressing the Royal Society in 1988, she acknowledged that for all the benefits of the Industrial Revolution, it was also true that mankind had unwittingly begun a massive experiment with the system of this planet itself. Though it was left to younger generations to solve this vast and increasingly salient problem, Thatcher at least had sought to point the way. Thatcher's foreign policy was a crucial testament to the importance of the British-American partnership within the Atlantic Alliance. The reinvigoration of the special relationship secured her influence on the global stage. There was nothing about Great Britain's natural resources, economic performance or military prowess that would have qualified it for superpower status in the 1980s. Yet through her forceful personality, her skillful support when it mattered and her essential relationship with President Reagan, Thatcher acted as if Britain were on a par with the United States. And for the most part, the Reagan administration happily suspended disbelief. Some leaders adjust to their retirement from politics with relative ease and elegance. They may even grow in stature, successfully writing a new, compelling chapter in their life story. Lady Thatcher, as she soon became, was not one of those leaders. She lived for her vision and, once out of office, struggled to find anything as meaningful as the challenges she had encountered during her years at 10 Downing Street. I continued to call on her on every trip to London, even in the years after illness had clouded her mind. Despite her fearsome reputation, largely acquired from her conduct in principled debates, with me she had always been the soul of personal kindness. To our very last visit, I found her unfailingly gracious, considerate and dignified. On those final occasions, as I sat across from a treasured friend of more than three decades, I saw a leader who had faced down life's trials with courage and grace. Although she had been reduced to a mere observer in politics, to millions of her fellow countrymen and women, and countless admirers abroad, she would always be a great and historic figure, an economic reformer of lasting significance, a premier ennobled by her resolve and daring when British sovereignty was threatened, the Iron Lady of the Western world. All who dealt with her recognized her outer toughness, all could sense the inner strength that carried her through the tribulations of leadership. In her presence, few could escape her personal charm and warmth. To her critics, Thatcher's fortitude at times cloaked her human qualities. But her exceptional steeliness coexisted with the overlooked attribute that lies at the heart of her leadership, love of country. 
exceptionally strong conviction and competitive drive were surely part of Margaret Thatcher's success in winning power, discipline and calculation helped her to retain it. But only love of her country and her people can explain how she wielded power and all that she achieved with it. That Queen Elizabeth II made the decision personally to attend her funeral, an honor extended to no previous prime minister except Winston Churchill, testifies to Lady Thatcher's historic impact. The very last hymn to be sung at her funeral service in St. Paul's Cathedral on April 17, 2013, captured her outlook. I vow to thee, my country, all earthly things above, entire and whole and perfect, the service of my love. The love that asks no question, the love that stands the test. That lays upon the altar the dearest and the best. Conclusion the evolution of leadership. From aristocracy to meritocracy. These pages have traced the reciprocal impact of six leaders on historical circumstance, and of historical circumstance on the role of each. Conrad Adenauer, Charles de Gaulle, Richard Nixon, Anwar Sadat, Lee Kuan Yew and Margaret Thatcher, each transformed his or her society and all contributed to the emergence of a new world order. The six leaders were profoundly affected by the dramatic half-century when Europe, which for 400 years had shaped the unfolding of history while dominating an increasing portion of the globe, proceeded to consume much of its own substance in two world wars that were in effect a European civil war. They then helped shape its aftermath, in which economies had to be reorganized domestic structures redefined and international relations reordered. The six also faced the challenges of the Cold War and the disruptions brought by decolonization and globalization, all of which continue to reverberate today. The period in which these leaders had grown up was transformative in a cultural sense. Both the political and social structures of the West were irrevocably changing from a hereditary and aristocratic model of leadership, to a middle-class and meritocratic one. As they came of age, the lingering residue of aristocracy was combining with the emerging paradigm of merit, at once broadening the base of societal creativity and expanding its scope. Today, meritocratic principles and institutions are so familiar that they dominate our language and thinking. Take the word nepotism, which implies favoring one's relatives and friends, especially in appointment to posts of responsibility. In the pre-meritocratic world, nepotism was omnipresent, indeed, the customary way of life, yet the practice carried no implications of unfair advantage, to the contrary, blood relations were a source of legitimacy. As originally conceived by the philosophers of ancient Greece, aristocracy meant rule by the best. Such rule, emphatically not hereditary, was morally justified by taking an aspect of human life assumed to be given, the natural inequality of endowments, and harnessing it for the public good. Plato's myth of the metals portrayed an aristocratic political order based on what is now called social mobility. In his telling, youths, including girls, with souls of gold, even if born to parents of brass or silver, could rise according to their natural talents. As a social system that shaped the history of Europe over the centuries, however, aristocracy took on an entirely different meaning a hereditary nobility which endowed its leaders with power and status. The defects of aristocracy in the hereditary sense, such as the risk of slipping into corruption or inefficiency, are easily recalled today. Less well-remembered are its virtues. For one, aristocrats did not understand themselves to have acquired their status through individual efforts. Position was inherent, not earned. As such, although there existed wastrels and incompetence, the creative aspect of aristocracy was bound up with the ethic of noblesse oblige, as in the phrase, to whom much is given much is expected. 
since aristocrats did not achieve their station the best of them felt an obligation to engage in public service or social improvement in the realm of international relations leaders from different nations belonged to this social class and shared a sensibility transcending national boundaries hence they generally agreed on what constituted a legitimate international order this did not prevent conflicts but it did help limit the severity of them and facilitate their resolution the concepts of sovereignty equilibrium the legal equality of states and the balance of power which were the hallmarks of the westphalian system developed in a world of aristocratic practices the banes of aristocratic foreign policy were overconfidence in intuition and a self-regard that invited stagnation still in negotiations where position was felt to be a birthright mutual respect among competitors and even adversaries was expected though not always guaranteed and flexibility was uninhibited by a prior commitment to perpetual success however short-term the issue policies could be judged in terms of a shared conception of the future rather than of a compulsion to avoid even temporary setbacks as a result an aristocracy at its best could maintain a sense of excellence that was antithetical to the demagogic temptations sometimes afflicting popular democracy to the extent that an aristocracy lived up to its values of restraint and disinterested public service its leaders would tend to reject the arbitrariness of personal rule governing through status and moral suasion instead over the 19th and early 20th centuries the assumptions underpinning hereditary aristocracy were steadily stripped away by the waning of religious belief the unleashing by the french revolution of movements toward greater political equality and shifts in wealth and status from the burgeoning market economy then suddenly and unexpectedly the first world war revealed the incongruity between waning aristocratic political values on the one hand and emerging technological realities on the other even as the former had stressed the imperative of restraint and peaceful evolution the latter magnified the destructiveness of war the system broke down in 1914 when rising national passions swept aside the previous safeguards allowing technology to supply the means for a constantly escalating level of conflict which over more than four years of attritional war undermined existing institutions winston churchill observed in the gathering storm 1948 that the first world war had been a conflict not of governments but of peoples in which the lifeblood of europe was poured out in wrath and slaughter by war's end churchill could write gone were the days of the treaties of utrecht and vienna when aristocratic statesmen and diplomats victor and vanquished alike met in polite and courtly disputation and free from the clatter and babble of democracy could reshape systems upon the fundamentals of which they were all agreed the peoples transported by their sufferings and by the mass teachings with which they had been inspired stood around in scores of millions to demand that retribution should be exacted to the full because europe's leaders had failed to forestall the oncoming catastrophe or to contain it once it erupted the first world war eroded trust in the political elite leaving behind a weakened leadership that in key countries would be overturned by totalitarian rulers at the same time the 1918 peace settlement proved at once insufficiently congruent with widely held values to induce a commitment to the new order and strategically unsound in failing sufficiently to weaken the defeated parties to eliminate their capacity for revenge this had many consequences the most momentous was the second world war in both world wars the all-out mobilization of peoples commanding their energies and exploiting their mutual antipathies represented the earliest and bleakest consequence of middle-class ascendancy yet after the turmoil of the second thirty years war 1914 to 45 had passed 
This social transformation would reveal itself to be compatible with international stability and statesmanship. A world of self-confident nation-states, with the middle class wielding the major share of political and cultural power, proved capable of producing leaders who conducted responsible and creative politics. Two related social forces, meritocracy and democratization, enabled and institutionalized the rise of middle-class leaders. One of the French Revolution's rallying cries had been, careers open to talents. From the middle of the 19th century, the adoption of meritocratic principles and institutions in the West, such as entrance examinations, selective secondary schools and universities, and recruitment and promotion policies based on professional standards, created new opportunities for talented individuals from middle-class backgrounds to enter politics. Simultaneously, the expansion of the franchise shifted both the social and the political center of gravity toward the middle class as well. None of the six leaders studied in this volume came from an upper-class background. Konrad Adenauer's father had been a non-commissioned officer in the Prussian army and then a clerk. His son climbed through the standard levels of education in the German Empire. Charles de Gaulle's grandparents had been both well-educated and prosperous, but his father was a schoolteacher. The son became the first in his family to serve at high levels of government. Richard Nixon was the product of a lower-middle-class upbringing in Southern California. Anwar Sadat, the son of a clerk, struggled to obtain a reference in support of his application to the Egyptian Military Academy. Lee Kuan Yew, born to downwardly mobile Chinese Singaporean parents, relied on scholarships in Singapore and Britain to pursue his education. Margaret Thatcher was a grammar school graduate and the daughter of a grocer, the second of a middle class. Background, after Edward Heath, and the first woman to become leader of Britain's Conservative Party. None of them had a starting point that suggested later eminence. Their humble backgrounds allowed them to defy the conventional political categories of insider and outsider. Both Sadat and de Gaulle were military officers who came to power through a crisis in their countries. Nixon and Adenauer were experienced and well-known politicians who nonetheless spent years in the political wilderness. Of the six, Thatcher and Lee entered office in the most orthodox manner, through party politics in a parliamentary system, but constantly questioned prevailing orthodoxy. Much like their aristocratic predecessors in the 19th century, but unlike many of their 20th century contemporaries, they were not primarily concerned with short term, tactical advantage. Instead, their origins and experiences far from power lent them perspective, allowing them to articulate the national interest and transcend the conventional wisdom of their day. The increasingly meritocratic institutions that had allowed them to harness their talents from an early age had arisen, under aristocracy's shadow, and often as a consequence of war. Germany's general staff and efficient, non-nepotistic bureaucracy had their antecedents in Prussian reforms adopted after the shock of battlefield, defeats in the Napoleonic Wars. De Gaulle attended St. Cyr the military academy founded by Napoleon in 1802 to develop a professional officer corps. Another such grande école, the selective and elite institute d'études politiques, sciences pa, was founded after the Franco-Prussian War, 1870-71, had revealed inadequacies of French political and administrative leadership deficiencies which were to be remedied by cultivating the talents of the next generation. The Industrial Revolution also played its part in the growing emphasis on education, as the economic historian David. Landis argues, all the old advantages, resources, wealth, power, were devalued, and the mind established over matter. Henceforth the future lay open to all those with the character, the hands, and the brains.
with success increasingly ascribed to intelligence and effort rather than birthright, education became the quintessential road to advancement. Thanks to these changes, the six leaders were able to attend rigorous secondary schools, most of them selective, and all of them public-spirited if not government-administered. Competition for high marks in examinations and scholarships was an important aspect of life. Beginning in high school, and continuing in some cases into college, they were taught a wide range of subjects, including especially the humanities, as if in preparation for the challenges of leadership, for which a sense of history and the ability to deal with tragedy are indispensable. Above all, they received an education which would help them to understand the world, the psychology of others and themselves. The meritocratic revolution affected nearly every aspect of life, valorizing achievement and the aspiration to careers transcending one's family origins. The ideal of excellence was preserved from the earlier aristocratic age and, if anything, given a new and stronger, more individualistic, emphasis. As Thatcher observed in 1975, opportunity means nothing unless it includes the right to be unequal and the freedom to be different. Universities and careers were progressively, though still imperfectly, opened up to women, ethnic and racial minorities, and those from non-elite backgrounds. Societies benefited from the resulting intellectual diversity and openness to different leadership styles. These factors enabled the leaders described in this volume to combine aristocratic qualities with meritocratic ambitions. The synthesis enshrined public service as a worthy endeavor, which encouraged aspirations to leadership. Both the school system and the broader society in which they were raised put a premium on academic performance, but both, above all, placed a strong emphasis on character. Correspondingly, the six leaders were brought up with priorities beyond their grades and test scores, these, while important, were not treated as an end in themselves. Hence Lee's recurring references to the Junzi, or Confucian gentleman, and de Gaulle's striving to become a man of character. Education was not merely a credential to be obtained in one's youth and set aside. It was an unending effort with both intellectual and moral dimensions. The particular middle-class values in which the six leaders were steeped from childhood included personal discipline, self-improvement, charity, patriotism and self-belief. Faith in their societies, encompassing gratitude for the past and confidence in the future, was taken for granted. Equality before the law was becoming an entrenched expectation. Unlike their aristocratic forebears, these leaders had a deeply rooted sense of national identity, which inspired their conviction that the loftiest ambition was to serve their fellow citizens through leadership of the state. They did not style themselves citizens of the world. Lee may have received his university education in Britain and Nixon may have prided himself on the extent of his travels before becoming president, but neither adopted a cosmopolitan identity. To them, the privilege of citizenship implied a responsibility to exemplify the particular virtues of their own nations. Serving their people and embodying the greatest traditions of their society was a high honor. The positive effects of this value system, as manifested in the American context, were well described by the historian and social critic Christopher Lash. Whatever its faults, middle-class nationalism provided a common ground, common standards, a common frame of reference without which society dissolves into nothing more than contending factions, as the founding fathers of America understood so well, a war of all against all. Another factor common to each of the leaders, except Lee, was a devout religious upbringing, Catholic for Adenauer and de Gaulle, Quaker for Nixon, Sunni Muslim for Sadat and Methodist for Thatcher. For all the differences among these faiths, 
they uniformly served certain secular purposes, training in self-control, reflecting on faults and orienting toward the future. These religious habits helped to instill self-mastery and a preference for taking the long view, two essential attributes of statesmanship which these leaders exemplified. Hard Truths What were the commonalities in the meritocratic leadership of these six figures? What lessons can be drawn from their experiences? All were known for their directness and were often tellers of hard truths. They did not entrust the fate of their countries to poll-tested, focus-grouped rhetoric. Who do you think lost the war? Adenauer uncompromisingly asked his fellow members of parliament who were complaining about the terms imposed by the Allies, in their post-war occupation of Germany. Nixon, who pioneered the use of modern marketing techniques in politics, still prided himself on speaking without notes based on his mastery of world affairs in a direct and plain-spoken way. Skillful in maintaining political ambiguity, Sadat and de Gaulle nonetheless spoke with exceptional clarity and vividness when seeking to move their people toward ultimate purposes, as did Thatcher. These leaders all had a penetrating sense of reality and a powerful vision. Mediocre leaders are unable to distinguish the significant from the ordinary. They tend to be overwhelmed by the inexorable aspect of history. Great leaders intuit the timeless requirements of statecraft and distinguish, among the many elements of reality, those which contribute to an elevated future and need to be promoted from others which must be managed and, in the extreme case, perhaps only endured. Thus both Sadat and Nixon, inheriting painful wars from their predecessors, sought to overcome entrenched international rivalries and initiate creative diplomacy. Thatcher and Adenauer found that a strong alliance with America would be most advantageous for their countries. Lee and de Gaulle chose a lesser degree of alignment, which was appropriate for adjustment to changing circumstances. All six could be bold. They acted decisively on matters of overriding national importance even when conditions, domestic or international, appeared decidedly unfavorable. Thatcher dispatched a Royal Navy task force to recover the Falkland Islands from Argentina even as many experts doubted the expedition's feasibility and Britain itself remained mired in a devastating economic crisis. Nixon undertook a diplomatic opening to China and arms control negotiations with the Soviet Union, before withdrawal from Vietnam had been completed and against much conventional wisdom. De Gaulle's refrain, as his biographer Julian Jackson has observed, was, I have always acted as if. That is, as if France were larger, more unified and more confident than it really was. Each understood the importance of solitude. Sadat enhanced his reflective habits in prison, as did Adenauer at a monastery during his internal exile. Thatcher made some of her most consequential decisions while reviewing her papers alone in the early hours of the morning. De Gaulle's home in the remote village of Colombe les Deux Eglises became an intrinsic part of his life. Nixon often separated himself physically from the White House, withdrawing to the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, Camp David or San Clemente. Away from the lights and cameras and daily impositions of command, these leaders benefited from stillness and reflection, especially before major decisions. A striking commonality among the six leaders, and a paradox, was their divisiveness. They wanted their peoples to follow along the path they led, but they did not strive for, or expect, consensus. Controversy was the inevitable byproduct of the transformations they sought. An example from de Gaulle's presidency is illustrative. During the January 1960 riots in Algeria known as the Week of the Barricades, I was in Paris meeting with members of the French defense establishment. Referring to de Gaulle's handling of the situation, one officer said to me, 
whenever he appears, he divides the country. Yet in the end it was de Gaulle who would overcome the Algerian crisis and return his country to a shared view of national purpose, just as he had brought the French nation back from the humiliation of capitulation in the Second World War. Similarly, a leader does not undertake fundamental economic reforms as Thatcher did, or seek peace with historic adversaries as Sadat, or build a successful multi-ethnic society from the ground up as Lee, without offending entrenched interests and alienating important constituencies. Adenauer's acceptance of the restrictions accompanying Germany's post-war occupation invited vituperation from his political critics. De Gaulle survived, and provoked, countless confrontations, but his last great public act was to de-escalate the protests by students and labor unions, that had brought France to the brink of revolution in May 1968. Sadat was martyred not only for bringing peace between his people and Israel's but, above all, because of his justifying it by principles some considered heretical. Both during their years in government and afterwards, not everyone admired these six leaders or subscribed to their policies. In each case, they faced resistance, often carried out for honorable motives and sometimes by distinguished opposing figures. Such is the price of making history. The faltering meritocracy. At least in the West. There are signs that the conditions which helped to produce the six leaders profiled in this book face their own evolutionary decay. The civic patriotism that once lent prestige to public service appears to have been outflanked by an identity-based factionalism, and a competing cosmopolitanism. In America, a growing number of college graduates aspire to become globe-trotting corporate executives or professional activists. Significantly fewer envision a role as regional or national level leaders in politics or the civil service. Something is amiss when the relationship between the leadership class and much of the public is defined by mutual hostility and suspicion. The West's secondary schools and universities remain very good at educating activists and technicians. They have wandered from their mission of forming citizens, among them, potential statesmen. Both activists and technicians play important roles in society, drawing attention to its faults and the various means by which they might be corrected, but the broad and rigorous humanistic education that shaped prior generations of leaders has fallen out of fashion. The technician's education tends to be pre-professional and quantitative, the activists, hyper-specialized and politicized. Neither offers much history or philosophy, the traditional wellsprings of the statesman's imagination. Excellent test scores and sterling resumes lead today's elite, to believe it has earned its power, and possesses it by right rather than by privilege, according to the political theorist Yuval Levin, a perceptive observer of today's faltering meritocracy. We are substituting a cold and sterile notion of intellect for a warm and spirited understanding of character as a measure of worth. The most profound problem, in his view, is located in the realm of elite conduct. Americans have grown skeptical of our elite's claims to legitimacy not so much, because it is too hard to enter the upper tier of American life, even if it is, as because those in that tier seem to be permitted to do whatever they want. The problem, in other words, is not necessarily the standards for entry, but the lack of standard upon entry. Precisely because our elite does not think of itself as an aristocracy, it does not believe itself to need standards or restraints. Whereas 19th century aristocrats understood much would be expected of them and the meritocrats of the 20th century pursued values of service, today's elites speak less of obligation than of self-expression or their own advancement. What is more, they are being formed within a technological environment that challenges the very qualities of character and intellect that historically have served to bind leaders to their people. 
deep literacy, and visual culture. The contemporary world is in the midst of a transformation in human consciousness so pervasive as to be nearly unnoticeable. This change, driven by new technologies which mediate our experience of the world and our acquisition of information, has developed largely without understanding of its long-term effects, including its implications for leadership. Under these conditions, reading a complex book carefully, and engaging with it critically, has become as countercultural an act as was memorizing an epic poem in the earlier print-based age. While the Internet and its attendant innovations are unquestionably technical marvels, close attention must be paid to the balance between the constructive and corrosive habits of mind encouraged by new technology. Just as the earlier transition from oral to written culture at once yielded the benefits of literacy and diminished the arts of spoken poetry and storytelling, the contemporary shift from print to visual culture brings both losses and gains. What risks being lost in an age dominated by the image? The quality goes by many names, erudition, learnedness, serious and independent thinking, but the best term for it is, deep literacy, defined by the essayist Adam Garfinkel as, engaging with, an extended piece of writing in such a way as to anticipate an author's direction and meaning. Ubiquitous and penetrating, yet invisible, deep literacy was the background radiation of the period in which the six leaders profiled in this book came of age. To the politically concerned, deep literacy supplies the quality Max Weber called proportion, or the ability to allow realities to impinge on you while maintaining an inner calm and composure. Intense reading can help leaders cultivate the mental distance from external stimuli and personalities that sustains a sense of proportion. When combined with reflection and the training of memory, it also provides a storehouse of detailed and granular knowledge from which leaders can reason analogically. More profoundly, Books offer a reality that is reasonable, sequential and orderly, a reality that can be mastered, or at least managed, by reflection and planning. And, perhaps most importantly for leadership, reading creates a skein of intergenerational conversation, encouraging learning with a sense of perspective. Finally, reading is a source of inspiration. Books record the deeds of leaders who once dared greatly, as well as those who dared too much, as a warning. Well before the end of the 20th century, however, print had lost its former dominance. This resulted in, among other things, a different kind of person getting elected as leader, one who can present himself and his programs in a polished way, as Lee Kuan Yew observed in 2000, adding. Satellite television has allowed me to follow the American presidential campaign. I am amazed at the way media professionals can give a candidate a new image and transform him, at least superficially, into a different personality. Winning an election becomes in large measure, a contest in packaging and advertising. Just as the benefits of the printed era were inextricable from its costs, so it is with the visual age. With screens in every home, entertainment is omnipresent and boredom a rarity. More substantively, injustice visualized is more visceral than injustice described. Television played a crucial role in the American civil rights movement. Yet the costs of television are substantial, privileging emotional display over self-command changing the kinds of people and arguments that are taken seriously in public life. The shift from print to visual culture continues with the contemporary entrenchment of the internet and social media, which bring with them four biases that make it more difficult for leaders to develop their capabilities than in the age of print. These are, immediacy, intensity, polarity, and conformity. Although the internet makes news and data more immediately accessible than ever, this surfeit of information has hardly made us individually more knowledgeable, 
let alone wiser. As the cost of accessing information becomes negligible, as with the internet, the incentives to remember it seem to weaken. While forgetting any one fact may not matter, the systematic failure to internalize information brings about a change in perception and a weakening of analytical ability. Facts are rarely self-explanatory, their significance and interpretation depend on context and relevance. For information to be transmuted into something approaching wisdom, it must be placed within a broader context of history and experience. As a general rule, images speak at a more emotional register of intensity than do words. Television and social media rely on images that inflame the passions, threatening to overwhelm leadership with a combination of personal and mass emotion. Social media in particular have encouraged users to become image-conscious spin doctors. All this engenders a more populist politics that celebrates utterances, perceived to be authentic over the polished sound bites of the television era, not to mention the more analytical output of print. The architects of the Internet thought of their invention as an ingenious means of connecting the world, in reality. It has also yielded a new way to divide humanity into warring tribes. Polarity and conformity rely upon and reinforce each other. One is shunted into a group, and then the group polices one's thinking. Small wonder that on many contemporary social media platforms, users are divided into followers and influencers. There are no leaders. What are the consequences for leadership? In our present circumstances, Lee's gloomy assessment of visual media's effects is relevant, from such a process, I doubt if a Churchill, a Roosevelt or a de Gaulle can emerge. It is not that changes in communications technology have made inspired leadership and deep thinking about world order impossible, but that in an age dominated by television and the internet, thoughtful leaders must struggle against the tide. Underlying Values Today, merit tends to be understood narrowly as intellect compounded by effort. But Thomas Jefferson's earlier conception of a natural aristocracy rested on a different and perhaps more sustainable basis, the merging of virtue and talents. For a political elite to render meaningful public service, both education and character are essential. As we have seen, leaders with world historical impact have benefited from a rigorous and humanistic education. Such an education begins in a formal setting and continues for a lifetime through reading and discussion with others. That initial step is rarely taken today. Few universities offer an education in statecraft either explicitly or implicitly and the lifelong effort is made more difficult as changes in technology erode deep literacy. Thus, for meritocracy to be reinvigorated, humanistic education would need to regain its significance, embracing such subjects as philosophy, politics, human geography, modern languages, history, economic thought, literature, and even, perhaps, classical antiquity, the study of which was long the nursery of statesmen. And since character is essential, a deeper conception of meritocratic leadership would also embrace the definition of virtue, provided by the political scientist James Q. Wilson, habits of moderate action, more specifically, acting with due restraint on one's impulses, due regard for the rights of others, and reasonable concern for distant consequences. From youth to old age, the sheer centrality of character, that most indispensable of qualities, is an unending challenge, to leaders no less than to students of leadership. Good character does not assure worldly success, or triumph in statecraft, but it does provide firm grounding in victory and consolation in failure. These six leaders will be remembered for the qualities that became associated with them and that defined their impact. Adenauer for his integrity and persistence, 
de Gaulle for his determination and historical vision, Nixon for his comprehension of the interlocking international situation and his strength in decision, Sadat for the spiritual elevation with which he forged peace, Lee for his imagination in the founding of a new multi-ethnic society, Thatcher for her principled leadership and tenacity. All showed extraordinary courage. No single person could ever possess all these virtues at any one time, the six leaders combined them in different proportions. Their leadership became as identified with their attributes as with their achievements. Leadership and World Order Since the end of what these pages have described as the Second Thirty Years' War, 1914-45, Instantaneous communication and the technological revolution have combined to give a new significance and urgency to two crucial questions confronting leaders, what is imperative for national security? And what is required for peaceful international coexistence? These questions have been answered in different ways across history. Though a plethora of empires has existed, Aspirations to world order were confined by geography as well as technology to specific regions. This was true even of the Roman and Chinese empires, which encompassed a vast range of societies and cultures within themselves. These were regional orders presenting themselves as world orders. Starting in the 16th century, an explosion in technology medicine and economic and political organization expanded the capacity of the West to project its power, and systems of governance around the world. 21. From the middle of the 17th century, the Westphalian system based on respect for sovereignty and international law developed within Europe. That system, which became embedded worldwide after the end of colonialism, allowed the rise of states which, shedding Western dominance, insisted on their part in defining, and sometimes challenging, the rules of the established world order. In his essay Perpetual Peace, the philosopher Immanuel Kant wrote three centuries ago that mankind was destined for universal peace either by way of human insight, or by conflicts of a magnitude and destructiveness that would leave no alternative. The prospects stated were too absolute, the problem of international order has not appeared as an either slash or proposition. For all of recent memory, mankind has lived with a balance between relative security and legitimacy established by its leaders and interpreted by them. At no previous period in history have the consequences of getting this balance wrong been more fraught or catastrophic. The contemporary age introduced a level of destructiveness which has enabled mankind to destroy civilization itself. This is reflected in the period's established grand strategies famously abbreviated and conceptualized in the phrase, Mutual Assured Destruction, MAD. These were advanced in pursuit not so much of traditional victory as of war's prevention, and ostensibly designed less for conflict understood to be potentially suicidal, than for deterrence. Not long after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the risks of fielding of nuclear weapons became incalculable, the stakes disconnected from the consequences. For more than seven decades, while advanced weapons have grown in power, complexity and accuracy, no country has persuaded itself actually to use them, even in conflict with non-nuclear countries. As previously described, both the Soviet Union and the United States accepted defeat at the hands of non-nuclear countries, without resorting to their own deadliest weapons. These dilemmas of nuclear strategy have never disappeared, they have instead mutated as more states have developed advanced weapons and as the essentially bipolar Cold War distribution of destructive capacities has been replaced by a more complicated, and potentially less stable kaleidoscope of high-tech options. Cyber weapons and AI applications, such as autonomous weapons systems, exacerbate the existing range of dangers. 
Unlike nuclear weapons, cyber weapons and artificial intelligence are ubiquitous, relatively inexpensive to develop, and tempting to use. Cyber weapons combine the capacity for massive impact with the possibility of obscuring the attribution of attacks. Artificial intelligence is able to overcome even the need for human operators, instead allowing weapons to launch themselves based on their own calculations and their ability to choose targets with near-absolute discrimination, because the threshold for their use is so low, and their destructive capacity so great, resorting to such weapons, or even their formal threat, may turn a crisis into a war or transform a limited war into a nuclear one through unintended or uncontrollable escalation. The impact of revolutionary technology makes the full application of these weapons cataclysmic while rendering their limited use, difficult to the point of unmanageability. No diplomacy has yet been invented for threatening their use explicitly without the risk of preemption in reply. Arms control explorations seem to have been dwarfed by these enormities. It has been a paradox of the age of high technology that actual military operations have been confined to conventional weapons, or tactical deployment of small-scale high-tech weapons, from drone strikes to cyber attacks. At the same time, advanced weapons are expected to be contained by mutual assured destruction. This pattern is too precarious for the long-term future. History remains a relentless taskmaster as the technological revolution has been accompanied by a political transformation. At this writing, the world is witnessing the return of great power rivalry, magnified by the spread and advancement of astonishing technologies. When in the early 1970s China embarked upon its re-entry into the international system, its human and economic potential was vast, but its technology and actual power were comparatively limited. China's rising economic and strategic capacities have meanwhile obliged the United States to contend for the first time in its history with a geopolitical competitor whose resources are potentially comparable to its own a task as unfamiliar to Washington as to Beijing, which historically has treated foreign nations as tributaries to Chinese power and culture. Each side thinks of itself as exceptional, but differently. The United States acts on the premise that its values are universally applicable and will ultimately be adopted everywhere. China expects that its civilizational uniqueness and impressive economic performance will inspire other societies to show deference to its priorities. Both the United States' missionary impulse and China's sense of cultural eminence imply a kind of subordination of one to the other. By the nature of their economies and high technology, each nation is impinging, partly by momentum, importantly by design on what the other has heretofore considered its core interests. China in the 21st century seems embarked on an international role to which it thinks itself entitled by its achievements, over millennia. The United States is acting to project power, purpose and diplomacy around the world to maintain a global equilibrium rooted in its post-war experience responding to tangible and conceptional challenges to that order. For the leaders of each side, these requirements of security seem self-evident. And they are supported by public opinion. Yet security is only part of the equation. The key issue for the future of the world is whether the two behemoths can learn to combine inevitable strategic rivalry with a concept and practice of coexistence. As for Russia, it conspicuously lacks China's market power, demographic heft and diversified industrial base. Spanning 11 time zones and enjoying few natural defensive demarcations, Russia has acted according to its own geographical and historical imperatives. Russian foreign policy transforms a mystical patriotism into imperial entitlement, with an abiding perception of insecurity essentially derived from the country's long-standing vulnerability to invasion, 
across the East European plain. For centuries, its authoritarian leaders have tried to insulate Russia's vast territory with a security belt imposed around its diffuse border. Today the same priority manifests itself once again in the attack on Ukraine. The impact of these societies on each other has been shaped by their strategic assessments, which grow out of their histories. The Ukrainian conflict illustrates this. After the disintegration of the Soviet satellite states in Eastern Europe and their emergence as independent nations, the entire territory from the established security line in the center of Europe to the national border of Russia became open for a new strategic design. Stability depended on whether the emerging dispensation could calm historic European fears of Russian domination as well as account for traditional Russian concern over offensives from the West. The strategic geography of Ukraine epitomizes these concerns. If Ukraine were to join NATO, the security line between Russia and Europe would be placed within 300 miles of Moscow, in effect eliminating the historic buffer which saved Russia when France and Germany sought to occupy it in successive centuries. If the security border were to be established on the western side of Ukraine, Russian forces would be within striking distance of Budapest and Warsaw. The February 2022 invasion of Ukraine, in flagrant violation of international law, is thus largely an outgrowth of a failed strategic dialogue or else of an inadequately undertaken one. The experience of two nuclear entities confronting each other militarily, even while not having recourse to their ultimate weapons, underlines the urgency of the fundamental problem. The triangular relationship between America, China and Russia will eventually resume, though Russia will be weakened by the demonstration of its military limits in Ukraine, the widespread rejection of its conduct and the scope and impact of the sanctions against it. But it will retain nuclear and cyber capabilities for doomsday scenarios. In U.S.-China relations, the conundrum is whether two different concepts of national greatness can learn to coexist peacefully side by side and how. With Russia, the challenge is whether that country can reconcile its view of itself with the self-determination and security of the countries in what it has long defined as its near abroad, mostly in Central Asia and Eastern Europe, and to do so as part of an international system rather than by means of domination. It now seems possible that a liberal and universal rules-based order, however worthy in its conception, will be replaced in practice for an indeterminate period of time by an at least partially decoupled world. Such a division encourages a quest at its fringes for spheres of influence. If so, how will countries that do not agree on rules of global conduct be able to operate within an agreed design of equilibrium? Will the quest for dominance overwhelm the analysis of coexistence? In a world of increasingly formidable technology that can either uplift or dismantle human civilization, there is no final resolution, not to speak of a military one, to great power competition. An unrestrained technological race, justified by the ideologization of foreign policy in which each side is convinced of the malevolent intent of the other, risks creating a cataclysmic cycle of mutual suspicion like that which started the First World War, but with incomparably greater consequences. All sides are thus now obliged to re-examine their first principles of international behavior and relate them to the possibilities of coexistence. For the leaders of high-tech societies in particular, there is a moral and strategic imperative to carry out, both within their own and with potential adversarial countries, a permanent discussion of the implications of technology and of how its military applications might be restrained. The subject is too important to neglect until crises arise. As with the arms control dialogues that helped contribute to restraint during the nuclear age, 
high-level explorations of the consequences of emerging technologies could cultivate reflection and promote habits of reciprocal strategic self-control. An irony of the contemporary world is that one of its glories, the revolutionary explosion of technology, has emerged so quickly, and with such optimism, that it has outrun thought of its perils, and inadequate systematic efforts have been made to understand its capacities. Technologists develop astonishing devices, but they have had little occasion to explore and assess their comparative implications within a frame of history. Political leaders too often lack an adequate grasp of the strategic and philosophical implications of the machines and algorithms at their disposal. At the same time, the technological revolution is impinging on human consciousness and perceptions of the nature of reality. The last great comparable transformation, the Enlightenment, replaced the age of faith with repeatable experiments and logical deductions. It is now being supplanted by reliance on algorithms, which work in the opposite direction, offering outcomes in search of an explanation. Exploring these new frontiers will require a committed effort from leaders to narrow, and ideally to close existing gaps between the worlds of technology, politics, history, and philosophy. In the first chapter of these pages, the test of leadership was described as the capacity for analysis, strategy, courage, and character. The challenges facing the leaders described here were as comparably complex as the contemporary ones, if less far-ranging. The criterion by which to judge the leader in history remains unchanged, to transcend circumstance by vision and dedication. It is not necessary for the leaders of the contemporary great powers to develop a detailed vision of how to resolve the dilemmas described here immediately. They must, however, be clear on what has to be avoided and cannot be tolerated. Wise leaders must preempt their challenges before they manifest themselves as crises. Lacking a moral and strategic vision, the present age is unmoored. The vastness of our future as yet defies comprehension. The increasingly acute and disorienting steepness of the crests, the depths of the troughs, the dangers of the shoals, all these demand navigators with the creativity and fortitude to guide societies to as yet unknown, but more hopeful, destinations. The Future of Leadership The two questions Conrad Adenauer put to me during our final meeting in 1967, three months before his death, have gained new relevance. Are any leaders still able to conduct a genuine long-range policy? Is true leadership still possible today? After exploring the lives of six consequential 20th century figures and the conditions that enabled their achievements, the student of leadership naturally wonders whether parallel performances can be replicated. Are leaders coming forth with the character, intellect and hardiness required to meet the challenges facing world order? The question has been asked before and leaders have emerged who rose to the occasion. When Adenauer posed his questions, Sadat, Lee and Thatcher were largely unknown. Likewise, few who witnessed the fall of France in 1940 could imagine its renewal under de Gaulle in a career spanning three decades. When Nixon opened the dialogue with China, few contemporaries had an inkling of its possible consequences. Machiavelli, in his Discourses on Livy, ascribes the slackening of leadership to social lassitude induced by long periods of tranquility. When societies are blessed with peaceful times and indulge the slow corruption of standards, the people may follow either a man who is judged to be good by common self-deception or someone put forward by men who are more likely to desire special favors than the common good. But later, under the impact of adverse times, ever the teacher of realities, this deception is revealed, and out of necessity the people turn to those who in tranquil times were almost forgotten. 
the grave conditions described here must, in the end, provide the impetus for societies to insist on meaningful leadership. In the late 19th century, Friedrich Engels predicted that the government of persons would be replaced by the administration of things. But greatness in history resides in the refusal to abdicate to vast impersonal forces, its defining elements are, and must continue to be, created by human beings. Max Weber has described the essential qualities needed for transformative leadership. The only man who has a evocation for politics is one who is certain that his spirit will not be broken if the world, when looked at from his point of view, proves too stupid or base to accept what he wishes to offer it, and who, when faced with all that obduracy, can still say, nevertheless, despite everything. The six leaders discussed here developed parallel qualities despite the profound differences among their societies, a capacity to understand the situation in which their societies found themselves, an ability to devise a strategy to manage the present and shape the future, a skill in moving their societies toward elevated purposes, and a readiness to rectify shortcomings. Faith in the future was to them indispensable. It remains so. No society can remain great if it loses faith in itself or if it systematically impugns its self perception. This imposes above all the willingness to enlarge the sphere of concern from the self to the society at large, and to evoke the generosity of public spirit which inspires sacrifice and service. Great leadership results from the collision of the intangible and the malleable from that which is given and that which is exerted. Scope remains for individual effort, to deepen historical understanding, hone strategy and improve character. The Stoic philosopher Epictetus wrote long ago, we cannot choose our external circumstances, but we can always choose how we respond to them. It is the role of leaders to help guide that choice and inspire their people in its execution.